Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter One Of His Malice Aforethought. Oh, who hath done this deed? Othello. Lord Peter Whimsey stretched himself luxuriously between the sheets provided by the Hotel Meurice. After his exertions in the unravelling of the Battersea mystery, he had followed Sir Julian Freke's advice, and taken a holiday. He had felt suddenly weary of breakfasting every morning before his view over the Green Park. He had realized that the picking up of first editions at sales afforded insufficient exercise for a man of thirty-three. The very crimes of London were over-sophisticated. He had abandoned his flat and his friends, and fled to the wilds of Corsica. For the last three months he had forsworn letters, newspapers, and telegrams. He had tramped about the mountains, admiring from a cautious distance the wild beauty of Corsican peasant women, and studying the vendetta in its natural haunt. In such conditions, murder seemed not only reasonable, but lovable. Bunter, his confidential man and assistant sleuth, had nobly sacrificed his civilized habits had let his master go dirty and even unshaven, and had turned his faithful camera from the recording of fingerprints to that of craggy scenery. It had been very refreshing. Now, however, the call of the blood was upon Lord Peter. They had returned late last night in a vile train to Paris, and had picked up their luggage. The autumn light, filtering through the curtains, touched caressingly the silver-topped bottles on the dressing-table, outlined an electric lampshade and the shape of the telephone. A noise of running water nearby proclaimed that Bunter had turned on the bath, H and C, and was laying out scented soap bath salts, the huge bath sponge, for which there had been no scope in Corsica, and the delightful flesh brush with the long handle, which rasped you so agreeably all down the spine. Contrast, philosophized Lord Peter sleepily, is life. Corsica, Paris, then London, "'Good morning, Bunter.' "'Good morning, my lord. Fine morning, my lord. Your lordship's bath-water is ready.' "'Thanks,' said Lord Peter. He blinked at the sunlight. It was a glorious bath. He wondered, as he soaked in it, how he could have existed in Corsica. He wallowed happily, and sang a few bars of a song— in a soporific interval, he heard the valet de chambre bringing in coffee and rolls. Coffee and rolls! He heaved himself out with a splash, toweled himself luxuriously, enveloped his long mortified body in a silken bathrobe, and wandered back. To his immense surprise, he perceived Mr. Bunter, calmly replacing all the fittings in his dressing-case. Another astonished glance showed him the bags, scarcely opened the previous night, repacked, relabeled, and standing ready for a journey. "'I say, Bunter, what's up?' said his lordship. "'We're staying here a fortnight, you know.' "'Excuse me, my lord.' said Mr. Bunter, deferentially. But, having seen the times, delivered here every morning by air, my lord, and very expeditious, I'm sure, all things considered, I made no doubt your lordship would be wishing to go to Riddlesdale at once. 
Riddles, Dale, exclaimed Peter. What's the matter? Anything wrong with my brother? For answer, Mr. Bunter handed him the paper, folded open at the heading, Riddlesdale Inquest, Duke of Denver Arrested on Murder Charge. Lord Peter stared, as if hypnotized. I thought your lordship wouldn't wish to miss anything, said Mr. Bunter. So I took the liberty. Lord Peter pulled himself together. "'When's the next train?' he asked. "'I beg your lordship's pardon. "'I thought your lordship would wish to take the quickest route. "'I took it on myself to book two seats in the aeroplane Victoria. "'She starts at eleven-thirty. "'Lord Peter looked at his watch. Ten o'clock,' he said. "'Very well. You did quite right, dear me.' Poor old Gerald, arrested for murder. Uncommonly worrying for him, poor chap. Always hated my being mixed up with police courts. Now he's there himself. Lord Peter Whimsey in the witness box. Very distressing to feelings of a brother. Duke of Denver in the dock. Worse still. Dear me. Well, I suppose one must have breakfast. Yes, my lord. Full account of the inquest in the paper, my lord. Yes. Who's on the case, by the way? Mr. Parker, my lord. Parker, that's good. Splendid old Parker. Wonder how he managed to get put on to it. How do things look, Bunter? If I may say so, my lord, I fancy the investigation will prove very interesting. There are several extremely suggestive points in the evidence, my lord. From a criminological point of view, I dare say it is interesting, replied his lordship, sitting down cheerfully to his café au lait. But it's deuced awkward for my brother all the same, having no turn for criminology, what? Ah, well, said Mr. Bunter, they say, my lord, there's nothing like having a personal interest. The inquest was held to-day at Riddlesdale, in the north riding of Yorkshire, on the body of Captain Dennis Cathcart, which was found at three o'clock on Thursday morning, lying just outside the conservatory door of the Duke of Denver's shooting-box, Riddlesdale Lodge. Evidence was given to show that deceased had quarrelled with the Duke of Denver on the preceding evening, and was subsequently shot in a small thicket adjoining the house. A pistol belonging to the Duke was found near the scene of the crime. A verdict of murder was returned against the Duke of Denver. Lady Mary Whimsey, sister of the Duke, who was engaged to be married to the deceased, collapsed after giving evidence, and is now lying seriously ill at the lodge. The Duchess of Denver hastened from town yesterday, and was present at the inquest. Full report on page 12. Poor old Gerald, thought Lord Peter, as he turned to page 12. And poor old Mary... I wonder if she really was fond of the fellow. Mother always said not, but Mary never would let on about herself. The full report began by describing the little village of Riddlesdale, where the Duke of Denver had recently taken a small shooting box for the season. When the tragedy occurred, the Duke had been staying there with a party of guests. In the Duchess's absence, Lady Mary Whimsey had acted as hostess. The other guests were Colonel and Mrs. Marchbanks, the Honourable Frederick Arbuthnot, Mr. and Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, and the dead man, Dennis Cathcart. The first witness was the Duke of Denver, who claimed to have discovered the body, he gave evidence that he was coming into the house by the conservatory door at three o'clock in the morning of Thursday, October 14th, 
when his foot struck against something. He had switched on his electric torch and seen the body of Dennis Cathcart at his feet. He had at once turned it over and seen that Cathcart had been shot in the chest. He was quite dead. As Denver was bending over the body, he heard a cry in the conservatory, and, looking up, saw Lady Mary Wimsey gazing out, horror-struck. She came out by the conservatory door, and exclaimed at once, "'Oh, God, Gerald, you've killed him!' Sensation. The Coroner. "'Were you surprised by that remark?' Duke of Denver. Well, I was so shocked and surprised at the whole thing. I think I said to her, don't look. And she said, oh, it's Dennis. Whatever can have happened? Has there been an accident? I stayed with the body and sent her up to rouse the house. The coroner. Did you expect to see Lady Mary Wimsey in the conservatory? Duke of Denver. Really, as I say, I was so astonished all round, don't you know? I didn't think about it. The coroner. Do you remember how she was dressed? Duke of Denver. I don't think she was in her pajamas. Laughter. I think she had a coat on. The coroner. I understand that Lady Mary Wimsey was engaged to be married to the deceased. Duke of Denver, yes. The coroner. He was well known to you? Duke of Denver. He was the son of an old friend of my father's. His parents are dead. I believe he lived chiefly abroad. I ran across him during the war and in 1919 he came to stay at Denver. He became engaged to my sister at the beginning of this year. The coroner. With your consent and that of the family? Duke of Denver. Well, yes, certainly. The coroner. What kind of man was Captain Cathcart? Duke of Denver. Well... He was a sahib and all that. I don't know what he did before he joined in 1914. I think he lived on his income. His father was well off, crack shot, good at games, so on. I never heard anything against him till that evening. The coroner. What was that? Duke of Denver. Well, mm, the fact is... It was deuced queer. He, if anybody but Tommy Freeborn had said it, I should never have believed it. Sensation. The coroner. I'm afraid I must ask your grace of what, exactly, you had to accuse the deceased. Duke of Denver. Well, I didn't, I don't exactly accuse him. An old friend of mine made a suggestion. Of course, I thought it must be all a mistake. So I went to Cathcart, and, to my amazement, he practically admitted it. Then we both got angry, and he told me to go to the devil and rushed out of the house. Renewed sensation. The coroner. When did this quarrel occur? Duke of Denver. On Wednesday night. That was the last I saw of him. Unparalleled sensation. The coroner. Please, please, we cannot have this disturbance. Now, will your grace kindly give me, as far as you can remember it, the exact history of this quarrel? Duke of Denver. Well, it was like this. We'd had a long day on the moors, and had dinner early, and about half-past nine we began to feel like turning in. My sister and Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson toddled on up, 
and we were having the last peg in the billiard room when Fleming, that's my man, came in with the letters. They come rather any old time in the evening, you know, we being two and a half miles from the village. No, I wasn't in the billiard room at that time. I was locking up the gun room. The letter was from an old friend of mine I hadn't seen for years. Tom Freeborn used to know him at the house. The coroner. Whose house? Duke of Denver. Oh, Christchurch, Oxford. He wrote to say he'd seen the announcement of my sister's engagement in Egypt. The coroner. In Egypt? Duke of Denver. I mean, he was in Egypt. Tom Freeborn, you see. That's why he hadn't written before. He engineers. He went out there after the war was over, you see. And, being somewhere up near the sources of the Nile, he doesn't get the papers regularly. He said, would I excuse him now for interfering in a very delicate matter and all that? But did I know who Cathcart was? Said he'd met him in Paris during the war, and he lived by cheating at cards. Said he could swear to it, with details of a row there'd been in some French place or other. Said he knew I'd want to chaw his head off, freeborns, I mean, for button in, but he'd seen the man's photo in the paper, and he thought I ought to know. The coroner. Did this letter surprise you? Duke of Denver. Couldn't believe it at first. If it hadn't been old Tom Freeborn, I'd have put the thing in the fire straight off. And even as it was, I didn't quite know what to think. I mean, it wasn't as if it had happened in England, you know. I mean to say, Frenchmen get so excited about nothing. Only there was Freeborn. And he isn't the kind of man that makes mistakes. The coroner. What did you do? Duke of Denver. Well, the more I looked at it, the less I liked it, you know. Still, I couldn't quite leave it like that. So I thought the best way was to go straight to Cathcart. They'd all gone up while I was sitting, thinking about it. So I went up and knocked at Cathcart's door. He said, What's that? Or, Who the devil's that? Or something of the sort. And I went in. Look here, I said. Can I have a word with you? Well, cut it short then, he said. I was surprised. He wasn't usually rude. Well, I said, Fact is, I've had a letter I don't much like the look of, and I thought the best thing to do was to bring it straight away to you and have the whole thing cleared up. It's from a man, a very decent sort, old college friend, who says he's met you in Paris. Paris, he said, in a most unpleasant way. Paris, what the hell do you want to come talking to me about Paris for? Well, I said, don't talk like that, because it's misleading under the circumstances. What are you driving at, says Cathcart. Spit it out, and go to bed, for God's sake. I said, right ho, I will. It's a man called Freeborn, who says he knew you in Paris, and that you made money cheating at cards. I thought he'd break out at that, but all he said was, What about it? What about it? I said. Well, of course, it's not the sort of thing I'm going to believe like that, right bang slap off without any proofs. Then he said a funny thing. He said, Beliefs don't matter. It's what one knows about people. Do you mean to say you don't deny it? I said. It's no good my denying it, he said. You must make up your own mind. Nobody could disprove it. And then he suddenly jumped up 
nearly knocking the table over, and said, "'I don't care what you think or what you do if you'll only get out. For God's sake, leave me alone.' "'Look here,' I said, "'you needn't take it that way. I don't say I do believe it. In fact,' I said, "'I'm sure there must be some mistake. Only you being engaged to Mary,' I said, I couldn't just let it go at that without looking into it, could I? Oh, says Cathcart, if that's what's worrying you, then it needn't. That's off. I said, what? He said, our engagement. Off, I said. But I was talking to Mary about it only yesterday. I haven't told her yet, he said. Well, I said, i think that's damned cool who the hell do you think you are to come here and jilt my sister well i said quite a lot first and last you can get out i said i've no use for swine like you i will he said and he pushed past me and slammed downstairs and out of the front door and banged it after him the coroner what did you do duke of denver i ran into my bedroom which has a window over the conservatory and shouted out to him not to be a silly fool it was pouring with rain and beastly cold he didn't come back so i told fleming to leave the conservatory door open in case he thought better of it and went to bed the coroner what explanation can you suggest for cathcart's behavior duke of denver none i was simply staggered but i think he must somehow have got wind of the letter and knew the game was up the coroner did you mention the matter to anybody else duke of denver no it wasn't pleasant and i thought i'd better leave it till the morning the coroner so you did nothing further in the matter the duke of denver no i didn't want to go out hunting for the fellow i was too angry besides i thought he'd change his mind before long it was a brute of a night and he'd only a dinner jacket the coroner then you just went quietly to bed and never saw deceased again duke of denver not till i fell over him outside the conservatory at three in the morning the coroner ah yes now can you tell us how you came to be out of doors at that time duke of denver hesitating i didn't sleep well i went out for a stroll the coroner at three o'clock in the morning duke of denver yes with sudden inspiration you see my wife's away laughter and some remarks from the back of the room the coroner silence please you mean to say that you got up at that hour of an october night to take a walk in the garden in the pouring rain duke of denver yes just a stroll laughter the coroner at what time did you leave your bedroom duke of denver oh oh about half past two i should think the coroner which way did you go out the duke of denver by the conservatory door the coroner the body was not there when you went out the duke of denver oh no the coroner or you would have seen it the duke of denver lord yes i'd have had to walk over it the coroner exactly where did you go duke of denver vaguely oh just a roundabout the coroner you heard no shot duke of denver no the coroner 
Did you go far away from the conservatory door and the shrubbery? Duke of Denver. Well, I was some way away. Perhaps that's why I didn't hear anything. It must have been. Coroner. Were you as much as a quarter of a mile away? Duke of Denver. I should think I was. Oh, yes, quite. The coroner. More than a quarter of a mile away? Duke of Denver. Possibly. I walked about briskly because it was cold. Coroner. In which direction? Duke of Denver, with visible hesitation. Round at the back of the house, uh, towards the bowling green. Coroner. The bowling green? Duke of Denver, more confidently. Yes. The coroner. But if you were more than a quarter of a mile away, you must have left the grounds. Duke of Denver. I, oh, yes, I think I did. Yes, I walked about on the moor a bit, you know. Coroner. Can you show us the letter you had from Mr. Freeborn? Duke of Denver. Oh, certainly, if I can find it. I thought I put it in my pocket, but I couldn't find it for that Scotland Yard fellow. The coroner. Can you have accidentally destroyed it? Duke of Denver. No, I'm sure I remember putting it. Oh. Here the witness paused in a very patent confusion and grew red. I remember now. I destroyed it. The coroner. That is unfortunate. How was that? Duke of Denver. I had forgotten. It has come back to me now. I'm afraid it has gone for good. The coroner. Perhaps you kept the envelope? Witness shook his head. The coroner. Then you can show the jury no proof of having ever received it? Duke of Denver. Not unless Fleming remembers it. The coroner. Ah, uh, yes. No doubt we can check it that way. Thank you, Your Grace. Call Lady Mary. The noble lady who was, until the tragic morning of October 14th, the fiancé of the deceased, aroused a murmur of sympathy on her appearance. Fair and slender, her naturally rosy pink cheeks ashy pale, she seemed overwhelmed with grief. She was dressed entirely in black, and gave her evidence in a very low tone, which was at times almost inaudible. After expressing his sympathy, the coroner asked, How long had you been engaged to the deceased? Witness, about eight months. The coroner, Where did you first meet him? Witness, at my sister-in-law's house in London. The coroner, When was that? Witness, I think it was June last year. The coroner. You were quite happy in your engagement? Witness. Quite. The coroner. You naturally saw a good deal of Captain Cathcart. Did he tell you much about his previous life? Witness. Not very much. We were not given to mutual confidences. We usually discussed subjects of common interest. The coroner. You had many such subjects? Witness. Oh, yes. Coroner. You never gathered at any time that Captain Cathcart had anything on his mind? Witness. Not particularly. He had seemed a little anxious in the last few days. Coroner. Did he speak of his life in Paris? Witness. He spoke of theatres and amusements there. He knew Paris very well. 
I was staying in Paris with some friends last February, when he was there, and he took us about. That was shortly after our engagement. The coroner. Did he ever speak of playing cards in Paris? Witness. I don't remember. Coroner. With regard to your marriage, had any money settlements been gone into? Witness. I don't think so. The date of the marriage was not in any way fixed. Coroner. He always appeared to have plenty of money. Witness. I suppose so. I didn't think about it. Coroner. You never heard him complain of being hard up? Witness. Everybody complains of that, don't they? The coroner. Was he a man of cheerful disposition? Witness. He was very moody, never the same two days together. Coroner. You have heard what your brother says about the deceased wishing to break off the engagement. Had you any idea of this? Witness. Not the slightest. Coroner. Can you think of any explanation now? Witness. Absolutely none. Coroner. There had been no quarrel? Witness. No. Coroner. So far as you knew, on Wednesday evening, you were still engaged to the deceased, with every prospect of being married to him shortly? Witness. Yes. Yes, certainly, of course. Coroner. He was not, forgive me this very painful question, the sort of man who would have been likely to lay violent hands on himself? Witness. Oh, I never thought. Well, I don't know. I suppose he might have done. That would explain it, wouldn't it? The Coroner. Now, Lady Mary, please don't distress yourself. Take your own time. Will you tell us exactly what you heard and saw on Wednesday night and Thursday morning? Witness. I went up to bed with Mrs. Marchbanks and Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson at about half-past nine, leaving all the men downstairs. I said good night to Dennis who seemed quite as usual. I was not downstairs when the post came. I went to my room at once. My room is at the back of the house. I heard Mr. Pettigrew Robinson come up at about ten. The Pettigrew Robinsons sleep next door to me. Some of the other men came up with him. I did not hear my brother come upstairs. At about a quarter past ten, I heard two men talking loudly in the passage, and then I heard someone run downstairs and bang the front door. Afterwards, I heard the rapid steps in the passage, and I finally heard my brother shut his door. Then I went to bed. The coroner. You did not inquire the cause of the disturbance? Witness, indifferently. I thought it was probably something about the dogs. Coroner. What happened next? Witness. I woke up at three o'clock. Coroner. What wakened you? Witness. I heard a shot. Coroner. You were not awake before you heard it? Witness. I may have been partly awake. I heard it very distinctly. I was sure it was a shot. I listened for a few minutes, and then went down to see if anything was wrong. Coroner. Why did you not call your brother or some other gentleman? Witness scornfully. Why should I? I thought it was probably only poachers, and I didn't want to make an unnecessary fuss at that unearthly hour. Coroner. 
Did the shot sound close to the house? Witness. Fairly, I think. It is hard to tell when one is awakened by a noise. It always sounds so extra loud. The coroner. It did not seem to be in the house or in the conservatory? Witness. No, it was outside. The coroner. So you went downstairs by yourself. That was very plucky of you, Lady Mary. Did you go immediately? Witness. Not quite immediately. I thought it over for a few minutes. Then I put on walking shoes over bare feet, a heavy covert coat, and a woolly cap. It may have been five minutes after hearing the shot that I left my bedroom. I went downstairs and through the billiard room to the conservatory. The coroner. Why did you go out that way? Witness. Because it was quicker than unbolting either the front door or the back door. At this point... A plan of Riddlesdale Lodge was handed to the jury. It is a roomy, two-storied house, built in a plain style, and leased by the present owner, Mr. Walter Montague, to the Duke of Denver for the season, Mr. Montague being in the States. Witness resuming. When I got to the conservatory door, I saw a man outside, bending over something on the ground. When he looked up, I was astonished to see my brother. The coroner. Before you saw who it was, what did you expect? Witness. I hardly know. It all happened so quickly. I thought it was burglars, I think. The coroner. His grace has told us that when you saw him, you cried out, Oh, God, you've killed him. Can you tell us why you said that? Witness, very pale. I thought my brother must have come upon the burglar and fired at him in self-defense. That is, if I thought at all. Coroner. Quite so. You knew that the Duke possessed a revolver? Witness. Oh, yes, I think so. Coroner. What did you do next? Witness. My brother sent me up to get help. I knocked up Mr. Arbuthnot and Mr. and Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson. Then I suddenly felt very faint and went back to my bedroom and took some sal volatile. Coroner. Alone? Witness. Yes, everybody was running about and calling out. I couldn't bear it. I... Here, the witness, who up till this moment had given her evidence very collectedly, though in a low voice, collapsed suddenly, and had to be assisted from the room. The next witness called was James Fleming, the manservant. He remembered having brought the letters from Riddlesdale at 9.45 on Wednesday evening. He had taken three or four letters to the Duke in the gunroom. He could not remember at all whether one of them had had an Egyptian stamp. He did not collect stamps. His hobby was autographs. The Honourable Frederick Arbuthnot then gave evidence— he had gone up to bed with the rest at a little before ten. He had heard Denver come up by himself some time later. Couldn't say how much later. He was brushing his teeth at the time. Laughter. He had certainly heard loud voices and a row going on next door and in the passage. Had heard somebody go for the stairs hell for leather had stuck his head out and seen Denver in the passage, had said, "'Hello, Denver, what's the row?' The Duke's reply had been inaudible. Denver had bolted into his bedroom and shouted out the window, 
"'Don't be an ass, man!' He had seemed very angry indeed, but the Honourable Freddy attached no importance to that. One was always getting across Denver, but it never came to anything. More dust than kick, in his opinion. Hadn't known Cathcart long, always found him all right. No, he didn't like Cathcart, but he was all right, you know. Nothing wrong about him that he knew of. Good Lord, no, he'd never heard it suggested he cheated at cards. Well, no, of course, he didn't go about looking out for people cheating at cards. It wasn't a thing one expected. He'd been had that way in a club at Monte once. He'd had no hand in bringing it to light, hadn't noticed anything till the fun began had not noticed anything particular in Cathcart's manner to Lady Mary, or hers to him. Didn't suppose he would ever notice anything. Did not consider himself an observing sort of man. Was not interfering by nature. Had thought Wednesday evening's dust-up none of his business. Had gone to bed, and to sleep. The coroner. Did you hear anything further that night? The Honourable Frederick. Not till poor little Mary knocked me up. Then I toddled down, and found Denver in the conservatory, bathing Cathcart's head. We thought we ought to clean the gravel and mud off his face, you know. Corner. You heard no shot? The Honourable Frederick. Not a sound, but I sleep pretty heavily. Colonel and Mrs. Marchbanks slept in the room over what was called the study, more a sort of smoking-room, really. They both gave the same account of a conversation which they had had at eleven-thirty. Mrs. Marchbanks had sat up to write some letters after the Colonel was in bed. They had heard voices and someone running about, but had paid no attention. It was not unusual for members of the party to shout and run about. At last the colonel had said, "'Come to bed, my dear. It's half-past eleven, and we're making an early start to-morrow. You won't be fit for anything.' He said this because Mrs. Marchbanks was a keen sportswoman, and always carried her gun with the rest. She replied, "'I'm just coming.' The colonel said, "'You're the only sinner burning the midnight oil. Everybody's turned in.' Mrs. Marchbanks replied, "'No, the Duke's still up. I can hear him moving about in the study.' Colonel Marchbanks listened and heard it too. Neither of them heard the Duke come up again. They had heard no noise of any kind in the night.' Mr. Pettigrew Robinson appeared to give evidence with extreme reluctance. He and his wife had gone to bed at ten. They had heard the quarrel with Cathcart. Mr. Pettigrew Robinson, fearing that something might be going to happen, opened his door in time to hear the Duke say, "'If you dare to speak to my sister again, I'll break every bone in your body.' or words to that effect. Cathcart had rushed downstairs. The Duke was scarlet in the face. He had not seen Mr. Pettigrew Robinson, but had spoken a few words to Mr. Arbuthnot, and rushed into his own bedroom. Mr. Pettigrew Robinson had run out, and said to Mr. Arbuthnot, "'I say, Arbuthnot,' and Mr. Arbuthnot had very rudely slammed the door in his face. He had then gone to the Duke's door, and said, I say, Denver, the Duke had come out, pushing past him, without even noticing him, and gone to the head of the stairs. He had heard him telling Fleming to leave the conservatory door open, as Mr. Cathcart had gone out. The Duke had then returned. 
Mr. Pettigrew Robinson had tried to catch him as he passed, and had said again, I say, Denver, what's up? The Duke had said nothing, and had shut his bedroom door with great decision. Later on, however, at eleven thirty, to be precise, Mr. Pettigrew Robinson had heard the Duke's door open, and stealthy feet moving about the passage. He could not hear whether they had gone downstairs. The bathroom and lavatory were at his end of the passage, and, if anybody had entered either of them, he thought he should have heard. He had not heard the footsteps return. He had heard his travelling clock strike twelve before falling asleep. There was no mistaking the Duke's bedroom door, as the hinge creaked in a peculiar manner. Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson confirmed her husband's evidence. She had fallen asleep before midnight, and had slept heavily. She was a heavy sleeper at the beginning of the night, but slept lightly in the early morning. She had been annoyed by all the disturbance in the house that evening, as it had prevented her from getting off. In fact, she had dropped off about ten-thirty, and Mr. Pettigrew Robinson had had to wake her an hour after to tell her about the footsteps. What with one thing and another, she only got a couple of hours' good sleep. She woke up again at two, and remained broad awake, till the alarm was given by Lady Mary. She could swear positively that she had heard no shot in the night. Her window was next to Lady Mary's, on the opposite side from the conservatory. She had always been accustomed, from a child, to sleep with her window open. In reply to a question from the coroner, Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson said she had never felt there was a real, true affection between Lady Mary Whimsey and the deceased. They seemed very off-hand, but that sort of thing was the fashion nowadays. She had never heard of any disagreement. Miss Lydia Cathcart, who had been hurriedly summoned from town, then gave evidence about the deceased man. She told the coroner that she was the captain's aunt, and his only surviving relative. She had seen very little of him since he came into possession of his father's money. He had always lived with his own friends in Paris, and they were such as she could not approve of. "'My brother and I never got on very well,' said Miss Cathcart, and he had my nephew educated abroad till he was eighteen. I fear Dennis's notions were always quite French. After my brother's death, Dennis went to Cambridge by his father's desire. I was left executrix of the will and guardian till Dennis came of age. I do not know why, after neglecting me all his life, my brother should have chosen to put such a responsibility upon me at his death, but I did not care to refuse. My house was open to Dennis during his holiday from college, but he preferred, as a rule, to go and stay with his rich friends. I cannot now recall any of their names. When Dennis was twenty-one, he came into ten thousand pounds a year. I believe it was in some kind of foreign property. I inherited a certain amount under the will as executrix, but I converted it all at once into good, sound British securities. I cannot say what Dennis did with his... It would not surprise me at all to hear that he had been cheating at cards. I have heard that the persons he consorted with in Paris were most undesirable. I never met any of them. I have never been in France. 
John Hardraw, the gamekeeper, was next called. He and his wife inhabit a small cottage just inside the gate of Riddlesdale Lodge. The grounds, which measure twenty acres or so, are surrounded at this point by a strong paling. The gate is locked at night. Hardraw stated that he had heard a shot fired at about ten minutes to twelve on Wednesday night, close to the cottage, as it seemed to him. Behind the cottage are ten acres of preserved plantation. He supposed that there were poachers about. They occasionally came in after hares. He went out with his gun in that direction, but saw nobody. He returned home at one o'clock by his watch. Corner. Did you fire your gun at any time? Witness. No. Corner. You did not go out again? Witness. I did not. Corner. Nor hear any other shots? Witness. Only that one. But I fell asleep after I got back, and was awakened up by the chauffeur going out for the doctor. That would be at about quarter past three. Corner. Is it not unusual for poachers to shoot so very near the cottage? Witness. Yes, rather. If poachers do come, it is usually on the other side of the preserve, towards the moor. Dr. Thorpe gave evidence of having been called to see deceased. He lived in Stapley, nearly fourteen miles from Riddlesdale. There was no medical man in Riddlesdale. The chauffeur had knocked him up at 3.45 a.m., and he had dressed quickly and come with him at once. They were at Riddlesdale Lodge at half-past four. Deceased, when he saw him, he judged to have been dead three or four hours. The lungs had been pierced by a bullet, and death had resulted from loss of blood and suffocation. Death would not have resulted immediately. Deceased might have lingered some time. He had made a post-mortem investigation, and found that the bullet had been deflected from a rib. There was nothing to show whether the wound had been self-inflicted, or fired from another hand at close quarters. There were no other marks of violence. Inspector Crakes, from Stapley, had been brought back in the car with Dr. Thorpe. He had seen the body. It was then lying on its back between the door of the conservatory and the covered well just outside. As soon as it became light, Inspector Crakes had examined the house and grounds. He had found bloody marks all along the path leading to the conservatory, and signs as though a body had been dragged along. This path ran into the main path, leading from the gate to the front door. Plan produced. Where the two paths joined, a shrubbery began, and ran down both sides of the path to the gate and the gamekeeper's cottage. The blood tracks had led to a little clearing in the middle of the shrubbery, about halfway between the house and the gate. Here the inspector found a great pool of blood, a handkerchief soaked in blood, and a revolver. The handkerchief bore the initials D.C., and the revolver was a small weapon of American pattern, and bore no mark. The conservatory door was open when the inspector arrived, and the key was inside. Deceased, when he saw him, was in dinner jacket and pumps, without hat or overcoat. He was wet through, and his clothes, besides being much blood-stained, were very muddy and greatly disordered through the dragging of the body. The pocket contained a cigar case and a small flat pocket knife. 
deceased's bedroom had been searched for papers etc but so far nothing had been found to shed very much light on his circumstances the duke of denver was then recalled the coroner i should like to ask your grace whether you ever saw deceased in the possession of a revolver duke of denver not since the war coroner you do not know if he carried one about with him duke of denver i have no idea coroner you can make no guess i suppose to whom this revolver belongs duke of denver in great surprise that's my revolver out of the study table drawer how did you get hold of that sensation coroner you are certain duke of denver positive i saw it there only the other day when i was hunting out some photos of mary for cathcart and i remember saying then that it was getting rusty lying about there's the speck of rust coroner did you keep it loaded duke of denver lord no i really don't know why it was there i fancy i turned it out one day with some old army stuff and found it among my shooting things when i was up at riddlesdale in august i think the cartridges were with it coroner was the drawer locked duke of denver yes but the key was in the lock my wife tells me i'm careless coroner did anybody else know the revolver was there duke of denver fleming did i think i don't know of anybody else detective inspector parker of scotland yard having only arrived on friday had been unable as yet to make any very close investigation certain indications led him to think that some person or persons had been on the scene of the tragedy in addition to those who had taken part in the discovery he preferred to say nothing more at present the coroner then reconstructed the evidence in chronological order at or a little after ten o'clock there had been a quarrel between deceased and the duke of denver after which deceased had left the house never to be seen alive again they had the evidence of mr pettigrew robinson that the duke had gone downstairs at eleven thirty and that of colonel marchbanks that he had been heard immediately afterwards moving about in the study the room in which the revolver produced in evidence was usually kept against this they had the duke's own sworn statement that he had not left his bedroom till half-past two in the morning the jury would have to consider what weight was to be attached to those conflicting statements then as to the shots heard in the night the gamekeeper had said he heard a shot at ten minutes to twelve but he had supposed it to be fired by poachers it was in fact quite possible that there had been poachers about on the other hand lady mary's statement that she had heard the shot about three a m did not fit in very well with the doctor's evidence that when he arrived at Riddlesdale at 4.30, deceased had been already three or four hours dead. They would remember also that, in Dr. Thorpe's opinion, death had not immediately followed the wound. If they believed this evidence, therefore, they would have to put back the moment of death to between 11 p.m. and midnight, and this might very well have been the shot which the gamekeeper heard in that case they had still to ask themselves about the shot which had awakened lady mary whimsey of course if they liked to put that down to poachers there was no inherent impossibility 
they next came to the body of deceased, which had been discovered by the Duke of Denver at 3 a.m., lying outside the door of the small conservatory near the covered well. There seemed little doubt from the medical evidence that the shot which killed deceased had been fired in the shrubbery, about seven minutes' distance from the house, and that the body of deceased had been dragged from that place to the house. Deceased had undoubtedly died as the result of being shot in the lungs. The jury would have to decide whether that shot was fired by his own hand or by the hand of another, and if the latter, whether by accident, in self-defense, or by malice aforethought, with intent to murder. As regards suicide, they must consider what they knew of deceased's character and circumstances. Deceased was a young man in the prime of his strength, and apparently of considerable fortune. He had had a meritorious military career, and was liked by his friends. The Duke of Denver had thought sufficiently well of him to consent to his own sister's engagement to deceased. There was evidence to show that the fiancés, though perhaps not demonstrative, were on excellent terms. The Duke affirmed that on the Wednesday night deceased had announced his intention of breaking off the engagement. Did they believe that deceased, without even communicating with the lady, or writing a word of explanation, or farewell, would thereupon rush out and shoot himself. Again, the jury must consider the accusation which the Duke of Denver said he had brought against deceased. He had accused him of cheating at cards. In the kind of society to which the persons involved in this inquiry belonged, such a misdemeanor as cheating at cards was regarded as far more shameful than such sins as murders and adultery. Possibly the mere suggestion of such a thing, whether well-founded or not, might well cause a gentleman of sensitive honor to make away with himself. But was deceased honorable? Deceased had been educated in France, and French notions of the honest thing were very different from British ones. The coroner himself had had business relations with French persons, in his capacity as a solicitor, and could assure such of the jury as had never been in France that they ought to allow for these different standards. Unhappily, the alleged letter giving details of the accusation had not been produced to them. Next, they might ask themselves whether it was not more usual for a suicide to shoot himself in the head. They should ask themselves how deceased came by the revolver. And finally, they must consider, in that case, who had dragged the body towards the house, and why the person had chosen to do so, with the great labor to himself, and at the risk of extinguishing any lingering remnant of the vital spark, instead of arousing the household and fetching help. If they excluded suicide, there remained accident, manslaughter, or murder. As to the first, if they thought it likely that deceased or any other person had taken out the Duke of Denver's revolver that night for any purpose, and that, in looking at, cleaning, shooting with, or otherwise handling the weapon, it had gone off and killed deceased accidentally, then they would return a verdict of death by misadventure accordingly. In that case, how did they explain the conduct of the person, whoever it was, who had dragged the body to the door? 
the coroner then passed on to speak of the law concerning manslaughter he reminded them that no mere words however insulting or threatening can be an efficient excuse for killing anybody and that the conflict must be sudden and unpremeditated did they think for example that the duke had gone out wishing to induce his guest to return and sleep in the house and that deceased had retorted upon him with blows or menaces of assault if so and the duke having a weapon in his hand had shot deceased in self-defence that was only manslaughter but in that case they must ask themselves how the duke came to go out to deceased with a lethal weapon in his hand and this suggestion was in direct conflict with the duke's own evidence lastly they must consider whether there was sufficient evidence of malice to justify a verdict of murder they must consider whether any person had a motive means and opportunity for killing deceased and whether they could reasonably account for that person's conduct on any other hypothesis and if they thought there was such a person and that his conduct was in any way suspicious or secretive or that he had wilfully suppressed evidence which might have had a bearing on the case or here the coroner spoke with great emphasis staring over the duke's head fabricated other evidence with intent to mislead then all these circumstances might be sufficient to amount to a violent presumption of guilt against some party in which case they were in duty bound to bring in a verdict of wilful murder against that party and in considering this aspect of the question the coroner added they would have to decide in their own minds whether the person who had dragged deceased towards the conservatory door had done so with the object of obtaining assistance or of thrusting the body down the garden well which as they had heard from inspector crakes was situated close by the spot where the body had been found if the jury were satisfied that deceased had been murdered but were not prepared to accuse any particular person on the evidence they might bring in a verdict of murder against an unknown person or persons but if they felt justified in laying the killing at any person's door then they must allow no respect of persons to prevent them from doing their duty guided by these extremely plain hints the jury without very long consultation returned a verdict of wilful murder against gerald duke of denver end of chapter one Chapter Two of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers, The Green Eyed Cat. And here's to the hound with his nose unto the ground. Drink, puppy, drink. Some people hold that breakfast is the best meal of the day. Others, less robust, hold that it is the worst, and that of all breakfasts in the week, sunday morning breakfast is incomparably the worst the party gathered about the breakfast table at riddlesdale lodge held if one might judge from their faces no brief for that day miscalled of sweet refection and holy love the only member of it who seemed neither angry nor embarrassed was the honourable freddie arbuthnot 
and he was silent, engaged in trying to take the whole skeleton out of a bloater at once. The very presence of that undistinguished fish upon the Duchess's breakfast-table indicated a disorganized household. The Duchess of Denver was pouring out coffee. This was one of her uncomfortable habits. Persons arriving late for breakfast were thereby made painfully aware of their sloth. She was a long-necked, long-backed woman who disciplined her hair and her children. She was never embarrassed, and her anger, though never permitted to be visible, made itself felt the more. Colonel and Mrs. Marchbanks sat side by side. They had nothing beautiful about them but a stolid mutual affection. Mrs. Marchbanks was not angry, but she was embarrassed in the presence of the Duchess, because she could not feel sorry for her. When you felt sorry for people, you called them poor old dear or poor dear old man. Since, obviously, you could not call the Duchess poor old dear, you were not being properly sorry for her. This distressed Mrs. Marchbanks. The Colonel was both embarrassed and angry. Embarrassed because, upon my soul, it was very difficult to know what to talk about in a house where your host has been arrested for murder. Angry, in a dim way, like an injured animal, because unpleasant things like this had no business to break in on the shooting season. Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson was not only angry, she was outraged. As a girl, she had adopted the motto stamped upon the school note-paper, Que Cunque Honesta. She had always thought it wrong to let your mind dwell on anything that was not really nice. In middle life, she still made a point of ignoring those newspaper paragraphs which bore such headlines as Assault upon a school teacher at Cricklewood, Death in a pint of stout, Seventy five pounds for a kiss, or She called him Hubbykins. She said she could not see what good it did you to know about such things. She regretted having consented to visit Riddlesdale Lodge in the absence of the Duchess. She had never liked Lady Mary. She considered her a very objectionable specimen of the modern independent young woman. Besides, there had been that very undignified incident connected with a Bolshevist, while Lady Mary was nursing in London during the war. Nor had Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson at all cared for Captain Dennis Cathcart. She did not like a young man to be handsome in that obvious kind of way. But, of course, since Mr. Pettigrew Robinson had wanted to come to Riddlesdale, it was her place to be with him. She was not to blame for the unfortunate result. Mr. Pettigrew Robinson was angry, quite simply, because the detective from Scotland Yard had not accepted his help in searching the house and grounds for footprints. As an older man of some experience in these matters, Mr. Pettigrew Robinson was a county magistrate, he had gone out of his way to place himself at the man's disposal. Not only had the man been short with him, but he had rudely ordered him out of the conservatory, where he, Mr. Pettigrew Robinson, had been reconstructing the affair from the point of view of Lady Mary. All these angers and embarrassments might have caused less pain to the company had they not been aggravated by the presence of the detective himself, a quiet young man in a tweed suit, eating curry at one end of the table next to Mr. Murbles, the solicitor. 
This person had arrived from London on Friday, had corrected the local police, and strongly dissented from the opinion of Inspector Craikes. He had suppressed at the inquest information which, if openly given, might have precluded the arrest of the Duke. He had officiously detained the whole unhappy party, on the grounds that he wanted to re-examine everybody, and was thus keeping them miserably cooped up together over a horrible Sunday. And he had put the coping-stone on his offences by turning out to be an intimate friend of Lord Peter Wimsey's, and having in consequence to be accommodated with a bed in the gamekeeper's cottage and breakfast at the lodge. Mr. Murbles, who was elderly and had a delicate digestion, had travelled up in a hurry on Thursday night. He had found the inquest very improperly conducted, and his client altogether impracticable. He had spent all his time trying to get hold of Sir Impey Biggs, K.C., who had vanished for the weekend, leaving no address. He was eating a little dry toast, and was inclined to like the detective, who called him Sir, and passed him the butter. "'Is anybody thinking of going to church?' asked the Duchess. "'Theodore and I should like to go,' said Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson. "'If it is not too much trouble, or we could walk, it is not so very far.' "'It's two and a half miles good,' said Colonel Marchbanks. Mr. Pettigrew Robinson looked at him gratefully. "'Of course you will come in the car,' said the Duchess. "'I am going myself.' "'Are you, though?' said the Honourable Freddy. "'I say, won't you get a bit stared at, what?' "'Really, Freddy,' said the Duchess, "'does that matter?' "'Well,' said the Honourable Freddy, "'I mean to say, those bounders about here are all socialists and Methodists. "'If they are Methodists,' said Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, "'they will not be at church.' "'Won't they?' retorted the Honourable Freddy. "'You bet they will, if there's anything to see. "'Why, it'll be better than a funeral to them.' "'Surely,' said Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, "'one has a duty in the matter, "'whatever our private feelings may be, "'especially at the present day "'when people are so terribly slack.' She glanced at the Honourable Freddy. "'Oh, don't you mind me, Mrs. P.' said that youth amiably. "'All I say is, if these blighters make things unpleasant, don't blame me.' "'Who ever thought of blaming you, Freddy?' said the Duchess. "'Manner of speaking,' said the Honourable Freddy. "'What do you think, Mr. Murbles?' "'I feel,' said the lawyer, carefully stirring his coffee, "'that while your intention is a very admirable one, "'and does you very great credit, my dear lady, "'yet Mr. Arbuthnot is right in saying "'it may involve you in some, er, uh, unpleasant publicity. "'Er, uh, I have always been a sincere Christian myself,' "'But I cannot feel that our religion demands that we should make ourselves conspicuous, or in such very painful circumstances.' Mr. Parker reminded himself of a dictum of Lord Melbourne. "'Well, after all,' said Mrs. Marchbanks, "'as Helen so rightly says, does it matter?' "'Nobody's really got anything to be ashamed of. "'There has been a stupid mistake, of course, "'but I don't see why anybody who wants to shouldn't go to church.' "'Certainly not, certainly not, my dear,' said the Colonel, heartily. "'We might look in ourselves, eh, dear?' 
take a walk that way, I mean, and come out before the sermon. I think it's a good thing. Shows we don't believe old Denver's done anything wrong, anyhow. You forget, dear, said his wife. I've promised to stay at home with Mary, poor girl. Of course, of course, stupid of me, said the colonel. How is she? She was very restless last night, poor child, said the duchess. Perhaps she will get a little sleep this morning. It has been a shock to her. One which may prove a blessing in disguise, said Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson. My dear, said her husband. Wonder when we shall hear from Sir Impey, said Colonel Marchbanks hurriedly. Yes, indeed, moaned Mr. Murbles. I am counting on his influence with the Duke. "'Of course,' said Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, "'he must speak out for everybody's sake. "'He must say what he was doing out of doors at that time. "'Or, if he does not, it must be discovered. "'Dear me, that's what these detectives are for, aren't they?' "'That is their ungrateful task,' said Mr. Parker suddenly. He had said nothing for a long time, and everybody jumped. There, said Mrs. Marchbanks, I expect you'll clear it all up in no time, Mr. Parker. Perhaps you've got the real mer- uh, the culprit up your sleeve all the time. Not quite, said Mr. Parker, but I'll do my best to get him. Besides, he added with a grin, I'll probably have some help on the job. From whom? inquired Mr. Pettigrew Robinson. Her Grace's brother-in-law. Peter, said the Duchess, Mr. Parker must be amused at the family amateur, she added. Not at all, said Parker. Whimsy would be one of the finest detectives in England, if he wasn't lazy. Only we can't get hold of him. I've wired to Ahasio, poste restante, said Mr. Murbles, but I don't know when he's likely to call there. He said nothing about when he was coming back to England. He's a rummy old bird, said the Honourable Freddy, tactlessly. But he ought to be here, what? What I mean to say is, if anything happens to old Denver, don't you see? He's the head of the family, ain't he? Till little pickled gherkins comes of age. In the frightful silence which followed this remark, the sound of a walking stick being clattered into an umbrella stand was distinctly audible. Who's that, I wonder? said the Duchess. The door waltzed open. Morning, dear old things said the newcomer cheerfully. How are you all? Hello, Helen. Colonel, you owe me a half-crown since last September year. Morning, Mrs. Marchbanks. Morning, Mrs. P. Well, Mr. Murbles, how do you like this billy beastly weather? Don't trouble to get up, Freddy. I'd simply hate to inconvenience you. Parker, old man, what a damned reliable old bird you are. "'Always on the spot, like that patent ointment thing. "'I say, have you all finished? "'I meant to get up earlier, but I was snoring, "'so Bunter hadn't the heart to waken me. "'I nearly blew in last night, "'only we didn't arrive till 2 a.m., "'and I thought you wouldn't half bless me if I did. "'A what, Colonel? "'Aeroplane, Victoria, from Paris to London.' northeastern to north allerton damn bad roads the rest of the way and a puncture just below riddlesdale damn bad bed at the lord in glory thought i'd blow in for the last sausage here if i was lucky what sunday morning in an english family and no sausages god bless my soul what's the world coming to eh colonel i say helen old gerald's been and gone and done it this time what 
"'You've no business to leave him on his own, you know. "'He always gets into mischief. "'What's that? Curry? Thanks, old man. "'Here, I say, you needn't be so stingy about it. "'I've been travelling for three days on end. "'Freddy, pass the toast. "'Beg pardon, Mrs. Marchbanks?' "'Oh, rather, yes, Corsica was perfectly amazing. "'All black-eyed fellows with knives in their belts, "'and jolly fine-looking girls. "'Old Bunter had a regular affair "'with the innkeeper's daughter in one place. "'Do you know he's an awfully susceptible old beggar? "'You'd never think it, would you? "'Jove, I am hungry. "'I say, Helen, I meant to get you "'some fetchin' creptochine undies from Paris.' "'But I saw that old Parker was getting ahead of me over the bloodstains, "'so we packed up all our things and buzzed off.' "'Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson rose. "'Theodore,' she said, "'I think we ought to be getting ready for church.' "'I will order the car,' said the Duchess. "'Peter, of course, I'm exceedingly glad to see you.' "'Your leaving no address was most inconvenient. "'Ring for anything you want. "'It is a pity you didn't arrive in time to see Gerald.' "'Oh, that's all right,' said Lord Peter cheerfully. "'I look him up in quad. "'You know, it's rather a good idea to keep one's crimes in the family. "'One has so many more facilities. "'I'm sorry for poor old Polly, though. "'How is she?' "'She must not be disturbed to-day,' said the Duchess, with decision. "'Not a bit of it,' said Lord Peter. "'She'll keep. "'To-day Parker and I hold high revel. "'To-day he shows me all the bloody footprints. "'It's all right, Helen, that's not swearin'. "'It's an adjective of quality. "'I hope they aren't all washed away, are they, old thing?' "'No,' said Parker.' "'I've got most of them under flower-pots.' "'Then pass the bread and squish,' said Lord Peter, "'and tell me all about it.' The departure of the church-going element had induced a more humanitarian atmosphere. Mrs. Marchbanks stumped off upstairs to tell Mary that Peter had come, and the Colonel lit a large cigar. The Honourable Freddy rose, stretched himself, pulled a leather armchair to the fireside, and sat down with his feet on the brass fender, while Parker marched round and poured himself another cup of coffee. "'I suppose you've seen the papers,' he said. "'Oh, yes, I read up the inquest,' said Lord Peter. "'You know, if you'll excuse my saying so,' "'I think you rather mucked it between you.' "'It was disgraceful,' said Mr. Murbles. "'Disgraceful. "'The coroner behaved most improperly. "'He had no business to give such a summing up. "'With a jury of ignorant country fellows, "'what could one expect? "'And the details that were allowed to come out, "'if I could have got here earlier.' "'I'm afraid that was partly my fault, Whimsy,' said Parker penitently. "'Crakes rather resents me. "'The chief constable at Stapley sent to us over his head, "'and when the message came through, "'I ran along to the chief and asked for the job, "'because I thought if there should be any misconception or difficulty, "'you see, you'd just as soon I tackled it as anybody else.' I had a few little arrangements to make about a forgery I've been looking into, and what with one thing and another I didn't get off till the night express. By the time I turned up on Friday, Crakes and the coroner were already thick as thieves, had fixed the inquest for that morning, which was ridiculous, and arranged to produce their blessed evidence as dramatically as possible. I only had time to skim over the ground, disfigured, I am sorry to say, by the prints of Crakes and his local ruffians, and really had nothing for the jury. "'Cheer up,' said Whimsy. "'I am not blaming you. Besides, it all lends excitement to the chase.' 
fact is said the honourable freddy that we ain't popular with respectable coroners giddy aristocrats and immoral frenchmen i say peter sorry you've missed miss lydia cathcart you'd have loved her she's gone back to golders green and taken the body with her oh well said whimsy i don't suppose there was anything abstruse about the body no said parker the medical evidence was all right as far as it went he was shot through the lungs and that's all though mind you said the honourable freddy he didn't shoot himself i didn't say anything not wishing to upset old denver's story but you know all that stuff about his being so upset and go to blazes in his manner it was all my whiskers how do you know said peter my my dear man cathcart and i toddled up to bed together i was rather fed up having dropped a lot on some shares besides missing everything i shot at in the morning and lost a bet i made with the colonel about the number of toes on the kitchen cat and i said to cathcart it was a hell of a damn fool world or words to that effect not a bit of it he said it's a damn good world i'm going to ask mary for a date to-morrow and then we'll go and live in paris where they understand sex i said something or other vague and he went off whistling parker looked grave colonel marchbanks cleared his throat <clears> throat> well well he said there's no accounting for a man like cathcart no accounting at all brought up in france you know not at all like a straightforward englishman always up and down up and down very sad poor fellow well well peter hope you and mr parker will find something out about it we mustn't have poor old denver cooped up in jail like this you know awfully unpleasant for him poor chap with the birds going so good this year well i expect you'll be making a tour of inspection eh mr parker what do you say to shoving the balls about freddy right you are said the honourable freddy you'll have to give me a hundred though colonel nonsense nonsense said that veteran in high good humour you play an excellent game mr murbles having withdrawn whimsy and parker faced each other over the remains of the breakfast peter said the detective i don't know if i've done the right thing by coming if you feel look here old man said his friend earnestly let's cut out the considerations of delicacy we're going to work this case like any other if anything unpleasant turns up i'd rather you saw it than anybody else it's an uncommonly pretty little case on its merits and i'm going to put some damn good work into it if you're sure it's all right my dear man if you hadn't been here i'd have sent for you now let's get to business of course i'm settin off with the assumption that old gerald didn't do it i'm sure he didn't agreed parker no no said whimsy that isn't your line nothing rash about you nothing trustful you are expected to throw cold water on my hopes and doubt all my conclusions right ho said parker where would you like to begin peter considered i think we'll start from cathcart's bedroom he said the bedroom was of moderate size with a single window overlooking the front door the bed was on the right hand side the dressing-table before the window on the left was the fireplace with an armchair before it and a small writing-table everything's as it was said parker crake's had that much sense yes said lord peter very well gerald says that when he charged cathcart with being a scamp cathcart jumped up nearly knocking the table over 
"'That's the writing table, then. "'So Cathcart was sitting in the armchair. "'Yes, he was. "'He pushed it back violently and rumpled up the carpet. "'See? So far, so good. "'Now, what was he doing there? "'He wasn't reading because there's no book about, "'and we know that he rushed straight out of the room "'and never came back. "'Very good.' Was he writin'? No. Virgin sheet of blotten paper. He might have been writing in pencil, suggested Parker. That's true, mulled Killjoy. So he might. Well, if he was, he shoved the paper into his pocket when Gerald came in, because it isn't here. But he didn't, because it wasn't found on his body. So he wasn't writing. "'Unless he threw the paper away somewhere else,' said Parker. "'I haven't been all over the grounds, you know, and at the smallest computation, if we accept the shot heard by Hardraw at 11.50 as the shot, there's an hour and a half unaccounted for. "'Very well. Let's say there is nothing to show he was writing. Will that do? Well, then.' Lord Peter drew out a lens and scrutinized the surface of the armchair carefully before sitting down in it. "'Nothing helpful there,' he said. "'To proceed. Cathcart sat where I am sitting. He wasn't writing. He—you're sure this room hasn't been touched?' "'Certain. Then he wasn't smoking. Why not?' He might have chucked the stub of a cigar or a cigarette into the fire when Denver came in. "'Not a cigarette,' said Peter. "'Or we should find traces somewhere on the floor or in the grate. That light ash blows about so. But a cigar, well, he might have smoked a cigar without leaving a sign, I suppose. But I hope he didn't. "'Why?' "'Because, old son, I'd rather Gerald's account had some element of truth in it. "'A nervy man doesn't sit down to the delicate enjoyment of a cigar before bed "'and cherish the ash with such scrupulous care. "'On the other hand, if Freddy's right and Cathcart was feeling unusually sleek and pleased with life, "'that's just the sort of thing he would do.' "'Do you think Mr. Arbuthnot would have invented all that, as a matter of fact?' said Parker, thoughtfully. "'He doesn't strike me that way. He'd have to be imaginative and spiteful to make it up, and I really don't think he's either.' "'I know,' said Lord Peter. "'I've known old Freddy all my life, and he wouldn't hurt a fly.' Besides, he simply hasn't the wits to make up any sort of a story. But what bothers me is that Gerald most certainly hasn't the wits either to invent that Adelphi drama between him and Cathcart. On the other hand, said Parker, if we allow for a moment that he shot Cathcart, he had an incentive to invent it. He would be trying to get his head out of the, I mean, when anything important is at stake. It's wonderful how it sharpens one's wits. And the story being so far-fetched does rather suggest an unpracticed storyteller. True, O oh King. Well, you've sat on all my discoveries so far. Never mind. My head is bloody but unbowed. "'Cathcart was sitting here, so your brother said. "'Curse you, I say he was. "'At least somebody was. "'He's left the impression of his sit-me-down upon the cushion. "'That might have been earlier in the day. "'Rot! They were out all day. "'You needn't overdo this Sadducee attitude, Charles. "'I say Cathcart was sitting here, and... "'Hallo, hallo! He leaned forward and stared into the grate. "'There's some burnt paper here, Charles.' 
I know, I was frightfully excited about that yesterday, but I found it was just the same in several of the rooms. They often let the bedroom fires go out when everybody's out during the day, and relight them about an hour before dinner. There's only the cook, housemaid, and Fleming here, you see, and they've got a lot to do with such a large party. Lord Peter was picking the charred fragments over. "'I cannot find anything to contradict your suggestion,' he sadly said. "'And this fragment of the Morning Post rather confirms it. "'Then we can only suppose that Cathcart sat here in a brown study, doing nothing at all. "'That doesn't get us much further, I'm afraid.' "'He got up and went to the dressing-table. "'I like these tortoise-shell sets.' he said, and the perfume is Baiser du Soir, very nice too, new to me. I must draw Bunter's attention to it. A charming manicure set, isn't it? You know, I like being clean and neat and all that, but Cathcart was the kind of man who always impressed you as being just a little too well turned out. Poor devil! and he'll be buried at Golder's Green, after all. I only saw him once or twice, you know. He impressed me as knowing about everything there was to know. I was rather surprised at Mary's taken to him, but then I know really awfully little about Mary. You see, she's five years younger than me. When the war broke out, she'd just left school and gone to a place in Paris— and I joined up, and she came back and did nursing and social work, so I only saw her occasionally. At that time she was rather taken up with a new scheme for putting the world to rights, and hadn't a lot to say to me, and she got hold of some pacifist fellow who was a bit of a stummer, I fancy. Then I was ill, you know, and after I got the chuck from Barbara— I didn't feel much like bothering about other people's heart-to-hearts. Then I got mixed up in the Attenbury Diamond case, and the result is I know uncommonly little about my own sister. But it looks as though her taste in men had altered. I know my mother said Cathcart had charm. That means he was attractive to women, I suppose. No man can see what makes that in another man. But mother is usually right. What's become of this fellow's papers? He left very little here, replied Parker. There is a check-book on Cox's Charing Cross branch, but it's a new one and not very helpful. Apparently he only kept a small current account with them for convenience when he was in England. The checks are mostly to self, with an occasional hotel or tailor. Any passbook? I think all his important papers are in Paris. He has a flat there, near the river somewhere. We're in communication with the Paris police. He had a room in the Albany. I've told them to lock it up till I get there. I thought of running up to town tomorrow. Yes, you'd better— any pocket-book? Yes, here you are, about thirty pounds in various notes, a wine merchant's card, and a bill for a pair of riding breeches. No correspondence? Not a line. No, said Whimsy. He was the kind, I imagine, that didn't keep letters, much too good an instinct of self-preservation. Yes, I asked the servants about his letters, as a matter of fact. They said he got a good number, but never left them about. They couldn't tell me much about the ones he wrote, because all the outgoing letters are dropped into the post-bag, which is carried down to the post-office, as it is, and opened there, or handed over to the postman, when, or if, he calls. The general impression was that he didn't write much. The housemaid said she never found anything to speak of in the waste-paper basket. "'Well, that's uncommonly helpful. Wait a moment. 
here's his fountain pen very handsome onoto with complete gold casing dear me entirely empty well i don't know that one can deduce anything from that exactly i don't see any pencil about by the way i'm inclined to think you're wrong in supposing that he was writing letters i didn't suppose anything said parker mildly i dare say you're right lord peter left the dressing-table looked through the contents of the wardrobe and turned over the two or three books on the pedestal beside the bed la rotisserie de la reine pédoc l'anneau d'ametiste south wind our young friend works out very true to type chronique d'un cadet de coutras tut tut charles manon lescaut hm is there anything else in this room i ought to look at i don't think so where'd you like to go now we'll follow em down wait a jiff who are in the other rooms oh yes here's gerald's room helen's at church in we go of course this has been dusted and cleaned up and generally ruined for purposes of observation i am afraid so i could hardly keep the duchess out of her bedroom no here's the window gerald shouted out of hm nothing in the grate here naturally the fire's been lit since i say i wonder where gerald did put that letter to freeborns i mean nobody's been able to get a word out of him about it said parker old mr murbles had a fearful time with him the duke insists simply that he destroyed it mr murbles says that's absurd so it is if he was going to bring that sort of accusation against his sister's fiance he'd want some evidence of a method in his madness wouldn't he or was he one of those roman brothers who say simply as the head of the family i forbid the bands and that's enough gerald said whimsy is a good clean decent thoroughbred public school boy and a shocking ass but i don't think he's so medieval as that but if he has the letter why not produce it why indeed letters from old college friends in egypt aren't as a rule compromising you don't suppose suggested parker tentatively that this mr freeborn referred in his letter to any old er entanglements which your brother wouldn't wish the duchess to know about lord peter paused while absently examining a row of boots that's an idea he said there were occasions mild ones but helen would make the most of them he whistled thoughtfully still when it comes to the gallows do you suppose whimsy that your brother really contemplates the gallows asked parker i think murbles put it to him pretty straight said lord peter quite so but does he actually realize imaginatively that it is possible to hang an english peer for murder on circumstantial evidence lord peter considered this imagination isn't gerald's strong point he admitted i suppose they do hang peers they can't be beheaded on tower hill or anything i'll look it up said parker but they certainly hanged earl ferrers in 1760 did they though said lord peter ah uh, well as the old pagan said of the gospels after all it was a long time ago and we'll hope it wasn't true it's true enough said parker and he was dissected and anatomized afterwards but that part of the treatment is obsolete we'll tell gerald about it said lord peter 
and persuade him to take the matter seriously. Which are the boots he wore Wednesday night? These, said Parker. But the fools cleaned them. Yes, said Lord Peter bitterly. Hmm, a good heavy lace-up boot, the sort that sends the blood to the head. He wore leggings, too, said Parker. These. Rather elaborate preparations for a stroll in the garden. But, as you were just going to say, the night was wet. I must ask Helen if Gerald ever suffered from insomnia. I did. She said she thought not as a rule, but that he occasionally had toothache, which made him restless. It wouldn't send one out of doors on a cold night, though. Well, let's get downstairs. They passed through the billiard room, where the colonel was making a sensational break, and into the small conservatory which led from it. Lord Peter looked gloomily round at the chrysanthemums and boxes of bulbs. "'These damp flowers look jolly healthy,' he said. "'Do you mean you've been letting the gardener swarm in here every day to water em? "'Yes,' said Parker apologetically. "'I did.' "'But he's had strict orders only to walk on these mats.' "'Good,' said Lord Peter. "'Take them up, then, and let's get to work.' With his lens to his eye, he crawled cautiously over the floor. "'They all came through this way, I suppose,' he said. "'Yes,' said Parker. "'I've identified most of the marks. "'People went in and out. "'Here's the Duke.' He comes in from outside. He trips over the body. Parker had opened the outer door and lifted some matting to show a trampled patch of gravel, discolored with blood. He kneels by the body. Here are his knees and toes. Afterwards, he goes into the house through the conservatory, leaving a good impression in black mud and gravel just inside the door. Lord Peter squatted carefully over the marks. "'It's lucky the gravel's so soft here,' he said. "'Yes, it's just a patch. The gardener tells me it gets very trampled and messy just here, owing to his coming to fill cans from the water trough. They filled the trough up from the well every so often, and then carried the water away in cans.' It got extra bad this year, and they put down fresh gravel a few weeks ago. Pity they didn't extend their labors all the way down the path while they were about it, grunted Lord Peter, who was balancing himself precariously on a small piece of sacking. Well, that bears out old Gerald so far. Here's an elephant been over this bit of box border. Who's that? "'Oh, that's a constable. I put him at eighteen stone. He's nothing, and this rubber sole with a patch on it is Craig's. He's all over the place. This squelchy-looking thing is Mr. Arbuthnot in bedroom slippers, and the galoshes are Mr. Pettigrew Robinson. We can dismiss all those. But now here, just coming over the threshold, is a woman's foot in a strong shoe. I make that out to be Lady Mary's. Here it is again, just at the edge of the well. She came out to examine the body. Quite so, said Peter. And then she came in again, with a few grains of red gravel on her shoes. Well, that's all right. Hello, on the outer side of the conservatory were some shelves for small plants, and beneath these a damp and dismal bed of earth occupied in a sprawling and lackadaisical fashion by stringy cactus plants and a sporadic growth of maidenhair fern and masked by a row of large chrysanthemums in pots. "'What have you got?' inquired Parker." seeing his friend peering into this green retreat. Lord Peter withdrew his long nose from between two pots and said, Who put what down here? 
Parker hastened to the place. There, among the cacti, was certainly the clear mark of some oblong object with corners that had been stood out of sight on the earth behind the pots. "'It's a good thing Gerald's gardener ain't one of those conscientious blighters that can't even let a cactus alone for the winter,' said Lord Peter. "'Or he'd have tenderly lifted these little drooping heads. "'Oh, damn and blast the beastly plant for a crimson porcupine. "'You measure it.' "'Parker measured it. Two and a half feet by six inches,' he said and fairly heavy for it sunk in and broken the plants about was it a bar of anything i fancy not said lord peter the impression is deeper on the farther side i think it was something bulky set up on edge and leaned against the glass if you ask for my private opinion i should guess that it was a suitcase a suitcase exclaimed parker why a suitcase why indeed i think we may assume that it didn't stay here very long it would have been exceedingly visible in the daytime but somebody might very well have shoved it in here if they were caught with it say at three o'clock in the morning and didn't want it to be seen then when did they take it away almost immediately i should say before daylight anyhow or even inspector crakes could hardly have failed to see it it's not the doctor's bag i suppose no unless the doctor's a fool or i put a bag inconveniently in a damp and dirty place out of the way when every law of sense and convenience would urge him to pop it down handy by the body no unless crakes or the gardener has been leaving things about it was thrust away there on wednesday night by gerald by cathcart or i suppose by mary nobody else could be supposed to have anything to hide yes said parker one person who's that the person unknown who's he for answer mr parker proudly stepped to a row of wooden frames carefully covered with matting stripping this away with the air of a bishop unveiling a memorial he disclosed a v-shaped line of footprints these said parker belong to nobody to nobody i've ever seen or heard of i mean hooray said peter then downwards from the steep hill's edge they tracked the footmarks small only they're largish no such luck said parker it's more a case of they followed from the earthy bank those footsteps one by one into the middle of the plank and farther there were none great poet wordsworth said lord peter how often i've had that feeling now let's see these footmarks a man's number ten with worn-down heels and a patch on the left inner side advance from the hard bit of the path which shows no footmarks they come to the body here where the pool of blood is and i say that's rather odd don't you think no perhaps not there are no footmarks under the body can't say it's such a mess well the unknown gets so far here's a footmark deeply pressed in was he just going to throw cathcart into the well he hears a sound he starts he turns he runs on tiptoe into the shrubbery by jove yes said parker and the tracks come out on one of the grass paths in the wood and there's an end of them hm well we'll follow them later now where did they come from 
Together, the two friends followed the path away from the house. The gravel, except for the little patch before the conservatory, was old and hard, and afforded but little trace, particularly as the last few days had been rainy. Parker, however, was able to assure Whimsy that there had been definite traces of dragging and bloodstains. "'What sort of bloodstains? Smears?' "'Yes, smears, mostly. There were pebbles displaced, too, all the way. And now here is something odd. It was the clear impression of the palm of a man's hand, heavily pressed into the earth of a herbaceous border, the fingers pointing towards the house. On the path the gravel had been scraped up into long furrows, there was blood on the grass border between the path and the bed, and the edge of the grass was broken and trampled. "'I don't like that,' said Lord Peter. "'Ugly, isn't it?' agreed Parker. "'Poor devil,' said Peter. "'He made a determined effort to hang on here. "'That explains the blood by the conservatory door.' But what kind of a devil drags a corpse that isn't quite dead? A few yards farther, the path ran into the main drive. This was bordered with trees, widening into a thicket. At the point of intersection of the two paths were some further indistinct marks, and in another twenty yards or so they turned aside into the thicket. A large tree had fallen at some time and made a little clearing, in the midst of which a tarpaulin had been carefully spread out and pegged down. The air was heavy with the smell of fungus and fallen leaves. "'Scene of the tragedy,' said Parker, briefly, rolling back the tarpaulin. Lord Peter gazed down sadly. Muffled in an overcoat and a thick grey scarf, he looked, with his long, narrow face, like a melancholy adjutant stork. The writhing body of the fallen man had scraped up the dead leaves and left a depression in the sodden ground. At one place the darker earth showed where a great pool of blood had soaked into it, and the yellow leaves of a Spanish poplar were rusted with no autumnal stain. "'That's where they found the handkerchief and revolver,' said Parker. "'I looked for finger marks, but the rain and mud had messed everything up.' "'Whimsy took out his lens, lay down, and conducted a personal tour of the whole space, slowly, on his stomach, Parker moving mutely after him. "'He paced up and down for some time,' said Lord Peter. He wasn't smoking. He was turning something over in his mind, or waiting for somebody. What's this? Aha! Here's our number ten foot again, coming in through the trees on the farther side. No signs of a struggle. That's odd. Cathcart was shot close up, wasn't he? Yes, it singed his shirt front. Quite so. Why did he stand still to be shot at? I imagine, said Parker, that if he had an appointment with number ten boots, it was somebody he knew who could get close to him without arousing suspicion. Then the interview was a friendly one, on Cathcart's side, anyhow. But the revolver's a difficulty— how did number ten get hold of gerald's revolver the conservatory door was open said parker dubiously nobody knew about that except gerald and fleming retorted peter besides do you mean to tell me that number ten walked in here went to the study fetched the revolver walked back here and shot cathcart it seems a clumsy method. If he wanted to do any shooting, why didn't he come armed in the first place? 
"'It seems more probable that Cathcart brought the revolver,' said Parker. "'Then why no signs of a struggle?' "'Perhaps Cathcart shot himself,' said Parker. "'Then why should number ten drag him into a conspicuous position and then run away?' "'Wait a minute,' said Parker. "'How's this?' Number ten has an appointment with Cathcart to blackmail him, let's say. He somehow gets word of his intention to him between 9.45 and 10.15. That would account for the alteration in Cathcart's manner and allow both Mr. Arbuthnot and the Duke to be telling the truth. Cathcart rushes violently out after his row with your brother, he comes down here to keep his appointment. He paces up and down, waiting for number ten. Number ten arrives and parleys with Cathcart. Cathcart offers him money. Number ten stands out for more. Cathcart says he really hasn't got it. Number ten says in that case he blows the gaff. Cathcart retorts, in that case you go to the devil. I'm going there myself. Cathcart who has previously got hold of the revolver, shoots himself. Number 10 is seized with remorse. He sees that Cathcart isn't quite dead. He picks him up and part drags, part carries him to the house. He's smaller than Cathcart and not very strong and finds it a hard job. They have just got to the conservatory door when Cathcart has a final hemorrhage and gives up the ghost. Number 10 suddenly becomes aware that his position in somebody else's grounds, alone with a corpse at 3 a.m., wants some explaining. He drops Cathcart and bolts. Enter the Duke of Denver and falls over the body. Tableau. That's good, said Lord Peter. That's very good. But when do you suppose it happened? Gerald found the body at 3 a.m. The doctor was here at 4.30 and said Cathcart had been dead several hours. Very well. Now, how about that shot my sister heard at 3 o'clock? Look here, old man, said Parker. I don't want to appear rude to your sister. May I put it like this? I suggest that that shot at 3 a.m. was poachers. Poachers, by all means, said Lord Peter. Well, really, Parker, I think that hangs together. Let's adopt that explanation provisionally. The first thing to do is now to find number 10, since he can bear witness that Cathcart committed suicide. And that, as far as my brother is concerned, is the only thing that matters a rap. But for the satisfaction of my own curiosity, I'd like to know what was number 10 blackmailing Cathcart about? Who hid a suitcase in the conservatory? And what was Gerald doing in the garden at 3 a.m.? Well, said Parker, Suppose we begin by tracing where number 10 came from. Hi, hi, cried Whimsy as they returned to the trail. Here's something. Here's real treasure trove, Parker. From amid the mud and the fallen leaves, he retrieved a tiny glittering object, a flash of white and green between his fingertips. It was a little charm, such as women hang upon a bracelet, a diminutive diamond cat with eyes of bright emerald. End of chapter 2「Chapter 3 of Clouds of Witness » by Dorothy Sayers this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mudstains and Bloodstains Other things are all very well in their way, 
but give me blood we say there it is that's blood it is an actual matter of fact we point it out it admits of no doubt we must have blood you know david copperfield hitherto said lord peter as they picked their painful way through the little wood on the trail of gents number tens i have always maintained that those obliging criminals who strew their tracks with little articles of personal adornment here he is on a squashed fungus were an invention of detective fiction for the benefit of the author i see that i have still something to learn about my job well you haven't been at it very long have you said parker besides we don't know that the diamond cat is the criminals it may belong to a member of your own family and have been lying here for days it may belong to mr what's-his-name in the states or to the last tenant but one and have been lying here for years this broken branch may be our friend i think it is i'll ask the family said lord peter and we could find out in the village if anyone's ever inquired for a lost cat they're puka stones it ain't the sort of thing one would drop without making a fuss about i've lost him altogether it's all right i've got him he's tripped over a root serve him glad said lord peter viciously straightening his back i say i don't think the human frame is very thoughtfully constructed for this sleuth hound business if one could go on all fours or had eyes in one's knees it would be a lot more practical there are many difficulties inherent in a teleological view of creation said parker placidly ah here we are at the park palings and here's where he got over said lord peter pointing to a place where the chevaux de frise on the top was broken away here's the dent where his heels came down and here's where he fell forward on hands and knees hmm give us a back old man would you thanks an old break i see mr montague now in the states should keep his palings in better order number ten tore his coat on the spikes all the same he left a fragment of burberry behind him what luck here's a deep damp ditch on the other side which i shall now proceed to fall into a slithering crash proclaimed that he had carried out his intention parker thus callously abandoned looked round and seeing that they were only a hundred yards or so from the gate ran along and was let out decorously by hardraw the gamekeeper who happened to be coming out of the lodge by the way said parker to him did you ever find any signs of any poachers on wednesday night after all nay said the man not so much as a dead rabbit i reckoned lady were mistaken and tore the shot i heard as killed captain possibly said parker do you know how long the spikes have been broken off the palings over there a month or two happen they should have been put right but the man's sick the gates locked at night i suppose i anybody wishing to get in would have to waken you ay that he would you didn't see any suspicious character loitering about outside these palings last wednesday i suppose nay sir but my wife may a done hey lass mrs hardraw thus summoned appeared at the door with a small boy clinging to her skirts wednesday said she nay i saw no loiterin folks i keep a lookout for traps and such as it be such a lonely place wednesday 
Eh, hey, now, John, that would be today the young man come with the motorbike. Young man with a motorbike? I reckon twas. He said he'd had a puncture and asked for a bucket of water. Was that all the asking he did? He asked what were to name at place and whose house it were. Did you tell him the Duke of Denver was living here? Aye, sir, and he said he supposed a many gentlemen came up for shooting. Did he say where he was going? He said he'd come up fra Weardale and were making a trip into Cumberland. And how long was he here? Happen a half an hour, and then he tried to get his machine started, and I see him hop hop it in away towards King's Fenton. She pointed away to the right, where Lord Peter might be seen gesticulating in the middle of the road. What sort of a man was he? Like most people, Mrs. Hardraw was poor at definition. She thought he was youngish and tallish, neither dark nor fair, in such a long coat as motor bicyclists use, with a belt round it. Was he a gentleman? Mrs. Hardraw hesitated, and Mr. Parker mentally classed the stranger as not quite quite. You didn't happen to notice the number of the bicycle? Mrs. Hardraw had not. But it had a side car, she added. Lord Peter's gesticulations were becoming quite violent, and Mr. Parker hastened to rejoin him. Come on, gossiping old thing, said Lord Peter unreasonably. This is a beautiful ditch. From such a ditch as this, when the soft wind did gently kiss the trees, and they did make no noise, from such a ditch our friend, methinks, mounted the Trojan walls, and wiped his soles upon the greasy mud. Look at my trousers! It's a bit of a climb from this side, said Parker. It is. He stood here in the ditch, and put one foot into this place, where the paling's broken away, and one hand on the top, and hauled himself up. Number ten must have been a man of exceptional height, strength, and agility. I couldn't get my foot up, let alone reaching the top with my hand. I'm five foot nine. Could you? Parker was six foot, and could just touch the top of the wall with his hand. I might do it on one of my best days, he said, for an adequate object, or after adequate stimulant. Just so, said Lord Peter. Hence we deduce number ten's exceptional height and strength. Yes, said Parker. It's a bit unfortunate that we had to deduce his exceptional shortness and weakness just now, isn't it? Oh, said Peter, well, well, as you so rightly say, that is a bit unfortunate. Well, it may clear up presently. He didn't have a confederate to give him a back or a leg, I suppose. Not unless the confederate was a being without feet or any visible means of support, said Lord Peter, indicating the solitary print of a pair of patched tens. By the way, how did he make straight in the dark for the place where the spikes were missing? Looks as though he belonged to the neighborhood, or had reconnoitred previously. Arising out of that reply, said Parker, I will now relate to you the entertaining gossip I have had with Mrs. Hardraw. Hum, said Whimsy at the end of it, that's interesting. We'd better make inquiries at Riddlesdale and King's Fenton. Meanwhile, we know where number ten came from. 
now where did he go after leaving cathcart's body by the well the footsteps went into the preserve said parker i lost them there there's a regular carpet of dead leaves and bracken well but we needn't go through all that sleuth grind again objected his friend the fellow went in and as he presumably is not there still he came out again he didn't come out through the gate or hardra would have seen him he didn't come out the same way he went in or he would have left some traces therefore he came out elsewhere let's walk round the wall then we'll turn to the left said parker since that's the side of the preserve and he apparently went through there true o king and as this isn't a church there's no harm in going round widdershins talking of church there's helen coming back get a move on old thing they crossed the drive passed the cottage and then leaving the road followed the paling across some open grass fields it was not long before they found what they sought from one of the iron spikes above them dangled forlornly a strip of material with parker's assistance whimsy scrambled up in a state of almost lyric excitement here we are he cried the belt of a burberry no sort of precaution here here are the toe prints of a fellow sprinting for his life he tore off his burberry he made desperate leaps one two three at the palings at the third leap he hooked it on to the spikes he scrambled up scoring long scrabbling marks on the paling he reached the top oh here's a blood stain run into this crack he tore his hands he dropped off he wrenched the coat away leaving the belt dangling i wish you'd drop off grumbled parker you're breaking my collarbone peter dropped off obediently and stood there holding the belt between his fingers his narrow grey eyes wandered restlessly over the field suddenly he seized parker's arm and marched briskly in the direction of the wall on the farther side a low erection of unmortared stone in the fashion of the country here he hunted along like a terrier nose foremost the tip of his tongue caught absurdly between his teeth then jumped over and turning to parker said did you ever read the lay of the last minstrel i learnt a good deal of it at school said parker why because there was a goblin page boy in it said lord peter who was always yelling found 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 at the most unnecessary moments i always thought him a terrible nuisance but now i know how he felt see here close under the wall and sunk heavily into the narrow and muddy lane which ran up here at right angles to the main road was the track of a side-car combination very nice too said mr parker approvingly new dunlop tire on the front wheel old tire on the back gaiter on the side car tire nothing could be better tracks come in from the road and go back to the road fellow shoved the machine in here in case anybody of an inquisitive turn of mind should pass on the road and make off with it or take its number then he went round on shank's mare to the gap he'd spotted in the daytime and got over after the cat cart affair he took fright bolted into the preserve and took the shortest way to his bus regardless well now 
He sat down on the wall, and, drawing out his notebook, began to jot down a description of the man from the data already known. "'Things begin to look a bit more comfortable for old Jerry,' said Lord Peter. He leaned on the wall and began whistling softly, but with great accuracy, that elaborate passage of Bach which begins, "'Let Zion's Children.' "'I wonder,' said the Honourable Freddy Arbuthnot, "'what damn silly fool invented Sunday afternoon.' He shoveled coals on to the library fire with a vicious clatter, waking Colonel Marchbanks, who said, "'Eh? Yes, quite right,' and fell asleep again instantly. "'Don't you grumble, Freddy,' said Lord Peter, who had been occupied for some time in opening and shutting all the drawers of the writing-table in a thoroughly irritating manner, and idly snapping to and fro the catch of the French window. Think how dull old Jerry must feel. Suppose I'd better write him a line. He returned to the table and took a sheet of paper. Do people use this room much to write letters in, do you know? "'No idea,' said the Honourable Freddy. "'Never write em myself. "'Where's the point of writin' when you can wire? "'Encourages people to write back, that's all. "'I think Denver writes here, when he writes anywhere, "'and I saw the Colonel wrestlin' with pen and ink a day or two ago. "'Didn't you, Colonel?' "'The Colonel grunted, answering to his name like a dog "'that wags its tail in its sleep. "'What's the matter? Ain't there any ink?' "'I only wondered,' replied Peter placidly. He slipped a paper-knife under the top sheet of the blotting-pad and held it up to the light. "'Quite right, old man. Give you full marks for observation. Here's Jerry's signature, and the Colonel's, and a big sprawly hand, which I should judge to be feminine.' He looked at the sheet again, shook his head, folded it up, and placed it in his pocket-book. "'Doesn't seem to be anything there,' he commented. "'But you never know. Five something of fine something. Grouse, probably. O.E. is F.O.U. is found, I suppose.' "'Well, it can't do any harm to keep it.' He spread out his paper and began. "'Dear Jerry, here I am, the family sleuth on the trail, and it's damned exciting.' The colonel snored. Sunday afternoon. Parker had gone with the car to King's Fenton, with orders to look in at Riddlesdale on the way, and inquire for a green-eyed cat, also for a young man with a side-car. The Duchess was lying down. Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson had taken her husband for a brisk walk. Upstairs somewhere Mrs. Marchbanks enjoyed a perfect communion of thought with her husband. Lord Peter's pen gritted gently over the paper, stopped, moved on again, stopped altogether. He leaned his long chin on his hands and stared out of the window, against which there came sudden little swishes of rain, and from time to time a soft dead leaf. The colonel snored. The fire tingled. The Honourable Freddy began to hum and tap his fingers on the arms of his chair. The clock moved slothfully on to five o'clock, which brought tea-time and the Duchess. "'How's Mary?' asked Lord Peter, coming suddenly into the firelight. "'I'm really worried about her,' said the Duchess. "'She is giving way to her nerves in the strangest manner. It is so unlike her. She will hardly let anybody come near her.' I have sent for Dr. Thorpe again. 
"'Don't you think she'd be better if she got up and came downstairs a bit?' suggested Whimsy. "'Gets broodin' about things all by herself, I shouldn't wonder. Wants a bit of Freddy's intellectual conversation to cheer her up.' "'You forget, poor girl,' said the Duchess. "'She was engaged to Captain Cathcart. Everybody isn't as callous as you are.' "'Any more letters, Your Grace?' asked the footman, appearing with the post-bag. "'Oh, are you going down now?' said Whimsy. "'Yes, here you are, and there's one other, if you don't mind waiting a minute while I write it. "'Wish I could write at the rate people do on the cinema,' he added, scribbling rapidly as he spoke. "'Dear Lillian,' "'Your father has killed Mr. William Snooks, and, unless you send me a thousand pounds by bearer, I shall disclose all to your husband. Sincerely, Earl of Digglesbreak. "'That's the style, and all done in one scrape of the pen. Here you are, Fleming.' The letter was addressed to Her Grace, the Dowager Duchess of Denver. From the Morning Post of Monday, November blank, 19 blank. Abandoned Motorcycle A singular discovery was made yesterday by a cattle drover. He is accustomed to water his animals in a certain pond lying a little off the road about twelve miles south of Ripley. On this occasion, he saw that one of them appeared to be in difficulties. On going to the rescue, he found the animal entangled in a motorcycle, which had been driven into the pond and abandoned. With the assistance of a couple of workmen, he extricated the machine. It is a Douglas with dark grey sidecar. The number plates and license holder have been carefully removed. The pond is a deep one, and the outfit was entirely submerged. It seems probable, however, that it could not have been there for more than a week, since the pond is much used on Sundays and Mondays for the watering of cattle. The police are making search for the owner. The front tire of the bicycle is a new Dunlop, and the side-car tire has been repaired with a gaiter. The machine is a 1914 model, much worn. That seems to strike a chord, said Lord Peter, musingly. He consulted a timetable for the time of the next train to Ripley, and ordered the car. And send Bunter to me, he added. That gentleman arrived just as his master was struggling into an overcoat. What was that thing in last Thursday's paper about a number plate, Munter? inquired his lordship. Mr. Bunter produced, apparently by ledger domain, a cutting from an evening paper. Number Plate Mystery the Reverend Nathaniel Foulis, of St. Simon's, North Felcott, was stopped at six o'clock this morning for riding a motorcycle without number plates. The Reverend gentleman seemed thunderstruck when his attention was called to the matter. He explained that he had been sent for in great haste at four a.m. to administer the sacrament to a dying parishioner six miles away. He hastened out on his motorcycle, which he confidingly left by the roadside while executing his sacred duties. Mr. Foolis left the house at five-thirty without noticing that anything was wrong. Mr. Foolis is well known in North Felcott and the surrounding country, and there seems little doubt that he has been the victim of a senseless practical joke. North Falcott is a small village a couple miles north of Ripley. "'I'm going to Ripley, Bunter,' said Lord Peter. "'Yes, my lord. Does your lordship require me?' 
no said lord peter but who has been ladies mating my sister bunter ellen my lord the housemaid then i wish you'd exercise your powers of conversation on ellen very good my lord does she mend my sister's clothes and brush her skirts and all that i believe so my lord nothing she may think is of any importance you know bunter i wouldn't suggest such a thing to a woman my lord it goes to their heads if i may say so when did mr parker leave for town at six o'clock this morning my lord circumstances favoured mr bunter's inquiries he bumped into Ellen as she was descending the back stairs with an armful of clothing. A pair of leather gauntlets was jerked from the top of the pile, and, picking them up, he apologetically followed the young woman into the servants' hall. "'There,' said Ellen, flinging her burden on the table, "'and the work I've had to get them, I'm sure. Tantrums, that's what I call it. "'Pretending you've got such a headache you can't let a person into the room "'to take your things down to brush, "'and as soon as they're out of the way, hopping out of bed and traipsing all over the place. "'Tisn't what I call a headache, would you now? "'But there, I dare say you don't get them like I do. "'Regular fit to split my head is sometimes. "'Couldn't keep on my feet, not if the house was burning down.' i just have to lay down and keep lying something cruel it is and gives a person such wrinkles in one's forehead i'm sure i don't see any wrinkles said mr bunter but perhaps i haven't looked hard enough an interlude followed during which mr bunter looked hard enough and close enough to distinguish wrinkles no said he wrinkles i don't believe i'd see any if i was to take his lordship's big microscope he keeps up in town lor now mr bunter said ellen fetching a sponge and a bottle of benzine from the cupboard what would his lordship be using a thing like that for now why in our hobby you see miss ellen which is criminal investigation we might want to see something magnified extra big as it might be handwriting in a forgery case to see if anything's been altered or rubbed out or if different kinds of ink have been used or we might want to look at the roots of a lock of hair to see if it's been torn out or fallen out or take blood-stains now we'd want to know if it was animal's blood or human blood, or maybe only a glass of port. Now, is it really true, Mr. Bunter, said Ellen, laying a tweed skirt out upon the table and unstoppering the benzine, that you and Lord Peter can find out all that? Of course, we aren't analytical chemists, Mr. Bunter replied, but his lordship's dabbled in a lot of things enough to know when anything looks suspicious and if we've any doubts we send to a very famous scientific gentleman he gallantly intercepted ellen's hand as it approached the skirt with a benzine soaked sponge for instance now here's a stain on the hem of this skirt just at the bottom of the side seam now supposing it was a case of murder we'll say and the person that had worn this skirt was suspected i should examine that stain here mr bunter whipped a lens out of his pocket then i might try it at one edge with a wet handkerchief he suited the action to the word and i should find you see that it came off red then i should turn the skirt inside out i should see that the stain went right through and i should take my scissors mr bunter produced a small sharp pair 
and snip off a tiny bit of the inside edge of the seam like this. He did so, and pop it into a little pillbox so. The pillbox appeared magically from an inner pocket, and seal it up both sides with a wafer, and write on the top Lady Mary Whimsey's skirt, and the date. Then I should send it straight off to the analytical gentleman in London, and he'd look through his microscope and tell me right off that it was rabbit's blood, maybe, and how many days it had been there, and that would be the end of that. Finished Mr. Bunter triumphantly, replacing his nail scissors, and thoughtlessly pocketing the pill-box with its contents. "'Well, need be wrong, then,' said Ellen, with an engaging toss of the head, "'because it's bird's blood, and not rabbit's at all, because her ladyship told me so. And wouldn't it be quicker just to go and ask the person than getting fiddling round with your silly old microscope and things?' "'Well, I only mentioned rabbits for an example,' said Mr. Bunter. "'Funny she should have got a stain down there. Must have regularly knelt in it. "'Yes, bled a lot, hasn't it, poor thing? Somebody must have been shootin' careless-like. "'Twasn't his grace, nor yet the captain, poor man. Perhaps it was Mr. Arbuthnot. He shoots a bit wild sometimes.' It's a nasty mess, anyway, and it's so hard to clean off, being left so long. I'm sure I wasn't thinking about cleaning nothing the day the poor captain was killed. And then the coroner's inquest. Ah, it it was, and his grace being took off like that. Well, there, it upset me. I suppose I'm a bit sensitive. Anyhow, we was all at sixes and sevens for a day or two, and then— her ladyship shuts herself up in her room and won't let me go near the wardrobe. Ow, she says, do leave that wardrobe door alone. Don't you know how it squeaks? And my head's so bad, and my nerves so bad I can't stand it, she says. I was only going to brush your skirts, my lady, I says. Bother my skirts, says her ladyship, and do go away, Ellen. I shall scream if I see you fidgeting about there. You get on my nerves, she says. Well, I don't see why I should go on, not after being spoken to like that. It's very nice to be a ladyship, and all your tempers coddled and called nervous prostration. I know I was dreadfully cut up about poor Bert, my young man what was killed in the war. Nearly cried my eyes out, I did. But law, Mr. Bunter, I'd be ashamed to go on so. Besides, between you and I and the gate-post, Lady Mary wasn't that fond of the captain, never appreciated him, that's what I said to Cook at the time, and she agreed with me. He had a way with him, the captain had, always quite the gentleman, of course, and never said anything as wasn't his place. I don't mean that— but I mean as it was a pleasure to do anything for him, such a handsome man as he was to Mr. Bunter. Ah, said Mr. Bunter, so, on the whole, her ladyship was a bit more upset than you expected her to be. Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Bunter, I think it's just temper. She wanted to get married and away from home. Drat this stain! It's regular drive in. She and his grace could never get on, and when she was away in London during the war she had a rare old time, nursing officers and going about with all kinds of queer people his grace didn't approve of. Then she had some sort of love affair with some quite low-down sort of fellow, so Cook says— I think he was one of them dirty Russians as wants to blow us all to smithereens, as if there hadn't been enough people blown up in the war already. Anyhow, his grace made a dreadful fuss, 
and stopped supplies and sent for her ladyship home and ever since then she's been just mad to be off with somebody full of notions she is makes me tired i can tell you now i'm sorry for his grace i can see what he thinks poor gentleman and then to be taken up for murder and put in jail just like one of them nasty tramps fancy ellen having exhausted her breath and finished cleaning off the blood-stains paused and straightened her back hard work it is she said rubbing i quite ache if you would allow me to help you said mr bunter appropriating the hot water the benzine bottle and the sponge he turned up another breadth of the skirt have you got a brush handy he asked to take this mud off you're as blind as a bat mr bunter said ellen giggling can't you see it's just in front of you ah uh, yes said the valet but that's not as hard a one as i'd like just you run and get me a real hard one there's a dear good girl and i'll fix this for you cheek said ellen but she added relenting before the admiring gleam in mr bunter's eye i'll get the clothes brush out of the hall for you that's as hard as a brick bat that is no sooner was she out of the room than mr bunter produced a pocket-knife and two more pill-boxes in a twinkling of an eye he had scraped the surface of the skirt in two places and written two fresh labels gravel from lady mary's skirt about six inches from hem silver sand from hem of lady mary's skirt he added the date and had hardly pocketed the boxes when ellen returned with the clothes brush the cleaning process continued for some time to the accompaniment of desultory conversation a third stain on the skirt caused mr bunter to stare critically hello he said her ladyship's been trying her hand at cleaning this herself what cried ellen she peered closely at the bark which at one edge was smeared and whitened and had a slightly greasy appearance well i never she exclaimed so she has whatever's that for i wonder and her pretending to be so ill she couldn't raise her head off the pillow she's a sly one she is couldn't it have been done before suggested mr bunter well she might have been at it between the day the captain was killed and the inquest agreed ellen though you wouldn't think that was a time to choose to begin learning domestic work she ain't much hand at it anyhow for all her nursing i never believed that came to anything she's used soap said mr bunter benzining away resolutely can she boil water in her room now whatever should she do that for mr bunter exclaimed ellen amazed you don't think she keeps a kettle i bring up her morning tea ladyships don't want to boil water no said mr bunter and why didn't she get it from the bathroom he scrutinized the stain more carefully still very amateurish he said distinctly amateurish interrupted i fancy an energetic young lady but not ingenious the last remarks were addressed in confidence to the benzine bottle ellen had put her head out of the window to talk to the gamekeeper the police superintendent at ripley received lord peter at first frigidly and later when he found out who he was with a mixture of the official attitude to private detectives and the official attitude to a duke's son 
"'I've come to you,' said Whimsy, "'because you can do this comin'-out business "'a sight better than an amateur like myself. "'I suppose your fine organization's hard at work already, what?' naturally said the superintendent but it's not altogether easy to trace a motorcycle without knowing the number look at the bournemouth murder he shook his head regretfully and accepted a villar y villar we didn't think at first of connecting him with the number plate business the superintendent went on in a careless tone which somehow conveyed to Lord Peter that his own remarks within the last half-hour had established the connection in the official mind for the first time. Of course, if he'd been seen going through Ripley without a number plate, he'd have been noticed and stopped, whereas with Mr. Foolis's he was as safe as, as the Bank of England he concluded in a burst of originality obviously said whimsy very agitatin for the parson poor chap so early in the morning too i suppose it was just taken to be a practical joke just that agreed the superintendent but after hearing what you have to tell us we shall use our best efforts to get the man. I expect his grace won't be any too sorry to hear he's found. You may rely on us, and if we find the man or the number plates— Lord bless and save us, man, broke in Lord Peter with unexpected vivacity. You are not going to waste your time looking for number plates— what do you suppose he'd pinch the curate's plates for if he wanted to advertise his own about the neighbourhood once you drop on them you've got his name and address as long as they're in his trousers pocket you're up a gum tree now forgive me superintendent for shovin along with my own opinion but i simply can't bear to think of you taking all that trouble for nothing dragging ponds and turning over rubbish heaps looking for number plates that ain't there you just scour the railway stations for a young man six foot one or two with a number ten shoe and dressed in a burberry that's lost its belt with a deep scratch on one of his hands and look here here's my address and i'll be very grateful if you'll let me know anything that turns up so awkward for my brother you know sensitive man feels it keenly by the way i'm a very uncertain bird always hopping about you might wire me any news in duplicate to biddlesdale and to town one ten piccadilly always delighted to see you by the way if ever you're in town you'll forgive me sloping off now won't you i've got a lot to do Returning to Riddlesdale, Lord Peter found a new visitor seated at the tea-table. At Peter's entry he rose into towering height, and extended a shapely, expressive hand that would have made an actor's fortune. He was not an actor, but he found this hand useful nevertheless in the exploitation of dramatic moments. His magnificent build— and the mobility of his head and mask were impressive. His features were flawless, his eyes ruthless. The dowager duchess had once remarked, "'Sir Impey Biggs is the handsomest man in England, and no woman will ever care tuppence for him.' He was, in fact, thirty-eight and a bachelor, and was celebrated for his rhetoric and his suave but pitiless dissection of hostile witnesses the breeding of canaries was his unexpected hobby and besides their song he could appreciate no music but review airs 
he answered Wimsey's greeting in his beautiful, resonant, and exquisitely controlled voice. Tragic irony, cutting contempt, or a savage indignation were the emotions by which Sir Impey Biggs swayed court and jury. He prosecuted murderers of the innocent, defended in actions for criminal libel, and moving others was himself as stone. Whimsy expressed himself delighted to see him, in a voice, by contrast, more husky and hesitant even than usual. "'You just come from Jerry?' he asked. "'Fresh toast, please, Fleming. How is he? Enjoying it?' i never knew a fellow like jerry forgetting the least possible out of any situation i'd rather like the experience myself you know only i'd hate being shut up and watching the other idiots bungling my case no reflection on Murbles and you biggs i mean myself i mean the man who'd be me if i was jerry you follow me i was just saying to sir impey said the duchess that he really must make gerald say what he was doing in the garden at three in the morning if only i'd been at riddlesdale none of this would have happened of course we all know that he wasn't doing any harm but we can't expect the jurymen to understand that the lower orders are so prejudiced it is absurd of Gerald not to realize that he must speak out. He has no consideration. I am doing my very best to persuade him, Duchess, said Sir Impey, but you must have patience. Lawyers enjoy a little mystery, you know. Why, if everybody came forward and told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, straight out, we should all retire to the workhouse. Captain Cathcart's death is very mysterious, said the Duchess, though when I think of the things that have come out about him, it really seems quite providential as far as my sister-in-law is concerned. I suppose you couldn't get him to bring it in death by the visitation of God, could you, Biggs? suggested Lord Peter sort of judgment for wanting to marry into our family, what? I have known less reasonable verdicts, returned Biggs dryly. It's wonderful what you can suggest to a jury if you try. I remember once at the Liverpool Assizes. He steered skillfully away into a quiet channel of reminiscence. Lord Peter watched his statuesque profile against the fire. It reminded him of the severe beauty of the charioteer of Delphi, and was about as communicative. It was not until after dinner that Sir Impey opened his mind to Whimsy. The Duchess had gone to bed, and the two men were alone in the library. Peter, scrupulously in evening dress, had been valeted by Bunter, and had been more than usually rambling and cheerful all evening. He now took a cigar, retired to the largest chair, and effaced himself in a complete silence. Sir Impey Biggs walked up and down for some half-hour, smoking. Then he came across with determination, brutally switched on a reading lamp right into Peter's face, sat down opposite to him, and said, "'Now, Whimsy, I want to know all you know.' "'Do you, though?' said Peter. He got up, disconnected the reading lamp, and carried it away to a side table. "'No bullying of the witness, though.' he added, and grinned. "'I don't care, so long as you wake up,' said Biggs, unperturbed. "'Now then.' Lord Peter removed his cigar from his mouth, considered it with his head on one side, turned it carefully over, 
decided that the ash could hang on to its parent leaf for another minute or two, smoked without speaking until collapse was inevitable, took the cigar out again, deposited the ash entire in the exact centre of the ash tray, and began his statement, omitting only the matter of the suitcase and Bunter's information obtained from Ellen. Sir Impey Biggs listened with what Peter irritably described as a cross-examining countenance, putting a sharp question every now and again. He made a few notes, and, when Whimsy had finished, sat tapping his notebook thoughtfully. "'I think we can make a case out of this,' he said, "'even if the police don't find your mysterious man. "'Denver's silence is an awkward complication, of course.' "'He hooded his eyes for a moment. "'Did you say you'd put the police on to find this fellow?' "'Yes.' "'Have you a very poor opinion of the police?' "'Not for that kind of thing. That's in their line. They have all the facilities, and do it very well. "'Ah, you expect to find this man, do you?' "'I hope to.' "'Ah, what do you think is going to happen to my case if you do find him, Whimsy? "'What do I see here, Whimsy? said the barrister. "'You are not a fool, and it's no use trying to look like a country policeman. "'You are really trying to find this man?' "'Certainly.' "'Just as you like, of course. "'But my hands are rather tied already. "'Has it ever occurred to you that perhaps he'd better not be found?' "'Whimsy stared at the lawyer.' with such honest astonishment as actually to disarm him. "'Remember this,' said the latter earnestly, "'that if once the police get hold of a thing or a person, "'it's no use relying on my or Merbles's or anybody's professional discretion. "'Everything's raked out into the light of common day, "'and very common it is.' Here's Denver, accused of murder, and he refuses, in the most categorical way, to give me the smallest assistance. Jerry's an ass. He doesn't realize. Do you suppose, broke in Biggs, I have not made it my business to make him realize? All he says is, they can't hang me, I didn't kill the man though i think it's a jolly good thing he's dead it's no business of theirs what i was doing in the garden now i ask you whimsy is that a reasonable attitude for a man in denver's position to take up peter muttered something about never had any sense had anybody told denver about this other man "'Something vague was said about footsteps at the inquest, I believe. "'The Scotland Yard man is a personal friend, I'm told?' "'Yes. So much the better. He can hold his tongue. "'Look here, Biggs. This is all damned impressive and mysterious. "'But what are you getting at? "'Why shouldn't I lay hold of the beggar if I can?' "'I'll answer that question by another,' Sir Impey leaned forward a little. "'Why is Denver screening him?' Sir Impey Biggs was accustomed to boast that no witness could perjure himself in his presence undetected. As he put the question, he released the other's eyes from his, and glanced down with finest cunning at Whimsy's long, flexible mouth and nervous hands. When he glanced up again a second later, he met the eyes passing, guarded and inscrutable, 
through all the changes expressive of surprised enlightenment. But by that time it was too late. He had seen a little line at the corner of the mouth fade out, and the fingers relaxed ever so slightly. The first movement had been one of relief. "'By Jove!' said Peter. "'I never thought of that. "'What sleuths you lawyers are! "'If that's so, I'd better be careful, haven't I? "'Always was a bit rash. "'My mother says... "'You're a clever devil, Whimsy, said the barrister. "'I may be wrong. "'Find your man, by all means. "'There's just one thing I'd like to ask. "'Whom are you screening?' "'Look here, Biggs,' said Whimsy. "'You're not paid to ask that kind of question here, you know. "'You can jolly well wait till you get into court. "'It's your job to make the best of the stuff we serve up to you, "'not to give us the third degree. "'Suppose I murdered Cathcart myself?' "'You didn't.' "'I know I didn't. "'But if I did, I'm not going to have you asking questions "'and looking at me in that tone of voice. "'However, just to oblige you, I don't mind saying plainly "'that I don't know who did away with the fellow. "'When I do, I'll tell you. "'You will?' "'Yes, I will, but not till I'm sure. "'You people can make such a little circumstantial evidence go such a damn long way. "'You might hang me while I was only in the early stages of suspecting myself.' "'Hm,' said Biggs. "'Meanwhile, I tell you candidly, I am taking the line that they can't make out a case.' "'Not proven, eh? Well, anyhow, Biggs,' "'I swear my brother shan't hang for lack of my evidence.' "'Of course not,' said Biggs, adding inwardly. "'But you hope it won't come to that.' A spurt of rain plashed down the wide chimney and sizzled on the logs. Craven Hotel, Strand, W.C. Tuesday My dear Whimsy, a line, as I promised, to report progress, but it's precious little. On the journey up, I sat next to Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, and opened and shut the window for her, and looked after her parcels. She mentioned that when your sister roused the household on Thursday morning, she went first to Mr. Arbuthnot's room, a circumstance which the lady seemed to think odd, but which is natural enough when you come to think of it the room being directly opposite the head of the staircase it was mr arbuthnot who knocked up the pettigrew robinsons and mr p ran downstairs immediately mrs p then saw that lady mary was looking very faint and tried to support her your sister threw her off rudely mrs p says declined in a most savage manner all offers of assistance rushed to her own room and locked herself in mrs pettigrew robinson listened at the door to make sure as she says that everything was all right but hearing her move about and slamming cupboards she concluded that she would have more chance of poking her finger into the pie downstairs and departed. If Mrs. Marchbanks had told me this, I admit I should have thought the episode worth looking into, but I feel strongly that if I were dying I should still lock the door between myself and Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson. Mrs. P. was quite sure that at no time had Lady Mary anything in her hand, she was dressed, as described at the inquest, a long coat over her pyjamas, sleeping suit, was Mrs. P.'s expression, stout shoes and a woolly cap, and she kept these garments on throughout the subsequent visit of the doctor. 
Another odd little circumstance is that Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, who was awake, you remember, from 2 a.m. onwards, is certain that just before Lady Mary knocked on Mr. Arbuthnot's door, she heard a door slam somewhere in the passage. I don't know what to make of this. Perhaps there is nothing in it, but I just mention it. I've had a rotten time in town. Your brother-in-law-elect was a model of discretion. His room in Albany is a desert from a detecting point of view. No papers, except a few English bills and receipts and invitations. I looked up a few of his inviters, but they were mostly men who had met him at the club or knew him in the army and could tell me nothing about his private life. He is known at several night clubs. I made the round of them last night, or rather this morning. General verdict, generous, but impervious. By the way, poker seems to have been his great game. No suggestion of anything crooked. He won pretty consistently on the whole, but never very spectacularly. I think the information we want must be in Paris. I have written to the Sûreté and the Crédit Lyonnais to produce his papers, especially his account and checkbook. I'm pretty dead with yesterday's and today's work. Dancing all night on top of a journey is a jolly poor joke. Unless you want me, I'll wait here for the papers, or I may run over to Paris myself. Cathcart's books here consist of a few modern French novels of the usual kind, and another copy of Manon, with what the catalogues call curious plates. He must have had a life somewhere, mustn't he? The enclosed bill from a beauty specialist in Bond Street may interest you. I called on her. She says he came regularly every week when he was in England. I drew quite a blank at King's Fenton on Sunday. Oh, but I told you that. I don't think the fellow ever went there. I wonder if he slunk off up into the moor. Is it worth rummaging about, do you think? rather like looking for a needle in a bundle of hay. It's odd about that diamond cat. You've got nothing out of the household, I suppose? It doesn't seem to fit number ten, somehow, and yet you'd think somebody would have heard about it in the village if it had been lost. Well, so long. Yours ever, Charles Parker. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And his daughter much afraid. The women also looked pale and wan. The Pilgrim's Progress Mr. Bunter brought Parker's letter up to Lord Peter in bed on the Wednesday morning. The house was almost deserted, everybody having gone to attend the police court proceedings at North Allerton. The thing would be purely formal, of course, but it seemed only proper that the family should be fully represented. The Dowager Duchess, indeed, was there, she had promptly hastened to her son's side, and was living heroically in furnished lodgings. But the younger Duchess thought her mother-in-law more energetic than dignified. There was no knowing what she might do if left to herself. She might even give an interview to a newspaper reporter. Besides, at these moments of crisis, a wife's right place is at her husband's side. Lady Mary was ill, and nothing could be said about that, and if Peter chose to stay smoking cigarettes in his pyjamas, 
while his only brother was undergoing public humiliation, that was only what might be expected. Peter took after his mother. How that eccentric strain had got into the family, her grace could easily guess. The dowager came of a good Hampshire family, but there was foreign blood at the roots of her family tree. Her own duty was clear, and she would do it. Lord Peter was awake, and looked rather fagged, as though he had been sleuthing in his sleep. Mr. Bunter wrapped him solicitously in a brilliant oriental robe, and placed the tray on his knees. "'Bunter,' said Lord Peter, rather fretfully, "'your café au lait is the one tolerable incident in this beastly place.' "'Thank you, my lord. Very chilly again this morning, my lord, but not actually raining.' Lord Peter frowned over his letter. "'Anything in the paper, Bunter?' "'Nothing urgent, my lord. A sale next week at Northbury Hall. Mr. Fleetwhite's library, my lord. A Caxton Confessio Amantis.' "'What's the good of telling me that when we're stuck up here for God knows how long? I wish to heaven I'd stuck to books and had never touched crime.' "'Did you send those specimens up to Lubbock?' "'Yes, my lord,' said Bunter gently. "'Dr. Lubbock was the analytical gentleman.' "'Must have facts,' said Lord Peter. "'Facts. "'When I was a small boy I always hated facts, "'thought of them as nasty hard things, "'all knobs, uncompromising.' "'Yes, my lord.' "'My old mother. "'Your mother, Bunter? "'Didn't know you had one. "'I always imagined you were turned out ready-made, so to speak. "'Excuse me, infernally rude of me. "'Beg your pardon, I'm sure. "'Not at all, my lord. "'My mother lives in Kent, my lord, near Maidstone. Seventy-five, my lord, and an extremely active woman for her years.' "'if you'll excuse my mentioning it. "'I was one of seven. "'That is an invention, Bunter. "'I know better. "'You are unique. "'But I interrupted you. "'You were going to tell me about your mother. "'She always says, my lord, "'that facts are like cows. "'If you look them in the face hard enough, "'they generally run away.' She is a very courageous woman, my lord. Lord Peter stretched out his hand impulsively, but Mr. Bunter was too well trained to see it. He had, indeed, already begun to strop a razor. Lord Peter suddenly bundled out of bed with a violent jerk and sped across the landing to the bathroom. Here he revived sufficiently to lift up his voice in come unto these yellow sands. Thence, feeling in a purcellish mood, he passed to I attempt from love's sickness to fly, with such improvement of spirits that, against all custom, he ran several gallons of cold water into the bath and sponged himself vigorously. Wherefore, after a rough toweling, he burst explosively from the bathroom, and caught his shin somewhat violently against the lid of a large oak chest, which stood at the head of the staircase, so violently indeed that the lid lifted with the shock and shut down with a protesting bang. Lord Peter stopped to say something expressive, and to caress his leg softly with the palm of his hand. Then a thought struck him. He set down his towels, soap, sponge, loofah, bath brush, and other belongings, and quietly lifted the lid of the chest. Whether, like the heroine of Northanger Abbey, he expected to find anything gruesome inside was not apparent. 
it is certain that like her he beheld nothing more startling than certain sheets and counterpanes neatly folded at the bottom unsatisfied he lifted the top one of these gingerly and inspected it for a few moments in the light of the staircase window he was just returning it to its place whistling softly the while when a little hiss of indrawn breath caused him to look up with a start his sister was at his elbow he had not heard her come but she stood there in her dressing-gown her hands clutched together on her breast her blue eyes were dilated till they looked almost black and her skin seemed nearly the color of her ash-blonde hair Whimsy stared at her over the sheet he held in his arms, and the terror in her face passed over into his, stamping them suddenly with the mysterious likeness of blood relationship. Peter's own impression was that he stared, quote, like a stuck pig, end quote, for about a minute. He knew, as a matter of fact, that he had recovered himself in a fraction of a second, he dropped the sheet into the chest and stood up. "'Hallo, Polly, old thing,' he said. "'Where have you been hiding all this time? First time I've seen you. Afraid you've been having a pretty thin time of it.' He put his arm round her and felt her shrink. "'What's the matter?' he demanded. "'What's up, old girl? Look here, Mary, we've never seen enough of each other, but I am your brother.' are you in trouble can't i trouble she said why you silly old peter of course i'm in trouble don't you know they've killed my man and put my brother in prison isn't that enough to be troubled about <laughs> she laughed and peter suddenly thought she's talking like somebody in a blood and thunder novel she went on more naturally it's all right peter truly only my head's so bad i really don't know what i'm doing what are you after you made such a noise i came out i thought it was a door banging you'd better toddle back to bed said lord peter you're getting all cold why do girls wear such mimsy little pajim jams in this damn cold climate there don't you worry I'll drop in on you later, and we'll have a jolly old pow-wow. What? Not to-day, not to-day, Peter. I'm going mad, I think. Sensation fiction again, thought Peter. Are they trying, Gerald, to-day? Not exactly trying, said Peter, urging her gently along to her room. It's just informal, you know, the old jolly magistrate bird hears the charge read, and then old Murbles pops up and says please he wants only formal evidence given, as he has to instruct counsel. That's Biggie, you know. Then they hear the evidence of arrest, and Murbles says old Gerald reserves his defense. That's all, till the assizes. Evidence before the grand jury, a lot of bosh. That'll be early next month, I suppose. You'll have to buck up then, and to be fit by then. Mary shuddered. No, no. Couldn't I get out of it? I couldn't go through it all again. I should be sick. I'm feeling awful. No, don't come in. I don't want you. Ring the bell for Ellen. No, let go. Go away. I don't want you, Peter. Peter hesitated a little alarmed much better not my lord if you'll excuse me said bunter's voice at his ear only produce hysterics he added as he drew his master gently from the door very distressin for both parties and altogether unproductive of results better to wait for the return of her grace the dowager quite right said peter he turned back to pick up his paraphernalia, but was dexterously forestalled. Once again he lifted the lid of the chest and looked in. 
"'What did you say you found on that skirt, Bunter?' "'Gravel, my lord, and silver sand.' "'Silver sand!' Behind Riddlesdale Lodge the moor stretched starkly away and upward. The heather was brown and wet, and the little streams had no colour in them. It was six o'clock, but there was no sunset. Only a paleness had moved behind the thick sky from east to west all day. Lord Peter, tramping back after a long and fruitless search for tidings of the man with the motorcycle, voiced the dull suffering of his gregarious spirit. "'I wish old Parker was here,' he muttered, and squelched down a sheep track. He was making not directly for the lodge, but for a farmhouse about two and a half miles distant from it, known as Grider's Hole. It lay almost due north of Riddlesdale Village, a lonely outpost on the edge of the moor, in a valley of fertile land between two wide swells of heather. The track wound down from the height called Wemmeling Fell, skirted a vile swamp, and crossed the little river rid about half a mile before reaching the farm. Peter had small hope of hearing any news at Grider's Hole, but he was filled with a sudden determination to leave no stone unturned. Privately, however, he felt convinced that the motorcycle had come by the high road, Parker's investigations notwithstanding, and perhaps passed directly through King's Fenton without stopping or attracting attention. Still, he had said he would search the neighborhood, and Grider's Hole was in the neighborhood. He paused to relight his pipe, then squelched steadily on. The path was marked with stout white posts at regular intervals, and presently with hurdles. The reason for this was apparent as one came to the bottom of the valley, for only a few yards on the left began the stretch of rough reedy tussocks with slobbering black bog between them, in which anything heavier than a water wagtail would speedily suffer change into a succession of little bubbles. Whimsy stooped for an empty sardine tin, which lay horribly battered at his feet, and slung it idly into the quag. It struck the surface with a noise like a wet kiss, and vanished instantly. With that instinct which prompts one when depressed to wallow in every circumstance of gloom, Peter leaned sadly upon the hurdles, and abandoned himself to a variety of shallow considerations upon one the vanity of human wishes, two, mutability, three, first love, four, the decay of idealism, five, the aftermath of the great war, six, birth control, and seven, the fallacy of free will. This was his nadir, however, Realizing that his feet were cold, and his stomach empty, and that he still had some miles to go, he crossed the stream on a row of slippery stepping-stones, and approached the gate of the farm, which was not an ordinary five-barred one, but solid and uncompromising. A man was leaning over it, sucking a straw. He made no attempt to move at Whimsy's approach. "'Good evening,' said that nobleman in a sprightly manner, laying his hand on the catch. "'Chilly, ain't it?' The man made no reply, but leaned more heavily and breathed. He wore a rough coat and breeches, and his leggings were covered with manure. "'Seasonable, of course, what?' said Peter. Good for the sheep, I dare say, 
makes their wool curl and so on. The man removed the straw and spat in the direction of Peter's right boot. To lose many animals in the bog, went on Peter, carelessly unlatching the gate and leaning upon it in the opposite direction. I see you have a good wall all round the house. Must be a bit dangerous in the dark, what? If you're thinking of taking a little evening stroll with a friend. The man spat again pulled his hat over his forehead, and said briefly, "'What doest thou want?' "'Well,' said Peter, "'I thought of paying a little friendly call on Mr. "'on the owner of this farm, that is to say, "'country neighbours and all that. "'Lonely kind of country, don't you see? "'Is he in, do you think?' "'The man grunted. "'I'm glad to hear it,' said Peter. "'It's so uncommonly jolly finding all you Yorkshire people so kind and hospitable. What? "'Never mind who you are. Always a seat at the fireside and that kind of thing. "'Excuse me, but do you know you're leaning on the gate so's I can't open it? "'I'm sure it's a pure oversight. "'Only you mayn't realize that just where you're standing you get the maximum of leverage.' "'What an awfully charming house this is, isn't it? "'All so jolly stark and grim and all the rest of it. "'No creepers or little rose-grown porches "'or anything suburban of that sort. "'Who lives in it?' "'The man surveyed him up and down for some moments "'and replied, "'Mr. Grimethorpe.' "'No, does he now?' said Lord Peter. "'To think of that!' "'Just the fellow I want to see. "'Model farmer, what? "'Wherever I go throughout the length and breadth of the North Riding, "'I hear of Mr. Grimethorpe. "'Grimethorpe's butter is the best. "'Grimethorpe's fleeces never go to pieces. "'Grimethorpe's pork melts on the fork. "'For Irish stews take Grimethorpe's use. A tummy lined with Grimethorpe's beef never, never comes to grief. It has been my life's ambition to see Mr. Grimethorpe in the flesh. And you, no doubt, are his sturdy henchman and right-hand man. You leap from bed before the breaking day to milk the kine amid the scented hay. You, when the shades of evening gather deep, Home from the mountain lead your mild-eyed sheep. You, by the ingle's red and welcoming blaze, Tell your sweet infant's tales of olden days. A wonderful life, though a trifle monotonous, perhaps, in the winter. Allow me to clasp your honest hand. Whether the man was moved by this lyric outburst, or whether the failing light was not too dim to strike a pale sheen from the metal in Lord Peter's palm, at any rate he moved a trifle back from the gate. "'Thanks awfully, old bean,' said Peter, stepping briskly past him. "'I take it I shall find Mr. Grimthorpe in the house?' The man said nothing till Whimsy had proceeded about a dozen yards up the flagged path. Then he hailed him, but without turning round. Master. Yes, old thing, said Peter, affably returning. I've been nil set dog on the. You don't say so, said Peter. The faithful hound welcomes the return of the prodigal. Scene of family rejoicing, my own long-lost boy. Psalms and speeches, beer all round for the delighted tenantry. Glees by the old fireside till the rafters ring and all the smoked hams tumble down to join in the revelry. Good night, sweet prince, until the cows come home and the dogs eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel when the hounds of spring are on winter's traces. I suppose, he added to himself, they will have finished tea. 
As Lord Peter approached the door of the farm, his spirits rose. He enjoyed paying this kind of visit. Although he had taken to detecting, as he might, with another conscience or constitution, have taken to Indian hemp for its exhilarating properties, at a moment when life seemed dust and ashes, he had not primarily the detective temperament. He expected next to nothing from inquiries at Grider's Hole, and if he had, he might probably have extracted all the information he wanted by a judicious display of treasury notes to the glum man at the gate. Parker would in all likelihood have done so. He was paid to detect and to do nothing else, and neither his natural gifts nor his education at Barrow in Furnace Grammar School prompted him to stray into side tracks at the beck of an ill regulated imagination. But to Lord Peter the world presented itself as an entertaining labyrinth of side issues. He was a respectable scholar in five or six languages, a musician of some skill and more understanding, something of an expert in toxicology, a collector of rare editions, an entertaining man about town, and a common sensationalist. He had been seen at half-past twelve on a Sunday morning, walking in Hyde Park in a top hat and frock coat, reading news of the world. His passion for the unexplored led him to hunt up obscure pamphlets in the British Museum, to unravel the emotional history of income tax collectors, and to find out where his own drains led to. In this case, the fascination problem of a Yorkshire farmer, who habitually set the dogs on casual visitors, imperatively demanded investigation in a personal interview. The result was unexpected. His first summons was unheeded, and he knocked again. This time there was a movement and a surly male voice called out, "'Well, let un in, then, dang un, and dang thee,' established by the sound of something falling or thrown across the room. The door was opened unexpectedly by a little girl of about seven, very dark and pretty, and rubbing her arm as though the missile had caught her there. She stood defensively, blocking the threshold, till the same voice growled impatiently, "'Well, who is it?' "'Good evening,' said Whimsy, removing his hat. "'I hope you'll excuse me dropping in like this. I'm living at Riddlesdale Lodge.' "'What of it?' demanded the voice. Above the child's head, Whimsy saw the outline of a big, thick-set man smoking in the inglenook of an immense fireplace. There was no light but firelight, for the window was small and dusk had already fallen. It seemed to be a large room, but a high oak settle on the farther side of the chimney ran out across it, leaving a cavern of impenetrable blackness beyond. "'May I come in?' said Whimsy. "'If the must,' said the man ungraciously. "'Shut door, lass, what art staring at? Go to the mother and bid her mend the manners for thee.' This seemed a case of the pot lecturing the kettle on cleanliness, but the child vanished hurriedly into the blackness behind the settle, and Peter walked in. "'Are you Mr. Grindthorpe? he asked politely. "'What if I am?' retorted the farmer. "'I've no call to be ashamed of my name.' "'Rather not,' said Lord Peter, "'nor of your farm. Delightful place. What? "'My name's Whimsy, by the way. Lord Peter Whimsy, in fact. "'The Duke of Denver's brother, you know. "'I'm sure I hate interrupting you, 
you must be busy with the sheep and all that but i thought you wouldn't mind if i just ran over in a neighbourly way lonely sort of country ain't it i like to know the people next door and all that sort of thing i'm used to london you see where people live pretty thick on the ground i suppose very few strangers ever pass this way none said mr grimethorpe with decision well perhaps it's as well pursued lord peter makes one appreciate one's home circle more what often think one sees too many strangers in town nothing like one's family when all's said and done cosy don't you know you a married man mr grimethorpe what the hell's that to you growled the farmer rounding on him with such ferocity that whimsy looked about quite nervously for the dogs before mentioned oh nothing he replied only i thought that charming little girl might be yours and if i thought she weren't said mr grimthorpe i'd strangle the bitch and her mother together what has got to say to that as a matter of fact the remark considered as a conversational formula seemed to leave so much to be desired that whimsy's natural loquacity suffered a severe check he fell back however on the usual resource of the mail and offered mr grimthorpe a cigar thinking to himself as he did so what a hell of a life that woman must lead the farmer declined the cigar with a single word and was silent whimsy lit a cigarette for himself and became meditative watching his companion he was a man about forty-five apparently rough harsh and weather-beaten with great ridgy shoulders and short thick thighs a bull-terrier with a bad temper deciding that delicate hints would be wasted on such an organism whimsy adopted a franker method to tell the truth mr grimthorpe he said i didn't flow in without any excuse at all always best to provide oneself with an excuse for a call what though it's so perfectly delightful to see you i mean no excuse might appear necessary but the fact is i'm looking for a young man a an acquaintance of mine who said he'd be roaming about this neighbourhood some time or other about now only i'm afraid i may have missed him you see i've only just got over from corsica interest in country and all that mr grimthorpe but a trifle out of the way and from what my friend said i think he must have turned up here about a week ago and found me out just my luck but he didn't leave his card so i can't be quite sure you see you didn't happen to come across him by any chance tall fellow with big feet on a motorcycle with a side car i thought he might have come rootin about here hello do you know him the farmer's face had become swollen and almost black with rage what day says the he demanded thickly i should think last wednesday night or thursday morning said peter with a hand on his heavy malacca cane i knew it growled mr grimthorpe the slut and all these doomed women with their dirty ways look here mester the tyke were a friend o thine well i wore at stapley wednesday and thursday the knew that didn't the and so did the friend didn't un and if i adn't it'd a been worse for un he'd a been in peter's pot and i'd a caught un and that's where thou'll be the send in a minute blast tha and if i find un sneakin here again i'll blast every boon in his body and send un to look for thee there and with these surprising words he made for peter's throat like a bulldog 
that won't do said peter disentangling himself with an ease which astonished his opponent and catching his wrist in a grip of mysterious and excruciating agony tisn't wise you know might murder a fellow like that nasty business murder coroner's inquest and all that sort of thing counsel for the prosecution askin all sorts of inquisitive questions and a fellow puttin a string round your neck besides your method's a bit primitive stand still you fool or you'll break your arm a feelin better that's right sit down you'll get into trouble one of these days behavin like that when you're asked a civil question get out house said mr grimethorpe sullenly certainly said peter i have to thank you for a very entertainin evening mr grimethorpe i'm sorry you can give me no news of my friend mr grimethorpe sprang up with a blasphemous ejaculation and made for the door shouting jabez lord peter stared after him for a moment and then stared round the room something fishy here he said fella knows somethin murderous sort of brute i wonder he peered round the settle and came face to face with a woman a dim patch of whiteness in the thick shadow you she said in a low hoarse gasp you you are mad to come here quick quick he has gone for the dogs she placed her two hands on his breast thrusting him urgently back then as the firelight fell upon his face she uttered a stifled shriek and stood petrified a medusa head of terror medusa was beautiful says the tale and so was this woman a broad white forehead under massed dusky hair black eyes glowing under straight brows a wide passionate mouth a shape so wonderful that even in that strenuous moment sixteen generations of feudal privilege stirred in lord peter's blood his hands closed over hers instinctively but she pulled herself hurriedly away and shrank back madam said whimsy recovering himself i don't quite a thousand questions surged up in his mind but before he could frame them a long yell and another and then another came from the back of the house run run she said the dogs my god my god what will become of me go if you don't want to see me killed go go have pity look here said peter can't i stay and protect you can stay and murder me said the woman go peter cast public school tradition to the winds caught up his stick and went the brutes were at his heels as he fled he struck the foremost with his stick and it dropped back snarling the man was still leaning on the gate and grimthorpe's hoarse voice was heard shouting to him to seize the fugitive peter closed with him there was a scuffle of dogs and men and suddenly peter found himself thrown bodily over the gate as he picked himself up and ran he heard the farmer cursing the man and the man retorting that he couldn't help it then the woman's voice uplifted in a frightened wail he glanced over his shoulder the man and the woman and a second man who had now joined the party were beating the dogs back and seemed to be persuading grimthorpe not to let them through apparently their remonstrances had some effect for the farmer turned moodily away and the second man called the dogs off with much whip-cracking and noise the woman said something and her husband turned furiously upon her and struck her to the ground 
Peter made a movement to go back, but a strong conviction that he could only make matters worse for her arrested him. He stood still and waited till she had picked herself up and gone in, wiping the blood and dirt from her face with her shawl. The farmer looked round, shook his fist at him, and followed her into the house. Jabez collected the dogs and drove them back, and Peter's friend returned to lean over the gate. Peter waited till the door had closed upon Mr. and Mrs. Grimethorpe. Then he pulled out his handkerchief and, in the half-darkness, signaled cautiously to the man, who slipped through the gate and came slowly down to him. "'Thanks very much,' said Whimsy, putting money in his hand. "'I'm afraid I've done unintentional mischief.' The man looked at the money and at him. "'Tezd master's way with them as cooms to look at missus,' he said. "'Thas best keep away, if so be that wouldn't have her blood on the head.' "'See here,' said Peter. "'Did you by any chance meet a young man with a motorcycle wandering round here last Wednesday or thereabouts?' "'Nay, Wednesday. "'Twould be day to Mester went to Stapley, I reckon, after machines. "'Nay, I see out. "'All right. "'If you find anybody who did, let me know.' Here's my name, and I'm staying at Riddlesdale Lodge. Good night. Many thanks. The man took the card from him and slouched back without a word of farewell. Lord Peter walked slowly, his coat collar turned up and his hat pulled over his eyes. The cinematographic episode had troubled his logical faculty. With an effort, he sorted out his ideas and arranged them in some kind of order. First item, said he, Mr. Grimethorpe, a gentleman who will stick at nothing, hefty, unamiable, inhospitable, dominant characteristic, jealousy of his very astonishing wife. "'Was at Stapley last Wednesday and Thursday buying machinery. "'Helpful gentleman at the gate corroborates this, by the way, "'so that at this stage of the proceedings one may allow it as a sound alibi. "'Did not, therefore, see our mysterious friend with the sidecar if he was there, "'but is disposed to think he was there.' and has very little doubt about what he came for, which raises an interest in point. Why the sidecar? Awkward thing to tour about with. Very good. But if our friend came after Mrs. G, he obviously didn't take her. Good again. Second item. Mrs. Grimethorpe. Very singular item. By Jove! He paused meditatively to reconstruct a thrilling moment. Let us admit at once that if number ten came for the purpose suspected, he had every excuse for it. Well, Mrs. G goes in terror of her husband, who thinks nothing of knocking her down on suspicion. I wish to God, but... I'd only have made things worse. Only thing you can do for the wife of a brute like that is to keep away from her. Hope there won't be murder done. One's enough at a time. Where was I? Yes, well, Mrs. Grimethorpe knows something, and she knows somebody. She took me for somebody who had every reason for not coming to Grider's Hole. Where was she, I wonder, while I was talking to Grimethorpe? She wasn't in the room. Perhaps the child warned her. No, that won't wash. I told the child who I was. 
Aha, wait a minute, do I see a light? She looked out of the window and saw a bloke in an aged Burberry. Number ten is a bloke in an aged Burberry. Now let's suppose for a moment she takes me for number ten. What does she do? She sensibly keeps out of the way. Can't think why I'm such a fool as to turn up. Then, when Grimethorpe runs out shouting for the kennel man, she nips down with her life in her hands to warn her, her, shall we say boldly, her lover, to get away. She finds it isn't her lover, but only a gaping ass of, I fear, a very coming on disposition new compromise in position she tells the ass to save himself and herself by clearing out ass clears not too gracefully the next installment of this enthralling drama will be shown in this theatre when i'd jolly well like to know he trapped on for some time all the same he retorted upon himself all this throws no light on what number ten was doing at riddlesdale lodge at the end of his walk he had reached no conclusion whatever happens he said to himself and if it can be done without danger to her life i must see mrs grimthorpe again end of chapter four Chapter 5 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Rue Saint Honore and the Rue de la Paix. I think it was the cat. H.M.S. Pinafore. Mr. Parker sat disconsolate in a small apartment in the Rue Saint Honore. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. Paris was full of a subdued but cheerful autumn sunlight, but the room faced north and was depressing, with its plain dark furniture and its deserted air. It was a man's room, well appointed after the manner of a discreet club, a room that kept its dead owner's counsel imperturbably. Two large saddle-bag chairs in crimson leather stood by the cold hearth. On the mantelpiece was a bronze clock, flanked by two polished German shells, a stone tobacco jar, and an oriental brass bowl containing a long cold pipe. There were several excellent engravings in narrow pearwood frames, and the portrait in oils, of a rather florid lady of the period of Charles the Second. The window curtains were crimson, and the floor covered with a solid turkey carpet. Opposite the fireplace stood a tall mahogany bookcase with glass doors, containing a number of English and French classics, a large collection of books on history and international politics, various French novels, a number of works on military and sporting subjects, and a famous French edition of the Decameron, with the additional plates. Under the window stood a large bureau. Parker shook his head, took out a sheet of paper, and began to write a report. He had breakfasted on coffee and rolls at seven. He had made an exhaustive search of the flat, he had interviewed the concierge, the manager of the Crédit Lyonnais, and the prefect of police for the quartier, and the result was very poor indeed. Information obtained from Captain Cathcart's papers. Before the war, Dennis Cathcart had undoubtedly been a rich man. He had considerable investments in Russia and Germany, and a large share in a prosperous vineyard in Champagne. After coming into his property at the age of twenty-one, 
he had concluded his three years' residence at Cambridge, and had then travelled a good deal, visiting persons of importance in various countries, and, apparently, studying with a view to a diplomatic career. During the period from 1913 to 1918, the story told by the books became intensely interesting, baffling, and depressing. At the outbreak of war, he had taken a commission in the 15th Blankshires. With the help of the checkbook, Parker reconstructed the whole economic life of a young British officer. Clothes, horses, equipment, traveling, wine and dinners when on leave, bridge debts, rent of the flat in the Rue Saint-Honoré, club subscriptions, and what not. This outlay was strictly moderate and proportioned to his income. Receipted bills, neatly docketed, occupied one drawer of the bureau, and a careful comparison of these with the check-book and the returned checks revealed no discrepancy. But beyond these, there appeared to have been another heavy drain upon Cathcart's resources. Beginning in 1913, certain large checks, payable to self, appeared regularly at every quarter, and sometimes at shorter intervals. As to the destination of these sums, the Bureau preserved the closest discretion. There were no receipts, no memoranda of their expenditure. The great crash, which in 1914 shook the credits of the world, was mirrored in the little passbook. The credits from Russian and German sources stopped dead. Those from the French shares slumped to a quarter of the original amount, as the tide of war washed over the vineyards and carried the workers away. For the first year or so, there were substantial dividends from capital invested in French rente. Then came an ominous entry of 20,000 francs on the credit side of the account, and six months after, another of 30,000 francs. After that, the landslide followed fast. Parker could picture those curt notes from the front, directing the sale of government securities as the savings of the past six years whirled away in the maelstrom of rising prices and collapsing currencies. The dividends grew less and less and ceased. Then, more ominous still, came a series of debits representing the charges on renewal of promissory notes. About 1918, the situation had become acute, and several entries showed a desperate attempt to put matters straight by gambling in foreign exchanges. There were purchases through the bank of German marks, Russian rubles, and Romanian lei. Mr. Parker sighed sympathetically when he saw this, thinking of the twelve pounds worth of these delusive specimens of the engraver's art laid up in his own desk at home. He knew them to be waste paper, yet his tidy mind could not bear the thought of destroying them. Evidently Cathcart had found marks and rubles very broken reeds. It was about this time that Cathcart's passbook began to reveal the paying in of various sums of cash, some large, some small, at irregular dates, and with no particular consistency. In December 1919, there had been one of these amounting to as much as 35,000 francs. Parker at first supposed that these sums might represent dividends from some separate securities, which Cathcart was handling for himself, without passing them through the bank. He made a careful search of the room in the hope of finding either the bonds themselves, or at least some memorandum concerning them, but the search was in vain, and he was forced to conclude 
either that Cathcart had deposited them in some secret place, or that the credits in question represented some different source of income. Cathcart had apparently contrived to be demobilized almost at once, owing no doubt to his previous frequentation of distinguished governmental personages, and to have taken a prolonged holiday upon the Riviera. Subsequently, a visit to London coincided with the acquisition of seven hundred pounds, which, converted into francs at the then rate of exchange, made a very respectable item in the account. From that time on, the outgoings and receipts presented a similar aspect and were more or less evenly balanced, the checks to self becoming rather larger and more frequent as time went on. While during 1921 the income from the vineyard began to show signs of recovery. Mr. Parker noted down all this information in detail, and, leaning back in his chair, looked round the flat. He felt, not for the first time, distaste for his profession, which cut him off from the great masculine community whose members take each other for granted and respect privacy. He relighted his pipe, which had gone out, and proceeded with his report. Information obtained from M. Turgeot, the manager of the Crédit Lyonnais, confirmed the evidence of the passbook in every particular. M. Cathcart had recently made all his payments in notes, usually in notes of small denominations. Once or twice he had had an overdraft never very large, and always made up within a few months. He had, of course, suffered a diminution of income, like everybody else, but the account had never given the bank any uneasiness. At the moment it was some 14,000 francs on the right side. Monsieur Cathcart was always very agreeable, but not communicative. Très correct. Information obtained from the concierge. One did not see much of Monsieur Cathcart, but he was très gentil. He never failed to say bonjour, bourgeois, when he came in or out. He received visitors, sometimes, gentlemen in evening dress. One made card parties. Monsieur Bourgeois had never directed any ladies to his rooms, except once, last February, when he had given a lunch party to some ladies, très comme il faut, who brought with them his fiancée, une jolie blonde. Monsieur Cathcart used the flat as a pied-à-terre, and often he would shut it up and go away for several weeks or months. He was a jeune homme très rangé. He had never kept a valet. Madame Leblanc, the cousin of one's late wife, kept his appartement clean. Madame Leblanc was very respectable, but certainly monsieur might have Madame Leblanc's address. Information obtained from Madame Leblanc. Monsieur Cathcart was a charming young man, and very pleasant to work for, very generous, and took a great interest in the family. Madame Leblanc was desolated to hear that he was dead, and on the eve of his marriage to the daughter of the English milady. Madame Leblanc had seen Mademoiselle last year when she visited Monsieur Cathcart in Paris. She considered the young lady very fortunate. Very few young men were as serious as Monsieur Cathcart, especially when they were so good-looking. Madame Leblanc had had experience of young men, and she could relate many histories, if she were disposed, but none of Monsieur Cathcart. He would not always be using his rooms. He had the habit of letting her know when he would be at home, and she then went round to put the flat in order. 
he kept his things very tidy. He was not like English gentlemen in that respect. Madame Leblanc had known many of them who kept their affairs sans dessus dessous. Monsieur Cathcart was always very well dressed. He was particular about his bath. He was like a woman for his toilet, the poor gentleman, and so he was dead, le pauvre garçon. Really, it had taken Madame Leblanc's appetite. Information obtained from Monsieur the Prefect of Police. Absolutely nothing. Monsieur Cathcart had never caught the eye of the police in any way. With regard to the sums of money mentioned by Monsieur Parker, if Monsieur would give him the numbers of some of the notes, efforts would be made to trace them. Where had the money gone? Parker could think only of two destinations, an irregular establishment or a blackmailer. Certainly a handsome man like Cathcart might very well have a woman or two in his life, even without the knowledge of the concierge. Certainly a man who habitually cheated at cards, if he did cheat at cards, might very well have got himself into the power of somebody who knew too much. It was noteworthy that his mysterious receipts in cash began just as his economies were exhausted. It seemed likely that they represented irregular gains from gambling, in the casinos, on the exchange, or, if Denver's story had any truth in it, from crooked play. On the whole, Parker rather inclined to the blackmailing theory. It fitted in with the rest of the business, as he and Lord Peter had reconstructed it at Riddlesdale. Two or three things, however, still puzzled Parker. Why should the blackmailer have been trailing about the Yorkshire moors with a cycle and sidecar? Whose was the green-eyed cat? It was a valuable trinket. Had Cathcart offered it as part of his payment? That seemed somehow foolish. One could only suppose that the blackmailer had tossed it away with contempt. The cat was in Parker's possession, and it occurred to him that it might be worth while to get a jeweler to estimate its value. But the sidecar was a difficulty, the cat was a difficulty, and, more than all, Lady Mary was a difficulty. Why had Lady Mary lied at the inquest? For that she had lied, Parker had no manner of doubt. He disbelieved the whole story of the second shot which had awakened her. What had brought her to the conservatory door at three o'clock in the morning? Whose was the suitcase, if it was a suitcase, that had lain concealed among the cactus plants? Why this prolonged nervous breakdown with no particular symptoms, which prevented Lady Mary from giving evidence before the magistrate or answering her brother's inquiries? Could Lady Mary have been present at the interview in the shrubbery? If so, surely Whimsy and he would have found her footprints. Was she in league with the blackmailer? That was an unpleasant thought. Was she endeavouring to help her fiancé? She had an allowance of her own, a generous one, as Parker knew from the Duchess. Could she have tried to assist Cathcart with money? But in that case, why not tell all she knew? The worst about Cathcart, always supposing that card-sharping were the worst, was now matter of public knowledge, and the man himself was dead. If she knew the truth, why did she not come forward and save her brother? And at this point he was visited by a thought even more unpleasant. If, after all, it had not been Denver, whom Mrs. Marchbanks had heard in the library, but somebody else, someone who had likewise an appointment with the blackmailer, 
some one who was on his side as against Cathcart, who knew that there might be danger in the interview. Had he himself paid proper attention to the grass lawn between the house and the thicket? Might Thursday morning perhaps have revealed here and there a trodden blade that rain and sap had since restored to uprightness? Had Peter and he found all the footsteps in the wood? Had some more trusted hand fired that shot at close quarters? Once again, whose was the green-eyed cat? Surmises and surmises, each uglier than the last, thronged into Parker's mind. He took up a photograph of Cathcart, with which Whimsy had supplied him, and looked at it long and curiously. It was a dark, handsome face. The hair was black, with a slight wave, the nose large and well-shaped, the big dark eyes at once pleasing and arrogant. The mouth was good, though a little thick, with a hint of sensuality in its close curves. The chin showed a cleft. Frankly, Parker confessed to himself, it did not attract him. He would have been inclined to dismiss the man as a Byronic blighter, but experience told him that this kind of face might be powerful with a woman, either for love or hatred. Coincidences usually have the air of being practical jokes on the part of Providence. Mr. Parker was shortly to be favoured, if the term is a suitable one, with a special display of this Olympian humour. As a rule, that kind of thing did not happen to him. It was more in Whimsy's line. Parker had made his way from modest beginnings to a respectable appointment in the C.I.D., rather by a combination of hard work, shrewdness, and caution, than by spectacular displays of happy guesswork or any knack for taking fortune's tide at the flood. This time, however, he was given a leading from above, and it was only part of the nature of things and men that he should have felt distinctly ungrateful for it. He finished his report, replaced everything tidily in the desk, and went round to the police station to arrange with the prefect about the keys after the fixing of the seals. It was still early in the evening, and not too cold. He determined, therefore, to banish gloomy thoughts by a café cognac in the Boule Miche, followed by a stroll through the Paris of the shops. Being of a kindly domestic nature, indeed, he turned over in his mind the idea of buying something Parisian for his elder sister, who was unmarried and lived a rather depressing life in Barrow in Furness. Parker knew that she would take pathetic delight in some filmy scrap of lace underwear which no one but herself would ever see. Mr. Parker was not the kind of man to be deterred by the difficulty of buying ladies' underwear in a foreign language. He was not very imaginative. He remembered that a learned judge had one day asked in court what a camisole was, and recollected that there had seemed to be nothing particularly embarrassing about the garment when explained. He determined that he would find a really Parisian shop and ask for a camisole. That would give him a start, and then Mademoiselle would show him other things without being asked further. Accordingly, towards six o'clock, he was strolling along the Rue de la Paix with a little carton under his arm. He had spent rather more money than he intended, but he had acquired knowledge. He knew for certain what a camisole was, and he had grasped for the first time in his life that crepe de chine had no recognizable relation to crepe, and was astonishingly expensive for its bulk. The young lady had been charmingly sympathetic, 
and, without actually insinuating anything, had contrived to make her customer feel just a little bit of a dog. He felt that his French accent was improving. The street was crowded with people, slowly sauntering past the brilliant shop windows. Mr. Parker stopped and gazed nonchalantly over a gorgeous display of jewellery, as though hesitating between a pearl necklace, valued at eighty thousand francs, and a pendant of diamonds and aquamarines set in platinum. And there, balefully winking at him from under a label inscribed Bonne Fortune, hung a green-eyed cat. The cat stared at Mr. Parker, and Mr. Parker stared at the cat. It was no ordinary cat. It was a cat with a personality. Its tiny arched body sparkled with diamonds, and its platinum paws, set close together, and its erect and glittering tail, were instinct in every line with the sensuous delight of friction against some beloved object. Its head, cocked slightly to one side, seemed to demand a titillating finger under the jaw. It was a minute work of art, by no journeyman hand. Mr. Parker fished in his pocketbook. He looked from the cat in his hand to the cat in the window. They were alike. They were astonishingly alike. They were identical. Mr. Parker marched into the shop. I have here, said Mr. Parker to the young man at the counter, a diamond cat which greatly resembles one which I perceive in your window. Could you have the obligingness to inform me what would be the value of such a cat? The young man replied instantly, But certainly, monsieur, the price of the cat is five thousand francs. It is, as you perceive, made of the finest materials. Moreover, it is the work of an artist. It is worth more than the market value of the stones. It is, I suppose, a mascot? Yes, monsieur. It brings great luck, especially at cards. Many ladies buy these little objects. We have here other mascots, but all of this special design are of similar quality and price. Monsieur may rest assured that his cat is a cat of pedigree. I suppose that such cats are everywhere obtainable in Paris, said Mr. Parker nonchalantly. But no, monsieur, if you desire to match your cat, I recommend you to do it quickly. Monsieur Briquet had only a score of these cats to begin with, and there are now only three left, including the one in the window. I believe that he will not make any more, to repeat a thing often is to vulgarize it. There will, of course, be other cats. I don't want another cat, said Mr. Parker, suddenly interested. Do I understand you to say that cats such as this are only sold by Monsieur Briquet, that my cat originally came from this shop? Undoubtedly, monsieur, it is one of our cats. These little animals are made by a workman of ours, a genius, who is responsible for many of our finest articles. It would, I imagine, be impossible to find out to whom this cat was originally sold. If it was sold over the counter for cash, it would be difficult but if it was entered in our books, it might not be impossible to discover, if monsieur desired it. I do desire it very much, said Parker, producing his card. I am an agent of the British police, and it is of the greatest importance that I should know to whom this cat originally belonged. In that case, said the young man, I shall do better to inform monsieur the proprietor. 
He carried away the card into the back premises, and presently emerged with a stout gentleman, whom he introduced as Monsieur Briquet. In Monsieur Briquet's private office, the books of the establishment were brought out and laid on the desk. "'You will understand, monsieur,' said Monsieur Briquet, "'that I can only inform you of the names and addresses of such purchasers of these cats as have had an account sent them. It is, however, unlikely that an object of such value was paid for in cash. Still, with rich Anglo-Saxons, such an incident may occur.' We need not go back further than the beginning of the year when these cats were made. He ran a podgy finger down the pages of the ledger. The first purchase was on January 19th. Mr. Parker noted various names and addresses, and at the end of half an hour, Monsieur Briquet said in a final manner, That is all, monsieur. How many names have you there? Thirteen, said Parker. "'And there are still three cats in stock. "'The original number was twenty, "'so that four must have been sold for cash. "'If monsieur wishes to verify the matter, "'we can consult the day-book.' "'The search in the day-book was longer and more tiresome, "'but eventually four cats were duly found to have been sold, "'one on January 31st, another on February 6th, the third on may seventeenth and the last on august ninth mr parker had risen and embarked upon a long string of compliments and thanks when a sudden association of ideas and dates prompted him to hand cathcart's photograph to m briquet and ask whether he recognized it m briquet shook his head i am sure he is not one of our regular customers he said and I have a very good memory for faces. I make a point of knowing anyone who has any considerable account with me, and this gentleman has not everybody's face. But we will ask my assistance. The majority of the staff failed to recognize the photograph, and Parker was on the point of putting it back in his pocket book when a young lady, who had just finished selling an engagement ring, to an obese and elderly jew arrived and said without any hesitation mais oui je l'ai vu ce monsieur là it is the englishman who bought a diamond cat for the jolly blonde mademoiselle said parker eagerly i beseech you to do me the favour to remember all about it parfaitement said she it is not the face one would forget especially when one is a woman. The gentleman bought a diamond cat and paid for it. No, I am wrong. It was the lady who bought it, and I remember now to have been surprised that she should pay like that at once in money, because ladies do not usually carry such large sums. The gentleman bought two. He bought a diamond and tortoise-shell comb for the lady to wear, and then she said she must give him something pour porter bonheur, and asked me for a mascot that was good for cards. I showed her some jewels more suitable for a gentleman, but she saw these cats and fell in love with them, and said he should have a cat and nothing else. She was sure it would bring him good hands. She asked me if it was not so, and I said undoubtedly, and monsieur must be sure never to play without it and he laughed very much and promised always to have it upon him when he was playing and how was she this lady blonde monsieur and very pretty rather tall and svelte and very well dressed a big hat and dark blue costume quoi encore voyons yes she was a foreigner english i do not know she spoke french very very well almost like a french person but she had just the little suspicion of accent 
"'What language did she speak with the gentleman? "'French, monsieur. "'You see, we were speaking together, "'and they both appealed to me continually, "'and so all the talk was in French. "'The gentleman spoke French à merveille. "'It was only by his clothes and a je ne sais quoi in his appearance "'that I guessed he was English.' The lady spoke equally fluently, but one remarked just the accent from time to time. Of course, I went away from them once or twice to get goods from the window, and they talked then, I do not know in what language. Now, mademoiselle, can you tell me how long ago this was? Ah, mon Dieu, ça c'est plus difficile. Monsieur sait que les jours se suivent et se ressemblent. Voyons. We can see by the day-book, put in Monsieur Briquet, on what occasion a diamond comb was sold with a diamond cat. Of course, said Parker hastily, let us go back. They went back and turned to the January volume, where they found no help. But on February 6th they read, Pen en les cahiers diamants, sept mille cinq cents francs. Chat en diamant, dessin, c cinq, cinq mille francs. That settles it, said Parker gloomily. Monsieur does not appear content, suggested the jeweler. Monsieur, said Parker, I am more grateful than I can say for your very great kindness. But I will frankly confess that of all the twelve months in the year, I had rather it had been any other. Parker found this whole episode so annoying to his feelings that he bought two comic papers, and, carrying them away to Boudet's at the corner of the Rue Auguste Leopold, read them solemnly through over his dinner by way of settling his mind. Then, returning to his modest hotel, he ordered a drink and sat down to compose a letter to Lord Peter. It was a slow job, and he did not appear to relish it very much. His concluding paragraph was as follows. I have put down all these things for you without any comment. You will be able to draw your own inferences as well as I can. Better, I hope, for my own are perplexing and worrying me no end. They may be all rubbish. I hope they are. I dare say something will turn up at your end to put quite a different interpretation upon the facts. But I do feel that they must be cleared up. I would offer to hand over the job, but another man might jump at conclusions even faster than I do and make a mess of it. But, of course, if you say so, I will be taken suddenly ill at any moment. Let me know. If you think I'd better go on grubbing about over here, can you get hold of a photograph of Lady Mary Whimsey, and find out, if possible, about the diamond comb and the green-eyed cat? Also, at exactly what date Lady Mary was in Paris in February. Does she speak French as well as you do? Let me know how you are getting on. Yours ever, Charles Parker. He re-read the letter and report carefully, and sealed them up. Then he wrote to his sister, did up his parcel neatly, and rang for the valet de chambre. I want this letter sent off at once, registered, he said, and the parcel is to go to-morrow as a colis postal. After which he went to bed, and read himself to sleep, with a commentary on the epistle to the Hebrews. Lord Peter's reply arrived by return. Dear Charles, don't worry. I don't like the look of things myself, frightfully, but I'd rather you tackled the business than anyone else. As you say, the ordinary police bloke doesn't mind whom he arrests, provided he arrests someone and is altogether a most damnable fellow to have poking about in one's affairs. I'm putting my mind to getting my brother cleared, 
that is the first consideration after all and really anything else would be better than having jerry hanged for a crime he didn't commit whoever did it it's better the right person should suffer than the wrong so go ahead i enclose two photographs all i can lay hands on for the moment the one in nursing kit is rather rotten and the others all smothered up in a big hat i had a damn queer little adventure here on wednesday which i'll tell you about when we meet i've found a woman who obviously knows more than she ought and a most promising ruffian only i'm afraid he's got an alibi also i've got a faint suggestion of a clue about number ten nothing much happened at north allerton except that jerry was of course committed for trial my mother is here thank god and i'm hoping she'll get some sense out of mary but she's been worse these last two days mary i mean not my mother beastly sick and all that sort of thing dr thingamummy who is an ass can't make it out mother says it's as clear as noonday and she'll stop it if i have patience a day or two i made her ask about the comb and the cat m denies the cat altogether but admits to a diamond comb bought in paris says she bought it herself it's in town i'll get it and send it on she says she can't remember where she bought it has lost the bill but it didn't cost anything like seven thousand five hundred francs she was in paris from february second to february twentieth my chief business now is to see lubbock and clear up a little matter concerning silver sand the assizes will be the first week in november in fact the end of next week this rushes things a bit but it doesn't matter because they can't try him there nothing will matter but the grand jury who are bound to find a true bill on the face of it after that we can hang matters up as long as we like it's going to be a deuce of a business parliament sitting and all that old biggs is fearfully perturbed under that marble outside of his i hadn't really grasped what a fuss it was to try peers it's only happened about once in every sixty years and the procedure's about as old as queen elizabeth they have to appoint a lord high steward for the occasion and god knows what they have to make it frightfully clear in the commission that it is only for the occasion because somewhere about richard the third's time the l h s was such a terrifically big pot that he got to ruling the roost so when henry the fourth came to the throne and the office came into the hands of the crown he jolly well kept it there and now they only appoint a man pro tem for the coronation and shows like jerry's the king always pretends not to know there isn't a l h s till the time comes and is no end surprised at having to think of somebody to take on the job did you know all this i didn't i got it out of biggie cheer up and pretend you don't know that any of these people are relations of mine my mother sends you her kindest regards and what not and hopes she'll see you again soon bunter sends something correct and respectful i forget what yours in the brotherhood of detection p w it may as well be said at once that the evidence from the photographs was wholly inconclusive end of chapter five chapter six of clouds of witness by dorothy sayers this librivox recording is in the public domain mary quite contrary i am striving to take into public life what any man gets from his mother lady astor 
on the opening day of the york assizes the grand jury brought in a true bill against gerald duke of denver for murder gerald duke of denver being accordingly produced in the court the judge affected to discover what indeed every newspaper in the country had been announcing to the world for the last fortnight that he being but a common or garden judge with a plebeian jury was incompetent to try a peer of the realm he added however that he would make it his business to inform the lord chancellor who also for the last fortnight had been secretly calculating the accommodation in the royal gallery and choosing lords to form the select committee order being taken accordingly the noble prisoner was led away a day or two later in the gloom of a london afternoon mr charles parker rang the bell of a second-floor flat at number one ten a piccadilly the door was opened by bunter who informed him with a gracious smile that lord peter had stepped out for a few minutes but was expecting him and would he kindly come in and wait we only came up this morning added the valet and are not quite straight yet sir if you will excuse us would you feel inclined for a cup of tea parker accepted the offer and sank luxuriously into a corner of the chesterfield after the extraordinary discomfort of french furniture there was solace in the enervating springiness beneath him the cushions behind his head and whimsy's excellent cigarettes what bunter had meant by saying that things were not quite straight yet he could not divine a leaping wood fire was merrily reflected in the spotless surface of the black baby grand the mellow calf bindings of lord peter's rare editions glowed softly against the black and primrose walls the vases were filled with tawny chrysanthemums the latest editions of all the papers were on the table as though the owner had never been absent over his tea mr parker drew out the photographs of lady mary and dennis cathcart from his breast pocket he stood them up against the teapot and stared at them looking from one to the other as if trying to force a meaning from their faintly smirking self-conscious gaze he referred again to his paris notes ticking off various points with a pencil. "'Damn!' said Mr. Parker, gazing at Lady Mary. "'Damn, damn, damn!' The train of thought he was pursuing was an extraordinarily interesting one. Image after image, each rich in suggestion, crowded into his mind. Of course one couldn't think properly in Paris— it was so uncomfortable and the houses were central heated here where so many problems had been unravelled there was a good fire cathcart had been sitting before the fire of course he wanted to think out a problem when cats sat staring into the fire they were thinking out problems it was odd he should not have thought of that before when the green-eyed cat sat before the fire one sank right down into a sort of rich black velvety suggestiveness which was most important it was luxurious to be able to think so lucidly as this because otherwise it would be a pity to exceed the speed limit and the black moors were reeling by so fast but now he had really got the formula he wouldn't forget it again the connection was just there close thick 
richly coherent. The glass blower's cat is bumpstable, said Mr. Parker aloud and distinctly. I'm charmed to hear it, replied Lord Peter with a friendly grin. Had a good nap, old man? I, what, said Mr. Parker. Hello, what you mean, nap? I had got hold of the most important train of thought, and you've put it out of my head. What was it? Cat, 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 he groped wildly. You said the glass blower's cat is bumpstable retorted lord peter it's a perfectly rippin word but i don't know what you mean by it bumpstable said mr parker blushing slightly bump oh well perhaps you're right i may have dozed off but you know i thought i'd just got the clue to the whole thing i attached the greatest importance to that phrase even now no now i come to think of it my train of thought doesn't seem quite to hold together what a pity i thought it was so lucid never mind said lord peter just back crossed last night any news lots good no parker's eyes wandered to the photographs i don't believe it he said obstinately i'm damned if i'm going to believe a word of it a word of what of whatever it is you'll have to believe it charles as far as it goes said his friend softly filling his pipe with decided little digs of the fingers i don't say dig that mary dig shot cathcart dig dig but she has lied dig again and again dig dig she knows who did it dig she was prepared for it dig she's malingering and lying to keep the fellow shielded dig and we shall have to make her speak here he struck a match and lit the pipe in a series of angry little puffs. "'If you can think,' said Mr. Parker, with some heat, "'that that woman,' he indicated the photographs, "'had any hand in murdering Cathcart, "'I don't care what your evidence is. "'You hang it all, Whimsy, she's your own sister.' "'Gerald is my brother,' said Whimsy quietly. "'You don't suppose I'm exactly enjoying this business, do you? "'But I think we shall get along very much better "'if we try to keep our tempers.' "'I'm awfully sorry,' said Parker. "'Can't think why I said that. "'Rotten bad form. "'Beg pardon, old man.' "'The best thing we can do,' said Whimsy, is to look the evidence in the face, however ugly, and I don't mind admitting that some of it's a positive gargoyle. My mother turned up at Riddlesdale on Friday. She marched upstairs at once and took possession of Mary, while I drooped about in the hall and teased the cat, generally made a nuisance of myself, you know, Presently, old Dr. Thorpe called. I went and sat on the chest on the landing. Presently, the bell rings and Ellen comes upstairs. Mother and Thorpe popped out and caught her just outside Mary's room. And they jibber-jabbered a lot. And presently, Mother came barging down the passage to the bathroom with her heels tapping and her earrings simply dancing with irritation. I sneaked after em to the bathroom, but I couldn't see anything, because they were blocking the doorway, but I heard Mother say, There now, what did I tell you? And Ellen said, Locks, your grace, who'd have thought it? And my mother said, All I can say is, if I had to depend on you people to save me from being murdered with arsenic, or that other stuff with the name like anemones, 
you know what I mean, that that very attractive-looking man with the preposterous beard used to make away with his wife and mother-in-law, who was vastly the more attractive of the two, poor things. I might be being cut up and analyzed by Dr. Spilsbury now. Such a horrid, distasteful job he must have of it, poor man, and the poor little rabbits, too. Whimsy paused for breath, and Parker laughed, in spite of his anxiety. "'I won't vouch for the exact words,' said Whimsy, "'but it was to that effect. You know my mother's style. Old Thorpe tried to look dignified, but mother ruffled up like a little hen, and said, looking beadily at him, "'In my day we called that kind of thing hysterics and naughtiness. We didn't let little girls pull the wool over our eyes like that. I suppose you call it neurosis, or a suppressed desire, or a reflex, and coddle it. You might have let that silly child make herself really ill. You are all perfectly ridiculous, and no more fit to take care of yourselves than a lot of babies. Not but what there are plenty of poor little things in the slums that look after whole families and show more sense than the lot of you put together. I am very angry with Mary, advertising herself in this way, and she's not to be pitied. You know, said Whimsy, I think there's often a great deal in what one's mother says. I believe you, said Parker. Well, I got hold of mother afterwards and asked her what it was all about. She said Mary wouldn't tell her anything about herself or her illness, just asked to be let alone. Then Thorpe came along and talked about nervous shock, said he couldn't understand these fits of sickness, or the way Mary's temperature hopped about. Mother listened and told him to go and see what the temperature was now, which he did, and in the middle Mother called him away to the dressing-table. But being a wily old bird, you see, she kept her eyes on the looking-glass and nipped round just in time to catch Mary, stimulating the thermometer to terrific leaps on the hot water-bottle. "'Well, I'm damned,' said Parker. "'So was Thorpe. All Mother said was that if he wasn't too old a bird yet to be taken in by that hoary trick, he'd no business to be getting himself up as a grey-haired family practitioner.' So then she asked the girl about the sick fits, when they happened, and how often, and was it after meals or before, and so on, and at last she got out of them that it generally happened a bit after breakfast, and occasionally at other times. Mother said she couldn't make it out at first, because she'd hunted all over the room for bottles and things, till at last she asked who made the bed, thinking, you see, Mary might have hidden something under the mattress. So Ellen said she usually made it while Mary had her bath. When's that? says Mother. Just before her breakfast, bleats the girl. God forgive you all for a set of nincompoops, says my mother. Why didn't you say so before? So away they all trailed to the bathroom, and there, sitting up quietly on the bathroom shelf among the bath salts, and the elements embrocation and the crucian feelings and toothbrushes and things, was the family bottle of Ipecacuana. Three quarters empty. Mother said, well, I told you what she said. By the way, how do you spell Ipecacuana? Mr. Parker spelt it. "'Damn you,' said Lord Peter. "'I did think I'd stumped you that time. "'I believe you went and looked it up beforehand. "'No decent-minded person would know "'how to spell Ipecacuana out of his head. "'Anyway, as you were saying, "'it's easy to see which side of the family "'has the detective instinct. "'I didn't say so. "'I know. Why didn't you?' I think my mother's talents deserve a little acknowledgment. 
I said so to her, as a matter of fact, and she replied in these memorable words. "'My dear child, you can give it a long name if you like, but I'm an old-fashioned woman, and I call it mother-wit, and it's so rare for a man to have it, that if he does, you write a book about him and call him Sherlock Holmes. However, apart from all that, I said to mother, in private, of course, it's all very well but i can't believe that mary has been going to all this trouble to make herself horribly sick and frighten us all just to show off surely she isn't that sort mother looked at me steady as an owl and quoted a whole lot of examples of hysteria ending up with the servant girl who threw paraffin about all over somebody's house to make them think it was haunted, and finished up that if all these new-fangled doctors went out of their way to invent subconsciousness and kleptomania and complexes and other fancy descriptions to explain away when people had done naughty things, she thought one might just as well take advantage of the fact. "'Whimsy,' said Parker, much excited. "'Did she mean she suspected something?' "'My dear old chap,' replied Lord Peter, "'whatever can be known about Mary by putting two and two together, my mother knows.' I told her all we knew up to that point, and she took it all in, in her funny way, you know, never answering anything directly, and then she put her head on one side and said, if Mary had listened to me, and done something useful, instead of that V.A.D. work, which never came to much, if you ask me, not that I have anything against V.A.D.s in a general way, but that silly woman Mary worked under was the most terrible snob on God's earth, and there were very much more sensible things which Mary might really have done well, only that she was so crazy to get to London— I shall always say it was the fault of that ridiculous club. What could you expect of a place where you ate such horrid food, all packed into an underground cellar painted pink, and talking away at the tops of their voices, and never any evening dress, only Soviet jumpers and side-whiskers? Anyhow, I've told that silly old man what to say about it, and they'll never be able to think of a better explanation for themselves.' "'Indeed, you know,' said Peter, "'I think if any of them start getting inquisitive, "'they'll have Mother down on them like a ton of bricks.' "'What do you really think yourself?' asked Barker. "'I haven't come to the unpleasantest bit of the lot,' said Peter. "'I've only just heard it, and it did give me a nasty jar, I'll admit. "'Yesterday I got a letter from Lubbock.' saying he would like to see me, so I trotted up here and dropped in on him this morning. You remember I sent him a stain off one of Mary's skirts, which Bunter had cut out for me. I had taken a squint at it myself, and didn't like the look of it, so I sent it up to Lubbock, ex abundantia cautile, and I'm sorry to say he confirms me. It's human blood, Charles, and I'm afraid it's Cathcart's. But I've lost the thread of this a bit. Well, the skirt must have got stained the day Cathcart died, as that was the last day on which the party was out on the moors. And if it had been there earlier, Ellen would have cleaned it off. Afterwards, Mary strenuously resisted Ellen's efforts to take the skirt away, and made an amateurish effort to tidy it up herself with soap. So I think we may conclude that Mary knew the stains were there, and wanted to avoid discovery. She told Ellen that the blood was from a grouse, which must have been a deliberate untruth. Perhaps, said Parker, struggling against hope to make out a case for Lady Mary. She only said, Oh, one of the birds must have bled, or something like that. I don't believe, said Peter, 
that one could get a great patch of human blood on one's clothes like that and not know what it was she must have knelt right in it it was three or four inches across parker shook his head dismally and consoled himself by making a note well now went on peter on wednesday night everybody comes in and dines and goes to bed except cathcart who rushes out and stays out at eleven fifty the gamekeeper hardra hears a shot which may very well have been fired in the clearing where the well let's say the accident took place the time also agrees with the medical evidence about cathcart having already been dead three or four hours when he was examined at four thirty very well at three a m jerry comes home from somewhere or other and finds the body as he is bending over it mary arrives in the most apropos manner from the house in her coat and cap and walking shoes now what is her story she says that at three o'clock she was awakened by a shot now nobody else heard that shot and we have the evidence of Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson, who slept in the next room to Mary, with her window open, according to her immemorial custom, that she lay broad awake from 2 a.m. till a little after 3 a.m., when the alarm was given, and heard no shot. According to Mary, the shot was loud enough to waken her on the other side of the building, it's odd isn't it that the person already awake should swear so positively that she heard nothing of a noise loud enough to waken a healthy young sleeper next door and in any case if that was the shot that killed cathcart he can barely have been dead when my brother found him and again in that case how was there time for him to be carried up from the shrubbery to the conservatory we've been all over this ground said parker with an expression of distaste we agreed that we couldn't attach any importance to the story of the shot i'm afraid we've got to attach a great deal of importance to it said lord peter gravely now what does mary do either she thought the shot there was no shot i know that but i'm examining the discrepancies of her story she said she did not give alarm because she thought it was probably only poachers but if it was poachers it would be absurd to go down and investigate so she explains that she thought it might be burglars now how does she dress to go and look for burglars what would you or i have done i think we would have taken a dressing-gown a stealthy kind of pair of slippers and perhaps a poker or a stout stick not a pair of walking shoes a coat and a cap of all things it was a wet night mumbled parker my dear chap if it's burglars you're looking for you don't expect to go and hunt them round the garden your first thought is that they're getting into the house and your idea is to slip down quietly and survey them from the staircase or behind the dining-room door anyhow fancy a present-day girl who rushes about bareheaded in all weathers stopping to embellish herself in a cap for a burglar hunt damn it all charles it won't wash you know and she walks straight off to the conservatory comes upon the corpse exactly as if she knew where to look for it beforehand parker shook his head again well now she sees gerald stooping over cathcart's body what does she say does she ask what's the matter does she ask who is it she exclaims oh god gerald you've killed him and then she says as if on second thought 
oh it's dennis what has happened has there been an accident now does that strike you as natural no but it rather suggests to me that it wasn't cathcart she expected to see there but somebody else does it it rather sounds to me as if she was pretending not to know who it was first she says you've killed him and then recollecting that she isn't supposed to know who he is she says why it's dennis in any case then if her first exclamation was genuine she didn't expect to find the man dead no no we must remember that the death was a surprise very well then gerald sends mary up for help and here's where a little bit of evidence comes in that you picked up and sent along do you remember what mrs pettigrew robinson said to you in the train about the door slamming on the landing do you mean yes now i'll tell you something that happened to me the other morning i was burstin out of the bathroom in my usual breezy way when i caught myself a hell of a whack on that old chest on the landing and the lid lifted up and shut down plonk that gave me an idea and i thought i'd have a squint inside i'd got the lid up and was looking at some sheets and stuff that were folded up at the bottom when i heard a sort of gasp and there was mary staring at me as white as a ghost she gave me a turn by jove but nothing like the turn i'd given her well she wouldn't say anything to me and got hysterical and i hauled her back to her room but i'd seen something on those sheets what silver sand silver do you remember those cacti in the greenhouse and the place where somebody'd put a suitcase or something down yes well there was a lot of silver sand scattered about the sort people stick round some kinds of bulbs and things and that was inside the chest too yes wait a moment after the noise mrs pettigrew robinson heard mary woke up freddy and then the pettigrew robinsons and then what she locked herself into her room yes and shortly afterwards she came down and joined the others in the conservatory and it was at this point everybody remembered noticing that she was wearing a cap and coat and walking shoes over pajamas and bare feet you are suggesting said parker that lady mary was already awake and dressed at three o'clock that she went out by the conservatory door with her suitcase expecting to meet the the murderer of her damn it whimsy we needn't go so far as that said peter we decided that she didn't expect to find cathcart dead no well she went presumably to meet somebody shall we say pro tem she went to meet number ten suggested whimsy softly i suppose we may as well say so when she turned on the torch and saw the duke stooping over cathcart she thought by jove whimsy i was right after all when she said you've killed him she meant number ten she thought it was number ten's body of course cried whimsy i'm a fool yes then she said it's dennis what has happened that's quite clear and meanwhile what did she do with the suitcase i see it all now cried parker when she saw that the body wasn't the body of number ten she realized that number ten must be the murderer so her game was to prevent anybody knowing that number ten had been there so she shoved the suitcase behind the cacti then when she went upstairs 
She pulled it out again and hid it in the oak chest on the landing. She couldn't take it into her room, of course, because if anybody'd heard her come upstairs, it would seem odd that she should run to her room before calling the others. Then she knocked up Arbuthnot and the Pettigrew Robinsons. She'd be in the dark, and they'd be flustered and wouldn't see exactly what she had on. Then she escaped from Mrs. P., ran into her room, took off the skirt, in which she had knelt by Cathcart's side, and the rest of her clothes, and put on her pyjamas and the cap, which someone might have noticed, and the coat, which they must have noticed, and the shoes, which had probably left footmarks already. Then she could go down and show herself. Meantime, she'd concocted the burglar story for the coroner's benefit. That's about it, said Peter. I suppose she was so desperately anxious to throw us off the scent of number ten that it never occurred to her that her story was going to help implicate her brother. She realized it at the inquest, said Parker eagerly. Don't you remember how hastily she grasped at the suicide theory? And when she found that she was simply saving her, well, number ten, in order to hang her brother, she lost her head, took to her bed, and refused to give any evidence at all. Seems to me there's an extra allowance of fools in my family, said Peter gloomily. Well, what could she have done, poor girl? asked Parker. He had been growing almost cheerful again. Anyway, she's cleared. After a fashion, said Peter, but we are not out of the wood yet by a long way. Why is she hand in glove with number ten, who is at least a blackmailer, if not a murderer? How did Gerald's revolver come on the scene, and the green-eyed cat? How much did Mary know of that meeting between number ten and Dennis Cathcart? And if she was seeing and meeting the man, she might have put the revolver into his hands any time. No, no, said Parker. Whimsy, don't think such ugly things as that. Hell, cried Peter, exploding. I'll have the truth of this beastly business if we all go to the gallows together. At this moment, Bunter entered with a telegram addressed to Whimsy. Lord Peter read as follows. Party traced London. Scene Marleybone, Friday. Further information from Scotland Yard. Police Superintendent Gosling, Ripley. "'Good egg!' cried Whimsy. "'Now we're getting down to it. "'Stay here, there's a good man, in case anything turns up. "'I'll run round to the yard now. "'They'll send you up dinner and tell Bunter to give you a bottle of the Chateau Yquem. "'It's rather decent. So long.' "'He leapt out of the flat, and a moment later his taxi buzzed away up Piccadilly.' End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Club and the Bullet He is dead, and by my hand it were better that I were dead myself, for the guilty wretch I am. Adventures of Sexton Blake Hour after hour, Mr. Parker sat, waiting for his friend's return. Again and again he went over the Riddlesdale case, checking his notes here, amplifying them there, involving his tired brain in speculations of the most fantastic kind. He wandered about the room, taking down here and there a book from the shelves, strumming a few unskillful bars upon the piano, glancing through the weeklies, fidgeting restlessly. At length, 
he selected a volume from the criminological section of the bookshelves and forced himself to read with attention that most fascinating and dramatic of poison trials the sedan case gradually the mystery gripped him as it invariably did and it was with a start of astonishment that he looked up at a long and vigorous whirring of the doorbell to find that it was already long past midnight his first thought was that whimsy must have left his latch-key behind and he was preparing a facetious greeting when the door opened exactly as in the beginning of a sherlock holmes story to admit a tall and beautiful young woman in an extreme state of nervous agitation with halo of golden hair violet blue eyes and disordered apparel all complete for as she threw back her heavy travelling coat he observed that she wore evening dress with light green silk stockings and heavy brogue shoes thickly covered with mud his lordship has not yet returned my lady said mr bunter but mr parker is here waiting for him and we are expecting him at any minute now will your ladyship take anything no no said the vision hastily nothing thanks i'll wait good evening mr parker where's peter he has been called out lady mary said parker i can't think why he isn't back yet do sit down where did he go to scotland yard but that was about six o'clock i can't imagine lady mary made a gesture of despair i knew it oh mr parker what am i to do mr parker was speechless i must see peter cried lady mary it's a matter of life and death can't you send for him but i don't know where he is said parker please lady mary he's doing something dreadful he's all wrong cried the young woman wringing her hands with desperate vehemence i must see him tell him oh did anybody ever get into such dreadful trouble i oh here the lady laughed loudly and burst into tears lady mary i beg you please don't cried mr parker anxiously with a strong feeling that he was being incompetent and rather ridiculous please sit down drink a glass of wine you'll be ill if you cry like that if it is crying he added dubiously to himself it sounds like hiccups bunter mr bunter was not far off in fact he was just outside the door with a small tray with a respectful allow me sir he stepped forward to the writhing lady mary and presented a small phial to her nose the effect was startling the patient gave two or three fearful whoops and sat up erect and furious how dare you bunter said lady mary go away at once your ladyship had better take a drop of brandy said mr bunter replacing the stopper in the smelling bottle but not before mr parker had caught the pungent reek of ammonia this is the eighteen hundred napoleon brandy my lady please don't snort so if i may make the suggestion his lordship would be greatly distressed to think that any of it should be wasted did your ladyship dine on the way up no most unwise my lady to undertake a long journey on a vacant interior i will take the liberty of sending in an omelette for your ladyship perhaps you would like a little snack of something yourself sir as it is getting late anything you like 
said Mr. Parker, waving him off hurriedly. Now, Lady Mary, you're feeling better, aren't you? Let me help you off with your coat. No more of an exciting nature was said until the omelette was disposed of and Lady Mary comfortably settled on the Chesterfield. She had by now recovered her poise. Looking at her, Parker noticed how her recent illness, however produced, had left its mark upon her. Her complexion had nothing of the brilliance which he remembered. She looked strained and white, with purple hollows under her eyes. "'I am sorry I was so foolish just now, Mr. Parker,' she said, looking into his eyes with a charming frankness and confidence. "'But I was dreadfully distressed, and I came up from Riddlesdale so hurriedly.' "'Not at all,' said Parker, meaninglessly. "'Is there anything I can do in your brother's absence?' "'I suppose you and Peter do everything together?' "'I think I may say that neither of us knows anything about this investigation, "'which he has not communicated to the other. "'If I tell you it's the same thing?' "'Exactly the same thing, if you can bring yourself to honour me with your confidence. "'Wait a minute, Mr. Parker. I'm in a difficult position. "'I don't quite know what I ought. "'Can you tell me just how far you've got, what you have discovered?' "'Mr. Parker was a little taken aback. Although the face of Lady Mary had been haunting his imagination ever since the inquest, and although the agitation of his feelings had risen to boiling point during this romantic interview, the official instinct of caution had not wholly deserted him. Holding, as he did, proof of Lady Mary's complicity in the crime, whatever it was, he was not so far gone as to fling all his cards on the table. "'I'm afraid,' he said, "'that I can't quite tell you that. You see, so much of what we've got is only suspicion as yet. I might accidentally do great mischief to an innocent person.' "'Ah, you definitely suspect somebody, then?' Indefinitely would be a better word for it, said Mr. Parker, with a smile. But if you have anything to tell us which may throw light on the matter, I beg you to speak. We may be suspecting a totally wrong person. I shouldn't be surprised, said Mary, with a sharp, nervous little laugh. Her hand strayed to the table and began pleating the orange envelope into folds. "'What do you want to know?' she asked suddenly, with a change of tone. Parker was conscious of a new hardness in her manner, uh, something braced and rigid. He opened his notebook, and as he began his questioning, his nervousness left him. The official reasserted himself. "'You were in Paris last February?' Lady Mary assented. "'Do you recollect going with Captain Cathcart? "'Oh, by the way, you speak French, I presume?' "'Yes, very fluently. "'As well as your brother, practically without accent?' "'Quite as well. "'We always had French governesses as children, "'and Mother was very particular about it. "'I see. "'Well, now, do you remember going?' with Captain Cathcart on February 6th to a jeweler's in the Rue de la Paix and buying, or his buying for you, a tortoiseshell comb set with diamonds and a diamond and platinum cat with emerald eyes? He saw a lurking awareness come into the girl's eyes. "'Is that the cat you have been making inquiries about in Riddlesdale?' she demanded. 
it being never worth while to deny the obvious parker replied yes it was found in the shrubbery wasn't it had you lost it or was it cathcart's if i said it was his i should be ready to believe you was it his no a long breath it was mine when did you lose it that night where i suppose in the shrubbery wherever you found it i didn't miss it till later is it the one you bought in paris yes why did you say before that it was not yours i was afraid and now i'm going to speak the truth parker looked at her again she met his eye frankly but there was a tenseness in her manner which showed that it had cost her something to make up her mind very well said parker we shall all be glad of that for i think there were one or two points at the inquest on which you didn't tell the truth weren't there yes do believe said parker that i am sorry to have to ask these questions the terrible position in which your brother is placed in which i helped to place him i don't say that i do i helped to put him in jail don't say i didn't because i did well said parker don't worry there's plenty of time to put it all right again shall i go on yes well now lady mary it wasn't true about hearing that shot at three o'clock was it no did you hear the shot at all yes when at eleven fifty what was it then lady mary you hid behind the plants in the conservatory i hid nothing there and in the oak chest on the landing my skirt you went out why to meet cathcart yes who was the other man what other man the other man who was in the shrubbery a tall fair man dressed in a burberry there was no other man oh pardon me lady mary we saw his footmarks all the way up from the shrubbery to the conservatory it must have been some tramp i know nothing about him but we have proof that he was there of what he did and how he escaped for heaven's sake and your brother's sake lady mary tell us the truth for that man in the burberry was the man who shot cathcart no said the girl with a white face that is impossible why impossible i shot dennis cathcart myself so that's how the matter stands you see lord peter said the chief of scotland yard rising from his desk with a friendly gesture of dismissal the man was undoubtedly seen at marleybone on the friday morning and though we have unfortunately lost him again for the moment i have no doubt whatever that we shall lay hands on him before long the delay has been due to the unfortunate illness of the porter morrison whose evidence has been so material but we are wasting no time now i'm sure i may leave it to you with every confidence sir andrew replied whimsy cordially shaking hands i'm digging away too between us we ought to get something you in your small corner and i in mine as the hymn says or is it a hymn i remember reading it in a book about missionaries when i was small did you want to be a missionary in your youth i did i think most kids do some time or another which is odd seeing how unsatisfactory most of us turn out 
Meanwhile, said Sir Andrew Mackenzie, if you run across the man yourself, let us know. I would never deny your extraordinary good fortune, or it may be good judgment, in running across the criminals we may be wanting. If I catch the bloke, said Lord Peter, I'll come and shriek under your windows till you let me in, if it's the middle of the night and you in your little nightshirt. And talking of nightshirts reminds me that we hope to see you down at Denver one of these days. As soon as this business is over, Mother sends kind regards, of course. Thanks very much, replied Sir Andrew. I hope you feel that all is going well. I had Parker in here this morning to report, and he seemed a little dissatisfied. He's been doing a lot of ungrateful routine work, said Whimsy, and being altogether the fine, sound man he always is. He's been a damn good friend to me, Sir Andrew, and it's a real privilege to be allowed to work with him. Well, so long, Chief. He found that his interview with Sir Andrew Mackenzie had taken up a couple of hours, and that it was nearly eight o'clock. He was just trying to make up his mind where to dine, when he was accosted by a cheerful young woman with bobbed red hair, dressed in a short checked shirt, brilliant jumper, corduroy jacket, and a rakish green velvet tam shanter Surely, said the young woman, extending a shapely, ungloved hand, it's Lord Peter Wimsey. How are you, and how's Mary? But Jove, said Wimsey gallantly, it's Miss Tarrant. How perfectly rippin' to see you again. Absolutely delightful. Thanks. Mary ain't as fit as she might be, wherein about this murder business, you know. You've heard that we're what the poor so kindly and tactfully call in trouble, I expect, what? Yes, of course, replied Miss Tarrant eagerly. And, of course, as a good socialist, I can't help rejoicing, rather, when a peer gets taken up, because it does make him look so silly, you know, and the House of Lords is silly, isn't it? But, really, I'd rather it was anybody else's brother. Mary and I were such great friends, you know, and, of course, you do investigate things, don't you? Not just live on your own estates in the country and shoot birds— so I suppose that makes a difference. That's very kind of you, said Peter, if you can prevail upon yourself to overlook the misfortune of my birth and my other deficiencies. Perhaps you would honour me by coming along and having a bit of dinner somewhere, what? Oh, I'd have loved to, cried Miss Tarrant with enormous energy, but I've promised to be at the club to-night. There's a meeting at nine. Mr. Coke, the labor leader, you know, is going to make a speech about converting the army and navy to communism. We expect to be raided, and there's going to be a grand hunt for spies before we begin. But look here, do come along and dine with me there, and if you like, I'll try to smuggle you into the meeting, and you'll be seized and turned out. I suppose I oughtn't to have told you anything about it, because you ought to be a deadly enemy, but I really can't believe you're dangerous. I'm just an ordinary capitalist, I expect, said Lord Peter, highly obnoxious. Well, come to dinner anyhow. I do so want to hear all the news. Peter reflected that the dinner at the Soviet club would be worse than execrable, and was just preparing an excuse when it occurred to him that Miss Tarrant might be able to tell him a good many of the things that he didn't know, and really ought to know, about his own sister. Accordingly, he altered his polite refusal into a polite acceptance, and, plunging after Miss Tarrant, was led at a reckless pace and by a series of grimy shortcuts into Gerard Street, 
where an orange door flanked by windows with magenta curtains sufficiently indicated the soviet club the soviet club being founded to accommodate free thinking rather than high living had that curious amateur air which pervades all worldly institutions planned by unworldly people exactly why it made lord peter instantly think of mission teas he could not say unless it was that all the members looked as though they cherished a purpose in life and that the staff seemed rather sketchily trained and strongly in evidence whimsy reminded himself that in so democratic an institution one could hardly expect the assistants to assume that air of superiority which marks the servants in a west end club for one thing they would not be such capitalists in the dining-room below the resemblance to a mission tea was increased by the exceedingly heated atmosphere the babble of conversation and the curious inequalities of the cutlery miss termant secured seats at a rather crumby table near the serving-hatch and peter wedged himself in with some difficulty next to a very large curly-haired man in a velvet coat who was earnestly conversing with a thin eager young woman in a russian blouse venetian beads a hungarian shawl and a spanish comb looking like a personification of the united front of the internationale lord peter endeavoured to please his hostess by a question about the great mr cope but was checked by an agitated hush please don't shout about it said miss Tarrant, leaning across till her auburn mop positively tickled his eyebrows it's so secret i'm awfully sorry said whimsy apologetically i say do you know you're dipping those jolly little beads of yours in the soup oh am i cried miss Tarrant, withdrawing hastily oh thank you so much especially as the colour runs i hope it isn't arsenic or anything then leaning forward again she whispered hoarsely the girl next to me is erica heath warburton the writer you know whimsy looked with a new respect at the lady in the russian blouse few books were capable of calling up a blush to his cheek but he remembered that one of miss heath warburton's had done it the authoress was just saying impressively to her companion ever know a sincere emotion to express itself in a subordinate clause joyce has freed us from the superstition of syntax agreed the curly man scenes which make emotional history said miss heath warburton should ideally be expressed in a series of animal squeals the d h lawrence formula said the other or even dada said the authoress we need a new notation said the curly-haired man putting both elbows on the table and knocking whimsy's bread on the floor have you heard robert snotes recite his own verse do the tom-tom and the penny whistle lord peter with difficulty detached his attention from this fascinating discussion to find that miss tarrant was saying something about mary one misses your sister very much she said her wonderful enthusiasm she spoke so well at meetings she had such a real sympathy with the worker it seems astonishing to me said whimsy seeing mary's never had to do a stroke of work in her life oh cried miss Tarrant, but she did work she worked for us wonderfully she was secretary to our propaganda society for nearly six months 
and then she worked so hard for Mr. Goyles, to say nothing of her nursing in the war. Of course, I don't approve of England's attitude in the war, but nobody would say the work wasn't hard. Who is Mr. Goyles? Oh, one of our leading speakers, quite young, but the government are really afraid of him. I expect he'll be here tonight. He has been lecturing in the north, but I believe he's back now. I say, do look out, said Peter. Your beads are in your plate again. Are they? Well, perhaps they'll flavor the mutton. I'm afraid the cooking isn't very good here, but the subscription's so small, you see. I wonder Mary never told you about Mr. Goyle's. They were so very friendly, you know, some time ago. Everybody thought she was going to marry him, but it seemed to fall through. And then your sister left town. Do you know about it? That was the fellow, was it? Yes, well, my people didn't altogether see it, you know. Thought Mr. Goyles wasn't quite the son-in-law they'd take to. Family row and so on wasn't there myself. Besides, Mary'd never listen to me. Still, that's what I gathered. Another instance of the absurd old-fashioned tyranny of parents, said Miss Tarrant warmly. You would think it could still be possible in post-war times. I don't know, said Whimsy, that you could exactly call it that. Not parents, exactly. My mother's a remarkable woman. I don't think she interfered. In fact, I fancy she wanted to ask Mr. Goyles to Denver. But my brother put his foot down. Oh, well, what can you expect? said Miss Tarrant scornfully. But I don't see what business it was of his. Oh, none, agreed Whimsy. Only, owing to my late father's circumscribed ideas of what was owing to women, my brother has the handling of Mary's money till she marries with his consent. I don't say it's a good plan. I think it's a rotten plan. But there it is. Monstrous, said Miss Tarrant, shaking her head so angrily that she looked like shock-headed Peter. Barbarous! simply feudal, you know. But, after all, what's money? Nothing, of course, said Peter. But if you've been brought up to having it, it's a bit awkward to drop it suddenly, like baths, you know. I can't understand how it could have made any difference to Mary, persisted Miss Tarrant mournfully. She liked being a worker, we once tried living in a workman's cottage for eight weeks, five of us, on eighteen shillings a week. It was a marvellous experience, on the very edge of the new forest. In the winter? Well, no, we thought we'd better not begin with winter. But we had nine wet days, and the kitchen chimney smoked all the time. You see, the wood came out of the forest, so it was all damp. I see. It must have been uncommonly interesting. It was an experience I shall never forget, said Miss Durant. One felt so close to the earth and the primitive things. If only we could abolish industrialism. I'm afraid, though, we shall never get it put right without a bloody revolution, you know. It's very terrible, of course, but salutary and inevitable. Shall we have coffee? We shall have to carry it upstairs ourselves, if you don't mind. The maids don't bring it up after dinner. Miss Tarrant settled her bill and returned, thrusting a cup of coffee into his hand. It had already overflowed into the saucer, and, as he groped his way round a screen and up a steep and twisted staircase, it overflowed quite an amount more. Emerging from the basement, 
they almost ran into a young man with fair hair who was hunting for letters in a dark little row of pigeonholes finding nothing he retreated into the lounge miss tarrant uttered an exclamation of pleasure why there is mr goyle's she cried whimsy glanced across and at the sight of the tall slightly stooping figure with the untidy fair hair and the gloved right hand he gave an irrepressible little gasp won't you introduce me he said i'll fetch him said miss tarrant she made off across the lounge and addressed the young agitator who started looked across at whimsy shook his head appeared to apologize gave a hurried glance at his watch and darted out by the entrance whimsy sprang forward in pursuit extraordinary cried miss tarrant with a blank face he says he has an appointment but he can't surely be missing the excuse me said peter he dashed out in time to perceive a dark figure retreating across the street he gave chase the man took to his heels and seemed to plunge into the dark little alley which leads into the charing cross road hurrying in pursuit whimsy was almost blinded by a sudden flash and smoke nearly in his face a crashing blow on the left shoulder and a deafening report whirled his surroundings away he staggered violently and collapsed onto a second-hand brass bedstead End of chapter 7「Eight of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers. Mr. Parker takes notes. A man was taken to the zoo and shown the giraffe. After gazing at it a little in silence, I don't believe it, he said. Parker's first impulse was to doubt his own sanity his next to doubt Lady Mary's. Then, as the clouds rolled away from his brain, he decided that she was merely not speaking the truth. "'Come, Lady Mary,' he said encouragingly, but with an accent of reprimand as to an over-imaginative child. "'You can't expect us to believe that, you know.' "'But you must,' said the girl gravely. "'It's a fact. I shot him. I did, really. I didn't exactly mean to do it. It was a, well, a sort of accident.' Mr. Parker got up and paced about the room. "'You have put me in a terrible position, Lady Mary,' he said. "'You see, I'm a police officer. I never really imagined. It doesn't matter.' said Lady Mary. Of course you'll have to arrest me, or detain me, or whatever you call it. That's what I came for. I'm quite ready to go quietly. That's the right expression, isn't it? I'd like to explain about it, though, first. Of course I ought to have done it long ago, but I'm afraid I lost my head. I didn't realize that Gerald would get blamed." I hoped they'd bring it in suicide. Do I make a statement to you now, or do I do it at the police station? Parker groaned. They won't, they won't punish me so badly if it was an accident, will they? There was a quiver in the voice. No, of course not, of course not. But if only you had spoken earlier— no said parker stopping suddenly short in his distracted pacing and sitting down beside her it's impossible absurd 
He caught the girl's hand, suddenly, in his own. "'Nothing will convince me,' he said. "'It's absurd. It's not like you.' "'But an accident?' "'I don't mean that. You know I don't mean that. But that you should keep silence. I was afraid. I'm telling you now.' "'No, no, no,' cried the detective. "'You're lying to me. Nobly, I know, but it's not worth it. No man could be worth it. Let him go, I implore you. Tell the truth. Don't shield this man. If he murdered Dennis Cathcart, no!' The girl sprang to her feet, wrenching her hand away. There was no other man. How dare you say it, or think it? I killed Dennis Cathcart, I tell you, and you shall believe it. I swear to you that there was no other man. Parker pulled himself together. Sit down, please. Lady Mary, you are determined to make this statement? Yes, "'knowing that I have no choice but to act upon it. "'If you will not hear it, I shall go straight to the police.' "'Parker pulled out his notebook. "'Go on,' he said. "'With no other sign of emotion than a nervous fidgeting with her gloves, "'Lady Mary began her confession in a clear, hard voice, "'as though she were reciting it by heart.' On the evening of Wednesday, October 13th, I went upstairs at half-past nine. I sat up writing a letter. At a quarter past ten I heard my brother and Dennis quarrelling in the passage. I heard my brother call Dennis a cheat, and tell him that he was never to speak to me again. I heard Dennis run out. I listened for some time, but did not hear him return. At half-past eleven I became alarmed. I changed my dress, and went out to try and find Dennis and bring him in. I feared he might do something desperate. After some time I found him in the shrubbery. I begged him to come in. He refused, and he told me about my brother's accusation and the quarrel. I was very much horrified, of course. He said, where was the good of denying anything, as Gerald was determined to ruin him, and asked me to go away and marry him and live abroad. I said I was surprised that he should suggest such a thing in the circumstances. We both became very angry. I said, come in now, tomorrow you can leave by the first train. He seemed almost crazy. He pulled out a pistol, and said that he'd come to the end of things, that his life was ruined, that we were a lot of hypocrites, and that I had never cared for him, or I shouldn't have minded what he'd done. Anyway, he said, if I wouldn't come with him it was all over, and he might as well be hanged for a sheep as a lamb. He'd shoot me and himself. I think he was quite out of his mind. He pulled out a revolver. I caught his hand. We struggled. I got the muzzle right up against his chest, and either I pulled the trigger or it went off of itself. I'm not clear which. It was all in such a whirl. She paused. Parker's pen took down the words, and his face showed growing concern. Lady Mary went on. He wasn't quite dead. I helped him up. We struggled back nearly to the house. He fell once. Why, asked Parker, did you not leave him and run into the house to fetch help? Lady Mary hesitated. It didn't occur to me. It was a nightmare. I could only think of getting him along. I think, I think I wanted him to die. There was a dreadful pause. He did die. He died at the door. 
I went into the conservatory and sat down. I sat for hours and tried to think. I hated him for being a cheat and a scoundrel. I'd been taken in, you see, made a fool of by a common sharper. I was glad he was dead. I must have sat there for hours without a coherent thought. It wasn't till my brother came along that I realized what I'd done, and that I might be suspected of murdering him. I was simply terrified. I made up my mind all in a moment that I'd pretend I knew nothing, that I'd heard a shot and come down. You know what I did. Why, Lady Mary, said Parker in a perfectly toneless voice, why did you say to your brother, Good God, Gerald, you've killed him? Another hesitant pause. I never said that. I said, Good God, Gerald, he's killed then. I never meant to suggest anything but suicide. You admitted to those words at the inquest? Yes, her hands knotted the gloves into all manner of shapes. By that time I had decided on a burglar story, you see. The telephone bell rang and Parker went to the instrument. A voice came thinly over the wire. "'Is that one ten a Piccadilly? This is Charing Cross Hospital. A man was brought in to-night who says he is Lord Peter Wimsey. He was shot in the shoulder and struck his head in falling. He has only just recovered consciousness. He was brought in at nine-fifteen. "'No, he will probably do very well now. "'Yes, come round, by all means.' "'Peter has been shot,' said Parker. "'Will you come round with me to Charing Cross Hospital? "'They say he is in no danger, still.' "'Oh, quick!' cried Lady Mary. "'Gathering up Mr. Bunter as they hurried through the hall, "'detective and self-accused,' rushed hurriedly out into Piccadilly, and, picking up a belated taxi at Hyde Park Corner, drove madly away through the deserted streets. End of Chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Goyles "'And the moral of that is,' said the Duchess, "'Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. "'A party of four were assembled next morning "'at a very late breakfast or very early lunch "'in Lord Peter's flat. "'Its most cheerful member, "'despite a throbbing shoulder and a splitting headache, "'was undoubtedly Lord Peter himself.' who lay upon the Chesterfield, surrounded with cushions, and carousing upon tea and toast. Having been brought home in an ambulance, he had instantly fallen into a healing sleep, and had woken at nine o'clock, aggressively clear and active in mind. In consequence, Mr. Parker had been dispatched in a hurry, half-fed, and burdened with the secret memory of last night's disclosures, to Scotland Yard. Here he had set in motion the proper machinery for catching Lord Peter's assassin. "'Only don't you say anything about the attack on me,' said his lordship. "'Tell him he's to be detained in connection with the Riddlesdale case. That's good enough for them.' It was now eleven and Mr. Parker had returned, gloomy and hungry, and was consuming a belated omelette and a glass of claret. Lady Mary Wimsey was hunched up in the window-seat. Her bobbed golden hair made a little blur of light about her in the pale autumn sunshine. She had made an attempt to breakfast early, and now sat gazing out into Piccadilly. 
Her first appearance that morning had been made in Lord Peter's dressing-gown, but she now wore a serge skirt and jade-green jumper, which had been brought to town for her by the fourth member of the party, now composedly eating a mixed grill and sharing the decanter with Parker. This was a rather short, rather plump, very brisk elderly lady with bright black eyes like a bird's, and very handsome white hair, exquisitely dressed. Far from looking as though she had just taken a long night journey, she was easily the most composed and trim of the four. She was, however, annoyed, and said so, at considerable length. This was the Dowager Duchess of Denver. "'It is not so much, Mary, that you went off so abruptly last night, just before dinner, too, inconveniencing and alarming us very much. Indeed, poor Helen was totally unable to eat her dinner, which was extremely distressing to her feelings, because you know she always makes such a point of never being upset about anything. I really don't know why, for some of the greatest men have not minded showing their feelings.' I don't mean Southerners necessarily, but, as Mr. Chesterton very rightly points out, Nelson, too, who was certainly English, if he wasn't Irish or Scotch, I forget, but United Kingdom, anyway, if that means anything nowadays with a free state, such a ridiculous title, especially as it always makes one think of the orange free state, and I'm sure they wouldn't care to be mixed up with that, being so very green themselves and going off without even proper clothes, and taking the car, so that I had to wait till the one fifteen from North Allerton, a ridiculous time to start, and such a bad train, too, not getting up till ten-thirty. Besides, if you must run off to town, why do it in that unfinished manner? If you had only looked up the trains before starting, you would have seen you would have half an hour's wait at North Allerton, and you could quite easily have packed a bag. It's so much better to do things neatly and thoroughly, even stupid things. And it was very stupid of you indeed to dash off like that, to embarrass and bore poor Mr. Parker with a lot of twaddle, though I suppose it was Peter you meant to see. You know, Peter, if you will haunt low places full of Russians and sucking socialists taking themselves seriously— you ought to know better than to encourage them by running after them, however futile, and given to drinking coffee and writing poems with no shape to them, and generally ruining their nerves. And in any case it makes not the slightest difference. I could have told Peter all about it myself, if he doesn't know already, as he probably does. Lady Mary turned very white at this, and glanced at Parker, who replied rather to her than to the dowager. No, Lord Peter and I haven't had time to discuss anything yet. Lest it should ruin my shattered nerves and bring a fever to my aching brow, added that gentleman amiably, you're a kind, thoughtful soul, Charles, and I don't know what I should do without you. I wish that rotten old second-hand dealer had been a bit brisker about taking his stock in trade for the night. Perfectly extraordinary number of knobs there are on a brass bedstead. So I'd come and, you know, couldn't stop myself. However, what's a mere brass bedstead? The great detective, though at first stunned and dizzy from his brutal treatment by the fifteen veiled assassins, all armed with meat-choppers, soon regained his senses, thanks to his sound constitution and healthy manner of life. Despite the severe gassing he had endured in the underground room, eh? A telegram? Oh, thanks, Bunter. Lord Peter appeared to read the message with great inward satisfaction, for his long lips twitched at the corners and he tucked the slip of paper away in his pocket-book with a little sigh of satisfaction. 
he called to Bunter to take away the breakfast tray and to renew the cooling bandage about his brow. This done, Lord Peter leaned back among his cushions and, with an air of malicious enjoyment, launched at Mr. Parker the inquiry, "'Well, now, how did you and Mary get on last night? Polly, did you tell him you'd done the murder?' few things are more irritating than to discover after you have been at great pains to spare a person some painful intelligence that he has known it all along and is not nearly so much affected by it as he properly should be mr parker quite simply and suddenly lost his temper he bounded to his feet and exclaimed without the least reason Oh, it's perfectly hopeless trying to do anything. Lady Mary sprang from the window seat. Yes, I did, she said. It's quite true. Your precious case is finished, Peter. The dowager said, without the least discomposure, You must allow your brother to be the best judge of his own affairs, my dear. As a matter of fact, replied his lordship, i rather fancy polly's right hope so i'm sure anyway we've got the fellow so now we shall know lady mary gave a sort of gasp and stepped forward with her chin up and her hands tightly clenched it caught at parker's heart to see overwhelming catastrophe so bravely faced the official side of him was thoroughly bewildered but the human part ranged itself instantly in support of that gallant defiance whom have they got he demanded in a voice quite unlike his own the goyles person said lord peter carelessly uncommon quick work what but since he'd no more original idea than to take the boat train to folkestone they didn't have much difficulty it isn't true said lady mary she stamped it's a lie he wasn't there he's innocent i killed dennis fine thought parker fine damn goyles anyway and what's he done to deserve it lord peter said mary don't be an ass yes said the dowager placidly i was going to suggest to you peter that this mr goyles such a terrible name mary dear i can't say i ever cared for it even if there had been nothing else against him especially as he would sign himself g e o goyles g e o you know mr parker for george and i never could help reading it as gar goyles i very nearly wrote to you my dear mentioning mr goyles and asking if you could see him in town because there was something when i came to think about it about that ipecacuana business that made me feel he might have something to do with it yes said peter with a grin you always did find him a bit sickening didn't you how can you whimsy growled parker reproachfully with his eyes on mary's face never mind him said the girl if you can't be a gentleman peter damn it all cried the invalid explosively here's a fellow who without the slightest provocation plugs a bullet into my shoulder breaks my collar-bone brings me up head foremost on a knobbly second-hand brass bedstead and vamooses and when in what seems to me jolly mild parliamentary language i call him a sickening feller my own sister says i'm no gentleman look at me in my own house forced to sit here with a perfectly beastly headache and lap up toast and tea while you people distend and bloat yourselves on mixed grills and omelettes and a damn good vintage claret silly boy said the duchess don't get so excited and it's time for your medicine mr parker kindly touch the bell mr parker obeyed in silence 
Lady Mary came slowly across and stood looking at her brother. Peter, she said, what makes you say that he did it? Did what? Shot you. The words were only a whisper. The entrance of Mr. Bunter at this moment, with a cooling draught, dissipated the tense atmosphere. Lord Peter quaffed his potion, had his pillows rearranged, submitted to having his temperature taken and his pulse counted, asked if he might have an egg for his lunch, and lit a cigarette. Mr. Bunter retired, people distributed themselves into more comfortable chairs, and felt happier. "'Now, Polly, old girl,' said Peter, "'cut out the sob stuff. "'I accidentally ran into this Goyle's chap last night at your Soviet club. "'I asked that Miss Tarrant to introduce me, "'but the minute Goyle's heard my name, he made tracks. "'I rushed out after him, only meaning to have a word with him. "'When the idiot stopped at the corner of Newport Court, "'potted me and bunked. Silly ass thing to do. I knew who he was. He couldn't help getting caught. Peter, said Mary, in a ghastly voice. Look here, Polly, said Whimsy. I did think of you. Honest Injun, I did. I haven't had the man arrested. I've made no charge at all, have I, Parker? "'What did you tell him to do when you were down at the yard this morning?' "'To detain Goyles, pending inquiries, because he was wanted as a witness in the Riddlesdale case,' said Parker, slowly. "'He knows nothing about it,' said Mary, doggedly now. "'He wasn't anywhere near. He is innocent of that.' "'Do you think so?' said Lord Peter gravely. If you know he is innocent, why tell all those lies to screen him? It won't do, Mary. You know he was there, and you think he's guilty. No! Yes, said Whimsy, grasping her with his sound hand as she shrank away. Mary, have you thought what you are doing? You are perjuring yourself and putting Gerald in peril of his life, in order to shield from justice a man whom you suspect of murdering your lover, and who has most certainly tried to murder me. Oh, cried Parker in agony, all this interrogation is horribly irregular. Never mind him, said Peter. "'Do you really think you're doing the right thing, Mary?' The girl looked helplessly at her brother for a minute or two. Peter cocked up a whimsical, appealing eye from under his bandages. The defiance melted out of her face. "'I'll tell the truth,' said Lady Mary. "'Good egg,' said Peter, extending a hand. "'I'm sorry.' I know you like the fellow, and we appreciate your decision enormously. Truly we do. Now, sail ahead, old thing, and you take it down, Parker. Well, it really all started years ago with George. You were at the front then, Peter, but I suppose they told you about it and put everything in the worst possible light. I wouldn't say that, dear put in the Duchess. I think I told Peter that your brother and I were not altogether pleased with what we had seen of the young man, which was not very much, if you remember. He invited himself down one weekend when the house was very full, and he seemed to make a point of consulting nobody's convenience but his own. And you know, dear, you even said yourself you thought he was unnecessarily rude to poor old Lord Mount Weasel. He said what he thought, said Mary. Of course, Lord Mount Weasel, poor dear, doesn't understand that the present generation is accustomed to discuss things with its elders, not just kowtow to them. When George gave his opinion, he thought he was just contradicting. 
"'To be sure,' said the dowager. "'When you flatly deny everything a person says, "'it does sound like contradiction to the uninitiated. "'But all I remember saying to Peter was that Mr. Goyles's manners "'seemed to me to lack polish, "'and that he showed a lack of independence in his opinions.' "'A lack of independence?' said Mary, wide-eyed. "'Well, dear, I thought so. "'What oft was thought, and frequently much better expressed, as Pope says, or was it somebody else? "'But the worse you express yourself these days, the more profound people think you, "'though that's nothing new, like Browning and those quaint metaphysical people, "'when you never know whether they really mean their mistress or the established church.' so bridegroomy and biblical to say nothing of dear st augustine the hippo man i mean not the one who missionized over here though i dare say he was delightful too and in those days i suppose they didn't have annual sales of work and tea in the parish room so it doesn't seem quite like what we mean nowadays by missionaries he knew all about it you remember about that mandrake or is that the thing you had to get a big black dog for Manichi, that's the word. What was his name? Was it Faustus? Or am I mixing him up with the old man in the opera? Well, anyway, said Mary, without stopping to disentangle the Duchess's sequence of ideas, George was the only person I really cared about. He still is. Only it did seem so hopeless. Perhaps you didn't say much about him, mother, but Gerald said lots dreadful things yes said the duchess he said what he thought the present generation does you know to the uninitiated i admit dear it does sound a little rude peter grinned but mary went on unheeding george had simply no money he'd really given everything he had to the labor party one way and another and he'd lost his job in the ministry of information they found out that he had too much sympathy with the socialists abroad. It was awfully unfair. Anyhow, one couldn't be a burden on him. And Gerald was a beast, and said he'd absolutely stop my allowance if I didn't send George away. So I did, but of course it didn't make a bit of difference to the way we both felt. I will say for Mother she was a bit more decent— she said she'd help us if George got a job. But, as I pointed out, if George got a job, we shouldn't need helping. But, my dear, I could hardly insult Mr. Goyles by suggesting that he should live on his mother-in-law, said the dowager. Why not, said Mary. George doesn't believe in those old-fashioned ideas about property. "'Besides, if you'd given it to me, it would be my money. "'We believe in men and women being equal. "'Why should the one always be the breadwinner more than the other?' "'I can't imagine, dear,' said the dowager. "'Still, I could hardly expect poor Mr. Goyles to live on unearned increment "'when he didn't believe in inherited property.' "'That's a fallacy,' said Mary, rather vaguely. Anyhow, she added hastily, that's what happened. Then, after the war, George went to Germany to study socialism and labor questions there, and nothing seemed any good. So when Dennis Cathcart turned up, I said I'd marry him. Why? asked Peter. He never sounded to me a bit the kind of bloke for you. I mean, as far as I could make out— he was a Tory, and diplomatic, and, well, quite crusted old Tawny, so to speak. I shouldn't have thought you had an idea in common. No, but then he didn't care tuppence whether I had any ideas or not. I made him promise he wouldn't bother me with diplomats and people, and he said no, I could do as I liked, provided I didn't compromise him. "'and we were to live in Paris, and go our own ways, and not bother. "'And anything was better than staying here and marrying somebody in one's own set, "'and opening bazaars and watching polo and meeting the Prince of Wales. 
So I said I'd marry Dennis, because I didn't care about him, and I'm pretty sure he didn't care a halfpenny about me, and we should have left each other alone. I did so want to be left alone. Was Jerry all right about your money? inquired Peter. Oh, yes. He said Dennis was no great catch. I do wish Gerald wasn't so vulgar in that flat, early Victorian way. But he said that after George he could only thank his stars it wasn't worse. Make a note of that, Charles, said Whimsy. Well, it seemed all right at first, but as things went on I got more and more depressed. Do you know there was something a little alarming about Dennis? He was so extraordinarily reserved. I know I wanted to be left alone, but, well, it was uncanny. He was correct. Even when he went off the deep end and was passionate, which didn't often happen, he was correct about it. Extraordinary. Like one of those odd French novels, you know, Peter? Frightfully hot stuff, but absolutely impersonal. "'Charles, old man,' said Lord Peter. "'Hm. That's important. You realize the bearing of that? No. Never mind. Drive on, Polly. Aren't I making your head ache? Damnably, but I like it. Do go on. I'm not sprouting a lily with anguish moist and fever dew or anything like that. I'm getting really thrilled.' What you've just said is more illuminating than anything I've struck for a week. Really? Mary stared at Peter, with every trace of hostility vanished. I thought you'd never understand that part. Lord, said Peter, why not? Mary shook her head. Well, I'd been corresponding all the time with George— and suddenly he wrote to me at the beginning of this month to say he'd come back from Germany, and had got a job on the Thunderclap, the Socialist Weekly, you know, at a beginning screw of four pounds a week, and wouldn't I chuck these capitalists and so on, and come and be an honest working woman with him? He could get me a secretarial job on the paper. I was to type and so on for him, and help him get his articles together. And he thought between us we should make six or seven pounds a week, which would be heaps to live on, and I was getting more frightened of Dennis every day. So I said I would. But I knew there'd be an awful row with Gerald, and really I was rather ashamed. The engagement had been announced, and there'd been a ghastly lot of talk and people trying to persuade me, and Dennis might have made things horribly uncomfortable for Gerald. He was rather that sort. So we decided the best thing to do would be just to run away and get married first, and escape the wrangling. Quite so, said Peter. Besides, it would look rather well in the paper, wouldn't it? Peer's daughter weds socialist. Romantic sidecar elopement. Six pounds a week, plenty,' says her ladyship. "'Pig,' said Mary. "'Very good,' said Peter. "'I get you. "'So it was arranged that the romantic Goyles "'should fetch you away from Riddlesdale. "'Why, Riddlesdale? "'Be twice as easy from London or Denver. "'No. "'For one thing, he had to be up north.' and everybody knows one in town, and anyhow we didn't want to wait. Besides, one would miss the young Lochinvar touch. Well, then, why at the unearthly hour of 3 a.m.? He had a meeting on Wednesday night at Northallerton. He was going to come straight on and pick me up, and run me down to town to be married by special license. We allowed ample time. "'George had to be at the office next day. "'I see. Well, I'll go on now, and you stop me if I'm wrong. 
you went up at nine thirty on wednesday night you packed a suitcase you did you think of writing any sort of letter to comfort your sorrowing friends and relations yes i wrote one but i of course then you went to bed i fancy or at any rate turned the clothes back and lay down yes i lay down it was a good thing i did as it happened true you wouldn't have had much time to make the bed look probable in the morning and we should have heard about it by the way parker when mary confessed her sins to you last night did you make any notes yes said parker if you can read my shorthand quite so said peter well the rumpled bed disposes of your story about never having gone to bed at all doesn't it and i thought it was such a good story want of practice replied her brother kindly you'll do better next time it's just as well really that it's so hard to tell a long consistent lie did you as a matter of fact hear gerald go out at eleven thirty as pettigrew robinson damn his ears said i fancy i did hear somebody moving about said mary but i didn't think much about it quite right said peter when i hear people moving about the house at night i'm much too delicate-minded to think anything at all of course interposed the duchess particularly in england where it is so oddly improper to think i will say for peter that if he can put a continental interpretation on anything he will so considerate of you dear as soon as you took to doing it in silence and not mentioning it as you so intelligently did as a child you were really a very observant little boy dear and still is said mary smiling at peter with surprising friendliness old bad habits die hard said whimsy to proceed at three o'clock you went down to meet goyles why did he come all the way up to the house it would have been safer to meet him in the lane i knew i couldn't get out of the lodge gate without waking hardraw and so i'd have to get over the paling somewhere i might have managed alone but not with a heavy suitcase so as george would have to climb over anyhow we thought he'd better come and help carry the suitcase and then we couldn't miss each other by the conservatory door i sent him a little plan of the path was goyles there when you got downstairs no at least no i didn't see him but there was poor dennis's body and gerald bending over it my first idea was that gerald had killed george that's why i said oh god you've killed him peter glanced across at parker and nodded then gerald turned him over and i saw it was dennis and then i'm sure i heard something moving a long way off in the shrubbery a noise like twigs snapping and it suddenly came over me where was george oh peter i saw everything then so clearly i saw that dennis must have come on george waiting there and attacked him i'm sure dennis must have attacked him probably he thought it was a burglar or he found out who he was and tried to drive him away and in the struggle george must have shot him it was awful peter patted his sister on the shoulder poor kid he said i didn't know what to do went on the girl i'd so awfully little time you see my one idea was that nobody must suspect anybody had been there so i had quickly to invent an excuse for being there myself i shoved my suitcase behind the cactus plants to start with jerry was taken up with the body and didn't notice 
you know jerry never does notice things till you shove them under his nose but i knew if there'd been a shot freddy and the marchbankses must have heard it so i pretended i'd heard it too and rushed down to look for burglars it was a bit lame but the best thing i could think of gerald sent me up to alarm the house and i had the story all ready by the time i reached the landing oh and i was quite proud of myself for not forgetting the suitcase you dumped it in the chest said peter yes i had a horrible shock the other morning when i found you looking in nothing like the shock i had when i found the silver sand there silver sand out of the conservatory good gracious said mary well go on you knocked up freddy and the pettigrew robinsons then you had to bolt into your room to destroy your farewell letter and take your clothes off yes i'm afraid i didn't do that very naturally but i couldn't expect anybody to believe that i went burglar hunting in a complete set of silk undies and a carefully knotted tie with gold safety pin no i see your difficulty it turned out quite well too because they were all quite ready to believe that i wanted to escape from mrs pettigrew robinson except mrs p herself of course yes even parker swallowed that didn't you old man oh quite so quite so said parker gloomily i made a dreadful mistake about that shot resumed lady mary you see i explained it all so elaborately and then i found that nobody had heard a shot at all and afterwards they discovered that it had all happened in the shrubbery and the time wasn't right either then at the inquest i had to stick to my story and it got to look worse and worse and then they put the blame on gerald in my wildest moments i'd never thought of that of course i see now how my wretched evidence helped hence the ipecacuana said peter i'd got into such a frightful tangle said poor lady mary i thought i had better shut up altogether for fear of making things still worse and did you still think goyles had done it i i didn't know what to think said the girl i don't now peter who else could have done it honestly old thing said his lordship if he didn't do it i don't know who did he ran away you see said lady mary he seems rather good at shootin and runnin away said peter grimly if he hadn't done that to you said mary slowly i'd never have told you i'd have died first but of course with his revolutionary doctrines and when you think of red russia and all the blood spilt in riots and insurrections and things i suppose it does teach a contempt for human life my dear said the duchess it seems to me that mr coyle shows no especial contempt for his own life you must try to look at the thing fairly shooting people and running away is not very heroic according to our standards the thing i don't understand struck in whimsy hurriedly is how gerald's revolver got into the shrubbery the thing i should like to know about said the duchess is was dennis really a card sharper the thing i should like to know about said parker is the green-eyed cat dennis never gave me a cat said mary that was a taradiddle were you ever in a jeweller's with him in the rue de la paix oh yes heaps of times and he gave me a diamond and tortoise-shell comb but never a cat then we may disregard the whole of last night's elaborate confession said lord peter looking through parker's notes with a smile 
It's really not bad, Polly, not bad at all. You've a talent for romantic fiction. No, I mean it. Just here and there you need more attention to detail. For instance, you couldn't have dragged that badly wounded man all up the path to the house without getting blood all over your coat, you know. By the way, did Goyles know Cathcart at all? Not to my knowledge. Because Parker and I had an alternative theory, which would clear Goyles from the worst parts of the charge, anyhow. Tell her, old man, it was your idea. Thus urged, Parker outlined the blackmail and suicide theory. That sounds plausible, said Mary. Academically speaking, I mean. But it isn't a bit like George. I mean, blackmail is so beastly, isn't it? Well, said Peter, I think the best thing is to go and see Goyles. Whatever the key to Wednesday night's riddle is, he holds it. Parker, old man, we're nearing the end of the chase. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Nothing abides at noon. Alas, said Haya, the sentiments which this person expressed with irreproachable honorableness when the sun was high in the heavens and the probability of secretly leaving an undoubtedly well-appointed home was engagingly remote seemed to have an entirely different significance when recalled by night in a damp orchard and on the eve of their fulfilment the wallet of kai lung and his short minute afternoon is night dawn Mr. Goyles was interviewed the next day at the police station. Mr. Mervyls was present, and Mary insisted on coming. The young man began by blustering a little, but the solicitor's dry manner made its impression. "'Lord Peter Whimsey identifies you,' said Mr. Mervyls, "'as the man who made a murderous attack upon him last night. "'With remarkable generosity,' He has forborne to press the charge. Now we know further that you were present at Riddlesdale Lodge on the night when Captain Cathcart was shot. You will no doubt be called as a witness in the case. But you would greatly assist justice by making a statement to us now. This is a purely friendly and private interview, Mr. Goyles, as you see, no representative of the police is present. We simply ask for your help. I ought, however, to warn you that, whereas it is, of course, fully competent for you to refuse to answer any of our questions, a refusal might lay you open to the gravest imputations. In fact, said Goyles, it's a threat. If I don't tell you, you'll have me arrested on suspicion of murder. Dear me, no, Mr. Goyles, returned the solicitor. We should merely place what information we hold in the hands of the police, who would then act as they thought fit. God bless my soul, no, anything like a threat would be highly irregular. In the matter of the assault upon Lord Peter, his lordship will of course use his own discretion well said goyles sullenly it's a threat call it what you like however i don't mind speaking especially as you'll be jolly well disappointed i suppose you gave me away mary mary flushed indignantly my sister has been extraordinarily loyal to you mr goyles said lord peter I may tell you, indeed, that she put herself into a position of grave personal inconvenience, not to say danger, on your behalf. 
you were traced to london in consequence of your having left unequivocal traces in your exceedingly hasty retreat when my sister accidentally opened a telegram addressed to me at riddlesdale by my family name she hurried immediately to town to shield you if she could at any cost to herself fortunately i had already received a duplicate wire at my flat even then i was not certain of your identity when i accidentally ran across you at the soviet club your own energetic efforts however to avoid an interview gave me complete certainty together with an excellent excuse for detaining you in fact i am uncommonly obliged to you for your assistance mr goyles looked resentful i don't know how you could think george said mary never mind what i think said the young man roughly i gather you've told em all about it now anyway well i'll tell you my story as shortly as i can and you'll see i know damned all about it if you don't believe me i can't help it i came along at about a quarter to three and parked the bus in the lane where were you at eleven fifty on the road from north allerton my meeting didn't finish till ten forty five i can bring a hundred witnesses to prove it whimsy made a note of the address where the meeting had been held and nodded to goyles to proceed i climbed over the wall and walked through the shrubbery you saw no person and no body nobody alive or dead did you notice any blood or footprints on the path no i didn't like to use my torch for fear of being seen from the house there was just light enough to see the path i came to the door of the conservatory just before three as i came up i stumbled over something i felt it and it was like a body i was alarmed i thought it might be mary ill or fainted or something i ventured to turn on my light then i saw it was cathcart dead you are sure he was dead stone dead one moment interposed the solicitor you say you saw that it was cathcart had you known cathcart previously no never i meant that i saw it was a dead man and learnt afterwards that it was cathcart in fact you do not now know of your own knowledge that it was cathcart yes at least i recognized the photographs in the paper afterwards it is very necessary to be accurate in making a statement mr goyles a remark such as you made just now might give a most unfortunate impression to the police or to a jury so saying mr murbles blew his nose and resettled his pince nez what next inquired peter i fancied i heard somebody coming up the path did not think it wise to be found there with the court so i cleared out oh said peter with an indescribable expression that was a very simple solution you left the girl you were going to marry to make for herself the unpleasant discovery that there was a dead man in the garden and that her gallant wooer had made tracks what did you expect her to think well i thought she'd keep quiet for her own sake as a matter of fact i didn't think very clearly about anything i knew i'd broken in where i had no business and that if i was found with a murdered man it might look jolly queer for me in fact said mr murbles you lost your head young man and ran away in a very foolish and cowardly manner you needn't put it that way retorted mr goyles i was in a very awkward and stupid situation to start with yes said lord peter ironically and three a m is a nasty chilly time of day next time you arrange an elopement make it for six o'clock in the evening or twelve o'clock at night you seem better at framing conspiracies than carrying them out a little thing upsets your nerves mr goyles 
"'I don't really think you know that a person of your temperament should carry firearms.' "'What in the world, you blithering young ass, made you loose off that pop-gun at me last night? "'You would have been in a damned awkward situation then, if you'd accidentally hit me in the head, or the heart, or anywhere that mattered. "'If you're so frightened of a dead body, why go about shooting at people? "'Why, why, why? That's what beats me. "'If you're telling the truth now, you never stood in the slightest danger.' "'Lord, to think of the time and trouble we've had to waste catching you, you ass, "'and poor old Mary working away and half killing herself "'because she thought at least you wouldn't have run away "'unless there was something to run from. "'You must make allowance for a nervous temperament,' said Mary in a hard voice. "'If you knew what it felt like to be shadowed and followed and badgered,' "'began Mr. Coyle's. "'But I thought you Soviet club people enjoyed being suspected of things,' said Lord Peter. "'Why, it ought to be the proudest moment of your life when you're really looked on as a dangerous fellow.' "'It's the sneering of men like you,' said Goyles passionately, "'that does more to breed hatred between class and class.' "'Never mind about that,' imposed Mr. Murbles. "'The law's the law for everybody.' "'and you have managed to put yourself in a very awkward position, young man.' "'He touched a bell on the table, and Parker entered with a constable. "'We shall be obliged to you,' said Mr. Murbles, "'if you will kindly have this young man kept under observation. "'We make no charge against him so long as he behaves himself, "'but he must not attempt to abscond before the Riddlesdale case comes up for trial. "'Certainly not, sir,' said Mr. Parker. "'One moment,' said Mary. "'Mr. Goyles, here is the ring you gave me. Good-bye. "'When next you make a public speech calling for decisive action, "'I will come and applaud it. "'You speak so well about that sort of thing. "'But otherwise I think we had better not meet again.' "'Of course,' said the young man bitterly. "'Your people have forced me into this position, and you turn round and sneer at me, too.' "'I didn't mind thinking you were a murderer,' said Lady Mary spitefully. "'But I do mind your being such an ass.' Before Mr. Goyles could reply, Mr. Parker, bewildered but not wholly displeased, maneuvered his charge out of the room. Mary walked over to the window and stood biting her lips. Presently Lord Peter came across to her. "'I say, Polly, old Murbles has asked us to lunch. Would you like to come? Sir Impey Biggs will be there.' "'I don't want to meet him to-day. It's very kind of Mr. Murbles. Oh, come along, old thing. Biggs is some celebrity, you know, and toppin' to look at, in a marbly kind of way. He'll tell you all about his canaries.' "'Mary giggled through her obstinate tears. "'It's perfectly sweet of you, Peter, to try to amuse the baby. "'But I can't. I'd make a fool of myself. "'I've been made enough of a fool for one day.' "'Bosh!' said Peter. "'Of course Goyles didn't show up very well this morning, "'but then he was in an awfully difficult position. "'Do come.' "'I hope Lady Mary consents to adorn my bachelor establishment,' said the solicitor, coming up. "'I shall esteem it a very great honour. "'I really do not think I have entertained a lady in my chambers for twenty years. "'Dear me, twenty years indeed it must be.' "'In that case,' said Mary, "'I simply can't refuse.' Mr. Murbles inhabited a delightful old set of rooms in Stapley Inn, with windows looking out upon the formal garden with its odd little flower-beds and tinkling fountain. The chambers kept up to a miracle the old-fashioned law atmosphere, which hung about his own prim person. His dining-room was furnished in mahogany with a turkey carpet and crimson curtains. On his sideboard stood some pieces of handsome Sheffield plate, 
and a number of decanters with engraved silver labels round their necks. There was a bookcase full of large volumes bound in law calf, and an oil painting of a harsh-featured judge over the mantelpiece. Lady Mary felt a sudden gratitude for this discreet and solid Victorianism. "'I fear we may have to wait a few moments for Sir Impey,' said Murbles, consulting his watch. "'He is engaged in Quangle and Hamper v. Truth, but they expect to be through this morning. In fact, Sir Impey fancied that midday would see the end of it. Brilliant man, Sir Impey. He is defending truth. Astonishing position for a lawyer, what? said Peter. The newspapers, said Mr. Murbles, acknowledging the pleasantry with a slight unbending of the lips, against these people who profess to cure fifty-nine different diseases with the same pill quangle and hamper produced some of their patients in court to testify to the benefits they'd enjoyed from the cure to hear sir impey handling them was an intellectual treat his kindly manner goes a long way with the old ladies when he suggested that one of them should show her leg to the bench the sensation in court was really phenomenal and did she show it inquired lord peter panting for the opportunity my dear lord peter panting for the opportunity i wonder they had the nerve to call her nerve said mr Murbles. The nerve of men like Quangle and Hamper has not its fellow in the universe to adopt the expression of the great Shakespeare. But Sir Impey is not the man to take liberties with. We are really extremely fortunate to have secured his help. Ah, I think I hear him. A hurried footstep on the stair, indeed, announced the learned counsel who burst in, still in wig and gown and full of apology extremely sorry murbles said sir impey we became excessively tedious at the end i regret to say i really did my best but dear old dowson is getting as deaf as a post you know and terribly fumbling in his movements and how are you whimsy you look as if you'd been in the wars can we bring an action for assault against anybody "'Much better than that,' put in Mr. Murbles. "'Attempted murder, if you please.' "'Excellent, excellent,' said Sir Impey. "'Ah, but we've decided not to prosecute,' said Mr. Murbles, shaking his head. "'Really? Oh, my dear Whimsy, this will never do. Lawyers have to live, you know. "'Your sister? I hadn't the pleasure of meeting you at Riddlesdale, Lady Mary.' I trust you are fully recovered. Entirely, thank you, said Mary, with emphasis. Mr. Parker, of course your name is very familiar. Whimsy here can't do a thing without you, I know. Murbles, are these gentlemen full of valuable information? I am immensely interested in this case. Not just this moment, though, put in the solicitor. "'Indeed, no. Nothing but that excellent saddle of mutton has the slightest attraction for me just now. Forgive my greed.' "'Well, well,' said Murbles, beaming mildly. "'Let's make a start. I fear, my dear young people, I am old-fashioned enough not to have adopted the modern practice of cocktail drinking.' "'Quite right, too,' said Whimsy emphatically. "'Ruins the palate and spoils the digestion. "'Not an English custom. "'Rank sacrilege in this old inn came from America. "'Result? Prohibition. "'That's what happens to people who don't understand how to drink. "'God bless me, sir, why, you're giving us the famous claret. "'It's a sin so much as to mention a cocktail in its presence.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Murbles. "'Yes.' That's the Lafitte seventy-five. It's very seldom, very seldom, I bring it out for anybody under fifty years of age. But you, Lord Peter, have a discrimination which would do honour to one of twice your years. 
"'Thanks very much, sir. That's a testimonial I deeply appreciate. "'May I circulate the bottle, sir?' "'Do, do. We will wait on our cell, Simpson. Thank you. "'After lunch,' continued Mr. Murbles, "'I will ask you to try something really curious. "'An old client of mine died the other day "'and left me a dozen of forty-seven port.' Gad, said Peter, forty-seven. It'll hardly be drinkable, will it, sir? I very greatly fear, replied Mr. Murbles, that it will not. A great pity. But I feel that some kind of homage should be paid to so noble an antiquity. It would be something to say that one had tasted it, said Peter. Like going to see the divine Sarah, you know. "'Voice gone, bloom gone, savour gone, but still a classic.' "'Ah,' said Mr. Murbles, "'I remember her in her great days. "'We old fellows have the compensation of some very wonderful memories.' "'Quite right, sir,' said Peter. "'And you'll pile up plenty more yet. "'But what was this old gentleman doing to let a vintage like that get past its prime?' "'Mr. Featherstone was a very singular man,' said Mr. Murbles. "'And yet, I don't know, he may have been profoundly wise. "'He had the reputation for extreme avarice. "'Never bought a new suit, never took a holiday, never married, "'lived all his life in the same dark, narrow chambers "'he occupied as a briefless barrister. "'Yet he inherited a huge income from his father,' all of which he left to accumulate. The porch was laid down by the old man, who died in 1860, when my client was thirty-four. He, the son, I mean, was ninety-six when he deceased. He said no pleasure ever came up to the anticipation, and so he lived like a hermit, doing nothing, but planning all the things he might have done. He wrote an elaborate diary containing, day by day, the record of this visionary existence, which he had never dared to put to the test of actuality. The diary described minutely a blissful wedded life with the woman of his dreams. Every Christmas and Easter day a bottle of the forty-seven was solemnly set upon his table, and solemnly removed, unopened, at the close of his frugal meal. An earnest Christian, he anticipated great happiness after death, but, as you see, he put the pleasure off as long as possible. He died with the words, He is faithful that promised, feeling to the end the need of assurance. A very singular man, very singular indeed, far removed from the adventurous spirit of the present generation. "'How curious and pathetic!' said Mary. "'Perhaps he had at some time set his heart on something unattainable,' said Parker. "'Well, I don't know,' said Mr. Murbles. "'People used to say that the dream lady had not always been a dream, but that he could never bring himself to propose.' "'Ah!' said Sir Impey briskly. The more I see and hear in the courts, the more I am inclined to feel that Mr. Featherstone chose the better part. And are determined to follow his example in that respect at any rate, eh, Sir Impey? replied Mr. Murbles, with a mild chuckle. Mr. Parker glanced towards the window. It was beginning to rain. Truly enough, the forty-seven port was a dead thing. The merest ghost of its old flame and flavour hung about it. Lord Peter held his glass, poised a moment. It is like the taste of a passion that has passed its noon and turned to weariness, he said with sudden gravity. The only thing to do is to recognise bravely that it is dead and put it away. With a determined movement, he flung the remainder of the wine into the fire. The mocking smile came back to his face. 
"'What I like about Clive is that he is no longer alive. "'There is a great deal to be said for being dead.' What classic pith and brevity in those four lines! However, in the matter of this case, we've a good deal to tell you, sir. With the assistance of Parker, he laid before the two men of law the whole train of the investigation up to date, Lady Mary coming loyally up to scratch with her version of the night's proceedings. In fact, you see, said Peter, this mr goyles has lost a lot by not being a murderer we feel he would have cut a fine sinister figure as a midnight assassin but things being as they are you see we must make what we can of him as a witness what well lord peter said mr murbles slowly i congratulate you and mr parker on a great deal of industry and ingenuity in working the matter out i think we may say we have made some progress said parker if only negatively added peter exactly said sir impey turning on him with staggering abruptness very negatively indeed and having seriously hampered the case for the defence what are you going to do next "'That's a nice thing to say,' cried Peter indignantly, "'when we've cleared up such a lot of points for you.' "'I dare say,' said the barrister, "'but they're the sorts of points which are much better left muffled up. "'Damn it all, we want to get at the truth.' "'Do you?' said Sir Impey, dryly. "'I don't. "'I don't care tuppence about the truth. "'I want a case.' "'It doesn't matter to me who killed Cathcart, "'provided I can prove it wasn't Denver. "'It's really enough if I can throw reasonable doubt "'on its being Denver. "'Here's a client comes to me with a story of a quarrel, "'a suspicious revolver, "'a refusal to produce evidence of his statements, "'and a totally inadequate and idiotic alibi.' I arrange to obfuscate the jury with mysterious footprints, a discrepancy as to time, a young woman with a secret, and a general vague suggestion of something between a burglary and a crime passionnel, and here you come explaining the footprints, exculpating the unknown man, abolishing the discrepancies, clearing up the motives of the young woman, and most carefully throwing back suspicion to where it rested in the first place. What do you expect? I've always said, growled Peter, that the professional advocate was the most immoral fellow on the face of the earth, and now I know it for certain. Well, well, said Mr. Murbles, all this just means that we mustn't rest upon our oars. "'You must go on, my dear boy, and get more evidence of a positive kind. "'If this Mr. Goyles did not kill Cathcart, we must be able to find the person who did.' "'Anyhow,' said Biggs, "'there's one thing to be thankful for, and that is, "'that you were still too unwell to go before the grand jury last Thursday, Lady Mary.' "'Lady Mary blushed.' and the prosecution will be building their case on a shot fired at 3 a.m. Don't answer any questions if you can help it, and we'll spring it on them. But will they believe anything she says at the trial after that? asked Peter dubiously. All the better if they don't. She'll be their witness. You'll get a nasty heckling, Lady Mary, but you mustn't mind that. It's all in the game." "'Just stick to your story, and we'll deliver the goods. See?' Sir Impey wagged a menacing finger. "'I see,' said Mary. "'And I'll be heckled like anything. Just go on stubbornly, saying, "'I am telling the truth now. That's the idea, isn't it?' "'Exactly so,' said Biggs. "'By the way, Denver still refuses to explain his movements, I suppose?' Cat Categorically, replied the solicitor. The Whimsies are a very determined family, he added. 
and I fear that, for the present, it is useless to pursue that line of investigation. If we could discover the truth in some other way, and confront the Duke with it, he might then be persuaded to add his confirmation. "'Well, now,' said Parker, "'we have, as it seems to me, still three lines to go upon. First, we must try to establish the Duke's alibi from external sources.' Secondly, we can examine the evidence afresh, with a view to finding the real murderer. And thirdly, the Paris police may give us some light upon Cathcart's past history. And I fancy I know where to go next for information on the second point, said Whimsy suddenly. Grider's Hole. Phew, Parker whistled. I was forgetting that. "'That's where that bloodthirsty farmer fellow lives, isn't it, who set the dogs on you?' "'With the remarkable wife, yes. See here, how does this strike you? This fellow is ferociously jealous of his wife, and inclined to suspect every man who comes near her. When I went up there that day, and mentioned that a friend of mine might have been hanging about there the previous week, he got frightfully excited and threatened to have the fellow's blood. Seemed to know who I was referring to. Now, of course, with my mind full of number ten, Goyles, you know, I never thought but what he was the man. But supposin' it was Cathcart. You see, we know now, Goyles hadn't even been in the neighborhood till the Wednesday, so you wouldn't expect what's-his-name, Grimethorpe, to know about him. But Cathcart might have wandered over to Grider's Hole any day and been seen. And look here, here's another thing that fits in. When I went up there, Mrs. Grimethorpe evidently mistook me for somebody she knew and hurried down to warn me off. Well, of course, I'd been thinking all the time she must have seen my old cap and Burberry from the window and mistaken me for Goyle's. But now I come to think of it, I told the kid who came to the door that I was from Riddlesdale Lodge. If the child told her mother, she must have thought it was Cathcart. No, no, Whimsy, that won't do, put in Parker. She must have known Cathcart was dead by that time. Oh, damn it, yes, I suppose she must. Unless that surly old devil kept the news from her. "'By Jove, that's just what he would do, if he'd killed Cathcart himself. "'He'd never say a word to her, and I don't suppose he would let her look at a paper, "'even if they take one in. It's a primitive sort of place.' "'But didn't you say Grimethorpe had an alibi?' "'Yes, but we didn't really test it.' "'And how do you suppose he knew Cathcart was going to be in the thicket that night?' Peter considered. "'Perhaps he sent for him,' suggested Mary. "'That's right, that's right,' cried Peter eagerly. "'You remember we thought Cathcart must somehow or other have heard from Goyles, making an appointment, but suppose the message was from Grimethorpe, threatening to split on Cathcart to Jerry.' "'You are suggesting, Lord Peter,' said Murbles, in a tone calculated to chill Peter's blithe impetuosity, "'that, at the very time Mr. Cathcart was betrothed to your sister, he was carrying on a disgraceful intrigue with a married woman, very much his social inferior?' "'I beg your pardon, Polly,' said Whimsy. "'It's all right,' said Mary. "'I—' As a matter of fact, it wouldn't surprise me frightfully. Venice was always, I mean, he had rather continental ideas about marriage and that sort of thing. I don't think he'd have thought that mattered very much. He'd probably have said there was a time and place for everything. One of those watertight compartment minds, said Whimsy thoughtfully. Mr. Parker, despite his long acquaintance with the seamy side of things in London, had his brows set in a gloomy frown of as fierce a provincial disapproval as ever came from Barrow-in-Furness. 
"'If you can upset this Grimethorpe's alibi,' said Sir Impey, fitting his right-hand fingertips neatly between the fingers of his left hand, "'we might make some sort of a case of it. What do you think, Murbles?' "'After all,' said the solicitor, "'Grimethorpe and the servant both admit that he, Grimethorpe, was not at Grider's Hole on Wednesday night. If he can't prove he was at Stapley, he may have been at Riddlesdale. By Jove, cried Wimsey, driven off alone, stopped somewhere, left the G, sneaked back, met Cathcart, done him in, and toddled home next day with a tale about machinery. Or he may even have been to Stapley, put in Parker left early or gone late and put in the murder on the way we shall have to check the precise times very carefully hooray cried whimsy i think i'll be getting back to riddlesdale i'd better stay here said parker there may be something from paris right you are let me know the minute anything comes through i say old thing yes "'Does it occur to you that what's the matter with this case "'is that there are too many clues? "'Dozens of people with secrets and elopements barging all over the place?' "'I hate you, Peter,' said Lady Mary. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mary Ba. Oh ho, my friend, you are gotten into Lob's Pond. Jack the Giant Killer. Lord Peter broke his journey north at York, whither the Duke of Denver had been transferred after the Assizes owing to the imminent closing down of north allerton jail by dint of judicious persuasion peter contrived to obtain an interview with his brother he found him looking ill at ease and pulled down by the prison atmosphere but still unquenchably defiant bad luck old man said peter but you're keeping your tail up fine "'Beastly slow business, all this legal stuff, what? "'But it gives us time, and that's all to the good.' "'It's a confounded nuisance,' said His Grace. "'And I'd like to know what Murbles means. "'Comes down and tries to bully me. "'Damned impudence. "'Anybody'd think he suspected me.' "'Look here, Jerry,' said his brother earnestly. "'Why can't you let up on that alibi of yours? "'It'd help no end, you know. "'After all, if a fellow who won't say what he's been doing, "'It ain't my business to prove anything,' retorted His Grace with dignity. "'They've got to show I was there murdering the fellow. "'I'm not bound to say where I was. "'I'm presumed innocent, aren't I, till they prove me guilty? "'I call it a disgrace.' "'Here's a murder committed, and they aren't taking the slightest trouble to find the real criminal. "'I give em my word of honour, to say nothing of an oath, that I didn't kill Cathcart, "'though, mind you, the swine deserved it. "'But they pay no attention. "'Meanwhile, the real man's escaping at his confounded leisure. "'If I were only free, I'd make a fuss about it.' "'Well, why the devil don't you cut it short, then?' urged Peter. "'I don't mean here and now to me,' with a glance at the warder within earshot, "'but to Murbles, then we could get to work.' "'I wish you'd jolly well keep out of it,' grunted the Duke. "'Isn't it all damnable enough for Helen, poor girl, and mother, and everyone?' "'without you making it an opportunity to play Sherlock Holmes? "'I'd have thought you'd have had the decency to keep quiet for the family's sake. "'I may be in a damned rotten position, "'but I ain't making a public spectacle of myself by Jove.' "'Hell!' 
said Lord Peter, with such vehemence that the wooden-faced warder actually jumped. "'It's you that's making the spectacle. It need never have started but for you. Do you think I like having my brother and sister dragged through the courts, and reporters swarming over the place, and paragraphs and news bills with your name, staring at me from every corner, and all this ghastly business, ending up in a great show in the House of Lords, with a lot of people togged up in scarlet and ermine, and all the rest of the damn fool jiggery-pokery? People are beginning to look oddly at me in the club, and I can jolly well hear em whispering that Denver's attitude looks fishy, begad. Cut it out, Jerry. Well, we're in for it now, said his brother. And thank heaven there are still a few decent fellows left in the peerage who'll know how to take a gentleman's word, even if my own brother can't see beyond his rotten legal evidence. As they stared angrily at one another, that mysterious sympathy of the flesh, which we call family likeness, sprang out from its hiding place, stamping their totally dissimilar features with an elfish effect of mutual caricature. It was as though each saw himself in a distorting mirror, while the voices might have been one voice with its echo. "'Look here, old chap,' said Peter, recovering himself. "'I'm frightfully sorry. I didn't mean to let myself go like that. If you won't say anything, you won't. Anyhow, we're all working like blazes, and we're sure to find the right man before very long.' "'You'd better leave it to the police,' said Denver. "'I know you like playing at detectives, but I do think you might draw the line somewhere.' "'That's a nasty one,' said Whimsy. "'But I don't look on this as a game, and I can't say I'll keep out of it, because I know I'm doing valuable work. Still, I can, honestly, I can see your point of view.' I'm jolly sorry you find me such an irritating sort of person. I suppose it's hard for you to believe I feel anything, but I do, and I'm going to get you out of this if Bunter and I both perish in the attempt. Well, so long. That's the warder just waking up to say, Time, gentlemen. Cheero, old thing. Good luck. He rejoined Bunter outside. Bunter, he said, as they walked through the streets of the old city, is my manner really offensive when I don't mean it to be? It is possible, my lord, if your lordship will excuse my saying so, that the liveliness of your lordship's manner may be misleading to persons of limited... Be careful, Bunter. Limited imagination my lord. Well-bred English people never have imagination, Bunter. Certainly not, my lord. I meant nothing disparaging. Well, Bunter, oh, lord, there's a reporter. Hide me, quick. In here, my lord. Mr. Bunter whisked his master into the cool emptiness of the cathedral. I venture to suggest, my lord, he urged in a hurried whisper, that we adopt the attitude and external appearance of prayer, if your lordship will excuse me. Peeping through his fingers, Lord Peter saw a verger hastening towards them, rebuke depicted on his face. At that moment, however, the reporter entered in headlong pursuit, tugging a notebook from his pocket. The verger leapt swiftly on this new prey. The winder under which we stand, he began in a reverential monotone, is called the Seven Sisters of York. They say... Master and man stole quietly out. For his visit to the market town of Stapley, Lord Peter attired himself in an aged Norfolk suit, stockings with sober tops, an ancient hat turned down all round, stout shoes, and carried a heavy ash-plant. 
It was with regret that he abandoned his favorite stick, a handsome malacca marked off in inches for detective convenience, and concealing a sword in its belly and a compass in its head. He decided, however, that it would prejudice the natives against him, as having a town-bred, not to say supercilious, air about it. The sequel to this commendable devotion to his art forcibly illustrated the truth of Gertrude Reed's observation, all this self-sacrifice is a sad mistake. The little town was sleepy enough as he drove into it in one of the Riddlesdale dog-carts, Bunter beside him, and the under-gardener on the back seat. For choice he would have come on a market-day, in the hope of meeting Grimethorpe himself. But things were moving fast now, and he dared not lose a day. It was a raw, cold morning, inclined to rain. "'Which is the best inn to put up at, Wilkes?' "'There's the Bricklayer's Arms, my lord, a fine, well-thought-of place, or t Bridge and Bottle, in Square, or t Rose and Crown, t'other side of Square.' "'Where do folks usually put up on market days?' "'Mebby Rose and Crown is most popular, so to say. "'Tim Watchett, landlord, is a rare gossip. "'New Greg Smith, our way at Bridge and Bottle. "'He's not but a grimy, surly man, but he keeps good drink. "'Hm, I fancy, Bunter.' Our man will be more attracted by surliness and good drink than by a genial host. The bridge and bottle for us, I fancy, and if we draw blank there, we'll toddle over to the rose and crown and pump the garrulous watchet. Accordingly, they turned into the yard of a large, stony-faced house, whose long, unpainted sign bore the dim outline of a bridge embattled which local etymology had by a natural association of ideas transmogrified into the bridge and bottle to the grumpy ostler who took the horse peter with his most companionable manner addressed himself nasty raw morning isn't it Eh. give him a good feed i may be here some time Ugh. Not many people about today, what? Ugh. But I expect you're busy enough market days. Eh. People come in from long way round, I suppose. Coop, said the ostler. The horse walked three steps forward. Whoa, said the ostler. The horse stopped with the shafts free of the tugs. The man lowered the shafts to grate viciously on the gravel. "'Come on, oop,' said the ostler, and walked calmly off into the stable, leaving the affable Lord Peter as thoroughly snubbed as that young sprig of the nobility had ever found himself. "'I am more and more convinced,' said his lordship, "'that this is Farmer Grimethorpe's usual house of call.' Let's try the bar. Wilkes, I shan't want you for a bit. Get yourself lunch, if necessary. I don't know how long we shall be. Very good, my lord. In the bar of the bridge and bottle, they found Mr. Greg Smith gloomily checking a long invoice. Lord Peter ordered drinks for Bunter and himself. The landlord appeared to resent this as a liberty, and jerked his head towards the barmaid. It was only right and proper that Bunter, after respectfully returning thanks to his master for his half-pint, should fall into conversation with the girl, while Lord Peter paid his respects to Mr. Smith. "'Ah,' said his lordship, "'good stuff that, Mr. Smith.' I was told to come here for real good beer, and by Jove I've been sent to the right place. Ugh, said Mr. Smith. Tisn't what it was. 
now it's good these times well i don't want better by the way is mr grimthorpe here to-day eh is mr grimthorpe in stapley this morning do you know how'd i know i thought he always put up here ah perhaps i mistook the name but i fancied he'd be the man to go where the beer is best i oh well if you haven't seen him i don't suppose he's come over to-day cum where into stapley doesn't he live here he can go and cum without my knowin oh of course Rimsey staggered under the shock and then grasped the misunderstanding i don't mean mr grimthorpe of stapley but mr grimthorpe of grider's hole why didn't the say so oh him i he's here to-day nay i know not about it he comes in on market days i expect sometimes it's a longish way one can put up for the night i suppose deuce to want to stay to-night well no i don't think so i was thinking about my friend mr grimthorpe i dare say he often has to stay the night happen a does doesn't he stay here then nay oh said whimsy and thought impatiently if all these natives are as oyster-like i shall have to spend the night well well he added aloud next time he drops in say i asked after him and who mount thou be inquired mr smith in a hostile manner oh only brooks of sheffield said lord peter with a happy grin good morning i won't forget to recommend your beer mr smith grunted lord peter strolled slowly out and before long mr bunter joined him coming out with a brisk step and the lingering remains of what in any one else might have been taken for a smirk well inquired his lordship i hope the young lady was more communicative than that fellow i found the young person snubbed again muttered lord peter perfectly amiable my lord but unhappily ill-informed mr grimthorpe is not unknown to her but he does not stay here she has sometimes seen him in company with a man called zedekiah bone well said his lordship suppose you look for bone and come and report progress to me in a couple hours time i'll try the rosen crown we'll meet at noon under that thing that thing was a tall erection in pink granite neatly tooled to represent a craggy rock and guarded by two petrified infantrymen in trench helmets a thin stream of water gushed from a bronze knob halfway up a roll of honour was engraved on the octagonal base and four gas lamps on cast iron standards put the finishing touch to a very monument of incongruity mr bunter looked carefully at it to be sure of recognising it again and moved respectfully away lord peter walked ten brisk steps in the direction of the rose and crown and then a thought struck him bunter mr bunter hurried back to his side oh nothing said his lordship only i've just thought of a name for it for that memorial said lord peter i choose to call it mary ba yes my lord the waters of strife exceedingly apt my lord nothing harmonious about it if i may say so will there be anything further my lord no that's all mr timothy watchett of the rose and crown was certainly a contrast to mr greg smith he was a small spare sharp-eyed man of about fifty-five 
with so twinkling and humorous an eye, and so alert a cock of the head, that Lord Peter summed up his origin in the moment he set eyes on him. "'Morning, landlord,' said he genially. "'And when did you last see Piccadilly Circus?' "'Ard to say, sir, getting on for thirty-five year, I reckon. Many's the time I said to my wife, "'Liz, I'll take you to see the Ulborn Empire afore I die.' but with one thing and another time slips away one day so like another blowed if i ever remember how old i'm getting sir oh well you've lots of time yet said lord peter i hope so sir i ain't never what you may call got used to these northerners that slow they are sir it fair give me the ump when i first come and the why they speak that took some getting used to. Call that English, I used to say. Give me the Frenchies and the shanty clear restu wrong, I says. But there, sir, customs everything. Blowed if I didn't catch myself a sign. Yon side to square the other day. Me. I don't think there's much fear of your turning into a Yorkshireman, said Lord Peter. Didn't I know you the minute I set eyes on you? In Mr. Watchett's bar, I said to myself, my foot is on my native paving stones. That's right, sir. And being there, sir, what can I have the pleasure of offering you? Excuse me, sir, but haven't I seen your face somewhere? I don't think so, said Peter, but that reminds me, do you know one Mr. Grimethorpe? I know five Mr. Grimethorpes. Which of em was you meanin', sir? Mr. Grimethorpe of Grider's Hole. The landlord's cheerful face darkened. A friend of yours, sir? Not exactly. An acquaintance. "'There, now,' cried Mr. Watchett, smacking his hand down upon the counter. "'I knowed as I knowed your fice. Don't you live over at Riddlesdale, sir?' "'I'm staying there.' "'I knowed it,' retorted Mr. Watchett triumphantly. He dived behind the counter and brought up a bundle of newspapers, turning over the sheets excitedly with a well-licked thumb. "'There!' riddlesdale that's it of course he smacked open a daily mirror of a fortnight or so ago the front page bore a heavy block headline the riddlesdale mystery and beneath was a lifelike snapshot entitled lord peter whimsey the sherlock holmes of the west end who is devoting all his time and energies to proving the innocence of his brother, the Duke of Denver. Mr. Watchett gloated. "'You won't mind my sighing how crowd I am to have you in my bar, my lord. Ear, Jem, you attend to them, gentlemen. Don't you see their whiten? Follow all your cases I have, my lord, in the pipers, just like a book they are, and to think.' "'Look here, old thing,' said Lord Peter. "'Do you mind not talking quite so loud? "'Seeing dear old Felix is out of the bag, so to speak, "'do you think you could give me some information "'and keep your mouth shut? What? "'Come behind, into the bar parlour, my lord. "'Nobody will hear us there,' said Mr. Watchett, "'eagerly lifting up the flap. "'Jem, here, bring a bottle of... "'What'll you have, my lord?' "'Well, I don't know how many places I may have to visit,' said his lordship dubiously. "'Jem, bring a quart of the old ale. "'It's special, that's what it is, my lord. "'I ain't never found none like it, except it might be once at Oxford. "'Thanks, Jem. "'Now you get along sharp and attend to those customers. "'Now, my lord?' Mr. Watchett's information amounted to this, that Mr. Grimethorpe used to come to the Rose and Crown pretty often, especially on market days. 
about ten days previously he had come in latish very drunk and quarrelsome with his wife who seemed as usual terrified of him grimthorpe had demanded spirits but mr watchett had refused to serve him there had been a row and mrs grimthorpe had endeavoured to get her husband away grimthorpe had promptly knocked her down with epithets reflecting upon her virtue and mr watchett had at once called upon the potmen to turn grimthorpe out refusing to have him in the house again he had heard it said on all sides that grimthorpe's temper always notoriously bad had become positively diabolical of late could you hazard so to speak a calculation as to how long or since when well my lord come to think of it especially since the middle of last month perhaps a bit earlier hmm not that i go for to insinuate anything nor your lordship neither of course said mr watchett quickly certainly not said lord peter what about ah said mr watchett there it is what about tell me said lord peter do you recollect grimthorpe comin into stapley on october thirteenth a wednesday it was that would be the day of the ah to be sure yes i do recollect it for i remember thinking it was odd him comin here except on a market day said he had to look at some machinery drills and such that's right he was ere right enough do you remember what time he came in well now i've a fancy he was ere to lunch the waitress said no ear bet he called through the side door you're appen to recollect whether mr grimthorpe lunched here october the thirteenth wednesday it were the day the poor gent was murdered over at riddlesdale grimthorpe o oh, grider's hole said the girl yes he took lunch and come back to sleep i'm not mistook for i waited on un and took up his water in t mornin and he only gid me tuppence monstrous said lord peter look here miss elizabeth you're sure it was the thirteenth because i've got a bet on it with a friend and i don't want to lose my money if i can help it you're positive it was wednesday night he slept here i could have sworn it was thursday nay sir twar wednesday for i remember hearing the men talk to murder and bar tellin mr grindstorp next day sounds conclusive what did mr grimthorpe say about it there now tis queer you should ask that every one noticed how strange he acted turned all white like a sheet and looked at both his hands one after the other and then he pushes his head off forehead dazed like we reckoned he hadn't got over the drink he's more often drunk than not i uh, wouldn't be his wife for five hundred pounds i should think not said peter you can do a lot better than that well i suppose i've lost my money then by the way what time did mr grimthorpe come in to bed close on two in t morning said the girl tossing her head he were locked out and jem had to go down and let un in that's so said peter well i might try to get out on a technicality eh mr watchett two o'clock is thursday isn't it i'll work that for all it's worth thanks frightfully that's all i wanted to know bet grinned and giggled herself away comparing the generosity of the strange gentleman with the stinginess of mr grimthorpe peter rose i'm no end obliged mr watchett he said i'll just have a word with jem don't say anything by the way not me said mr watchett i know what's what good luck my lord 
Jem corroborated Bet. Grimethorpe had returned at about 1.50 a.m. on October 14th, drunk and plastered with mud. He had muttered something about having run up against a man called Watson. The ostler was next interrogated. He did not think that anybody could get a horse and trap out of the stable at night without his knowing it. He knew Watson. He was a carrier by trade and lived in Wyndham Street. Lord Peter rewarded his informant suitably and set out for Wyndham Street. But the recital of his quest would be tedious. At a quarter past noon he joined Bunter at the Mary Baugh Memorial. "'Any luck?' "'I have secured certain information, my lord, which I have duly noted. Total expenditure on beer for self and witnesses, seven shillings and tuppence, my lord.' Lord Peter paid the seven shillings and tuppence without a word, and they adjourned to the Rose and Crown. Being accommodated in a private parlour, and having ordered lunch, they proceeded to draw up the following schedule. Grimethorpe's Movements, Wednesday, October 13th to Thursday, October 14th. October 13th. 12.30 p.m. Arrives, Rose and Crown. 1 o'clock e.m. Lunches. 3 p.m. Orders two drills from man called Gooch in Trimmer's Lane. 4.30 p.m. Drink with Gooch to clinch bargain. 5 p.m. Calls at house of John Watson, carrier, about delivering some dog food. Watson absent. Mrs. Watson says W. expected back that night. G. says will call again. 5.30 p.m. Calls on Mark Dolby, grocer, to complain about some tinned salmon. 5.45 p.m. Calls on Mr. Hewitt, optician, to pay bill for spectacles and dispute the amount. 6 p.m. Drinks with Zedekiah Bone at Bridge and Bottle. 6.45. Calls again on Mrs. Watson. Watson not yet home. 7 p.m. Seen by Constable Z-15, drinking with several men at Pig and Whistle. Heard to use threatening language with regard to some person unknown. 7.20 p.m. Seen to leave Pig and Whistle with two men not yet identified. October 14th. 1.15 a.m. Picked up by Watson, carrier, about a mile out on the road to Riddlesdale, very dirty and ill-tempered, and not quite sober. 1.45 a.m. Let into Rose and Crown by James Johnson, potman. 9 a.m. Called by Elizabeth Dobbin. 9.30 a.m. In bar of Rose and Crown, hears of man murdered at Riddlesdale, behaves suspiciously. 10.15 a.m. Cash's check, a hundred and twenty-nine pounds, seventeen shillings and eight pence, at Lloyd's Bank. 10.30 a.m. Pays Gooch for drills. 11.05 a.m. Leaves Rose and Crown for Grider's Hole. Lord Peter looked at this for a few minutes and put his finger on the great gap of six hours after seven-twenty. How far to Riddlesdale, Bunter? About thirteen and three-quarter miles, my lord. And the shot was heard at ten-fifty-five. It couldn't be done on foot. Did Watson explain why he didn't get back from his round till two in the morning? Yes, my lord. He says he reckoned to be back about eleven, but his horse cast a shoe between King's Fenton and Riddlesdale. He had to walk him quietly into Riddlesdale, about three and a half miles, 
getting there about ten, and knock up the blacksmith. He turned in to the Lord in glory till closing time, and then went home with a friend and had a few more. At twelve-forty he started off home and picked Grimethorpe up a mile or so out near the crossroads. Sounds circumstantial. The blacksmith and the friend ought to be able to substantiate it, but we simply must find those men at the pig and whistle. Yes, my lord, I will try again after lunch. It was a good lunch, but that seemed to exhaust their luck for the day, for by three o'clock the men had not been identified, and the scent seemed cold. Wilkes, the groom, however, had his own contribution to the inquiry. He had met a man from King's Fenton at lunch, and they had naturally got to talking over the mysterious murder at the lodge, and the man had said that he knew an old man living in a hut on the fell, who said that on the night of the murder he'd seen a man walking over Wemmeling Fell in the middle of the night. "'And it come to me all of a sudden it would be his grace,' said Wilkes brightly. Further inquiries elicited that the old man's name was Groot, and that Wilkes could easily drop Lord Peter and Bunter at the beginning of the sheep path which led up to his hut. Now, had Lord Peter taken his brother's advice, and paid more attention to English country sports than to incunabula and criminals in London, or had Bunter been brought up on the moors rather than in a Kentish village, or had Wilkes, who was a Yorkshireman bred and born, and ought to have known better, not been so outrageously puffed up with the sense of his own importance in suggesting a clue, and with impatience to have that clue followed up without delay, or had any one of the three exercised common sense, this preposterous suggestion would never have been made, much less carried out, on a November day in the North Riding. As it was, however, Lord Peter and Bunter left the trap at the foot of the moor-path at ten minutes to four, and, dismissing Wilkes, climbed steadily up to the wee hut on the edge of the fell. The old man was extremely deaf, and after half an hour of interrogation, his story did not amount to much. On a night in October, which he thought might be the night of the murder, he had been sitting by his peat fire, when, about midnight, as he guessed, a tall man had loomed up out of the darkness. He spoke like a southerner, and said he had got lost on the moor. Old Groot had come to his door, and pointed out the track down towards Riddlesdale. The stranger had then vanished, leaving a shilling in his hand. He could not describe the stranger's dress more particularly than that he wore a soft hat and an overcoat, and, he thought, leggings. He was pretty near sure it was the night of the murder, because afterwards he had turned it over in his mind and made out that it might have been one of yon folk at the lodge, possibly the duke. He had only arrived at this result by a slow process of thought, and had not come forward, not knowing whom or where to come to. With this the inquirers had to be content, and, presenting Groot with half a crown, they emerged upon the moor at something after five o'clock. Bunter, said Lord Peter through the dusk, I am absolutely positive that the answer to all this business is at Grider's Hole. Very possibly, my lord. Lord Peter extended his fingers in southeasterly direction. That, 
is Grider's Hole, he said. Let's go. Very good, my lord. So, like two cockney innocents, Lord Peter and Bunter set forth at a brisk pace down the narrow moor track toward Grider's Hole, with never a glance behind them for the great white menace rolling silently down through the November dusk from the wide loneliness of Wemmeling Fell. Bunter! Here, my lord. The voice was close at his ear. Thank God! I thought you'd disappeared for good. I say, we ought to have known. Yes, my lord. It had come on them from behind in a single stride, thick, cold, choking, blotting each from the other, though they were only a yard or two apart. "'I'm a fool, Bunter,' said Lord Peter. "'Not at all, my lord.' "'Don't move. Go on speaking.' "'Yes, my lord.' Peter groped to the right and clutched the other's sleeve. "'Ah, now what are we to do?' I couldn't say, my lord, having no experience. Has the, er, uh, phenomenon any habits, my lord? No regular habits, I believe. Sometimes it moves. Other times it stays in place for days. We can wait all night and see if it lifts at daybreak. Yes, my lord, it is unhappily somewhat damp. Somewhat, as you say, agreed his lordship with a short laugh. Bunter sneezed and begged pardon politely. If we go on going southeast, said his lordship, we shall get to Grider's Hole all right, and they'll jolly well have to put us up for the night, or give us an escort. I've got my torch in my pocket, and we can go by compass. Oh, hell! My lord, I've got the wrong stick, the beastly ash. No compass, Bunter. We're done in. Couldn't we keep on going downhill, my lord? Lord Peter hesitated. Recollections of what he had heard and read surged up in his mind, to tell him that uphill or downhill seems much the same thing in a fog. But man walks in a vain shadow. It is hard to believe that one is really helpless. The cold was icy. We might try, he said weakly. I have heard it said, my lord, that in a fog one always walked round in a circle said Mr. Bunter, seized with a tardy diffidence. "'Not on a slope, surely,' said Lord Peter, beginning to feel bold out of sheer contrariness. Bunter, being out of his element, had, for once, no good counsel to offer. "'Well, we can't be much worse off than we are,' said Lord Peter. "'We'll try it, and keep on shouting.' He grasped Bunter's hand, and they strode gingerly forward into the thick coldness of the fog. How long that nightmare lasted, neither could have said. The world might have died about them. Their own shouts terrified them. When they stopped shouting, the dead silence was more terrifying still. They stumbled over tufts of thick heather, it was amazing how, deprived of sight, they exaggerated the inequalities of the ground. It was with very little confidence that they could distinguish uphill from downhill. They were shrammed through with cold, yet the sweat was running down from their faces with strain and terror. Suddenly, from directly before them, as it seemed, and only a few yards away, there rose a long, horrible shriek, and another, and another. My God, what's that? It's a horse, my lord. Of course. 
They remembered having heard horses scream like that. There had been a burning stable near Pobrange. Poor devil, said Peter. He started off impulsively in the direction of the sound, dropping Bunter's hand. Come back, my lord, cried the man in a sudden agony, and then, with a frightened burst of enlightenment, For God's sake, stop, my lord, the bog! A sharp shout in the utter blackness. Keep away there, don't move, it's got me. And a dreadful sucking noise. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Alibi When actually in the embrace of a voracious and powerful wild animal, the desirability of leaving a limb is not a matter to be subjected to lengthy consideration. The Wallet of Kai Lung I tripped right into it, said Whimsy's voice, steadily out of the blackness. One sinks very fast. You'd better not come near, or you'll go too. We'll yell a bit. I don't think we can be very far from Grider's Hole. If your lordship will keep shouting, returned Bunter, I think I can get to you, he panted untying with his teeth the hard knot of a coil of string. "'Oi!' cried Peter obediently. "'Help! I help!' Mr. Bunter groped towards the voice, feeling cautiously before him with his walking stick. "'Wish you'd keep away, Bunter,' said Lord Peter peevishly. "'Where's the sense of both of us?' He squelched and floundered again. "'Don't do that, my lord,' cried the man, entreatingly. "'You'll sink farther in.' "'I'm up to my thighs now,' said Lord Peter. "'I'm coming,' said Bunter. "'Go on shouting.' "'Ah, here's where it gets soggy.' He felt the ground carefully, selected a tussocky bit which seemed reasonably firm, and drove his stick well into it. "'Ah, oh, hi! Help!' said Lord Peter, shouting lustily. Mr. Bunter tied one end of the string to the walking stick, belted his Burberry tightly about him, and, laying himself cautiously down upon his belly, advanced, club in hand, like a very Gothic Theseus of a late and degenerate school. The bog heaved horribly as he crawled over it, and the slimy water squelched up into his face. He felt with his hands for tussocks of grass, and got support from them when he could. "'Call out again, my lord.' "'Here!' The voice was fainter, and came from the right. Buncher had lost his line a little, hunting for tussocks. "'I daren't come faster.' he explained. He felt as though he had been crawling for years. "'Get out while there's still time,' said Peter. "'I'm up to my waist. Lord, this is rather a beastly way to peg out.' "'You won't peg out,' grunted Bunter. His voice was suddenly quite close. "'Your hands now.' For a few agonizing minutes, two pairs of hands groped over the invisible slime. Then, keep yours still, said Bunter. He made a slow, circling movement. It was hard work keeping his face out of the mud. His hands slithered over the slobbery surface and suddenly closed on an arm. Thank God, said Bunter. Hang on here, my lord. He felt forward. The arms were perilously close to the sucking mud. The hands crawled clingingly up his arms and rested on his shoulders. He grasped Whimsy beneath the armpits and heaved. The exertion drove his own knees deep into the bog. 
He straightened himself hurriedly. Without using his knees, he could get no purchase, but to use them meant certain death. They could only hang on desperately till help came, or till the strain became too great. He could not even shout. It was almost more than he could do to keep his mouth free of water. The dragging strain on his shoulders was intolerable. The mere effort to breathe meant an agonizing crick in the neck. "'You must go on shouting, my lord.' Whimsy shouted. His voice was breaking and fading. "'Buncher, old thing,' said Lord Peter, "'I'm simply beastly sorry to have let you in for this.' "'Don't mention it, my lord,' said Buncher, with his mouth in the slime. A thought struck him. "'What became of your stick, my lord?' "'I dropped it. It should be somewhere near if it hasn't sunk in.' Bunter cautiously released his left hand and felt about. "'I help!' Bunter's hand closed over the stick, which, by a happy accident, had fallen across a stable tuft of grass. He pulled it over to him and laid it across his arms, so that he could just rest his chin upon it. The relief to his neck was momentarily so enormous that his courage was renewed. He felt he could hang on forever. Help! Minutes passed like hours. See that? A faint, flickering gleam somewhere away to the right. With desperate energy, both shouted together, Help! Help! Oi! Help! An answering yell. The light swayed, came nearer, a spreading blur in the fog. "'We must keep it up,' panted Whimsy. They yelled again. "'Where be? Here!' "'Hello!' a pause. Then, "'Here be a stick,' said a voice suddenly near. "'Follow the string,' yelled Bunter. They heard two voices, apparently arguing. Then the string was twitched. Here, here, two of us, make haste. More consultation. Hang on, canst thou? Yes, if you're quick. Fetch an hurdle. Two on ye, says thou? Yes. Deep in? One of us. All right, Jem's coming. A splattering noise marked the arrival of Jem with a hurdle. Then came an endless wait. Then another hurdle the string twitching, and the blur of the lantern bobbing violently about. Then a third hurdle was flung down, and the light came suddenly out of the mist. A hand caught Bunter by the ankle. Where's T'other? Here, nearly up to his neck. Have you a rope? I sure, Jem, the rope. The rope came snaking out of the fog. Bunter grasped it and passed it round his master's body. Now cum the back and heave. Bunter crawled cautiously backwards upon the hurdle. All three sets of hands upon the rope. It was like trying to heave the earth out of her course. Afraid I'm rooted to Australia, panted Peter apologetically. Bunter sweated and sobbed. It's all right. He's coomin. With slow heavings, the rope began to come towards them. Their muscles cracked. Suddenly, with a great plop, the bog let go its hold. The three at the rope were hurled head over heels upon the hurdles. Something unrecognizable in slime lay flat, heaving helplessly. They dragged at him in a kind of frenzy, as though he might be snatched back from them again. The evil bog stench rose thickly round them. They crossed the first hurdle, the second, the third, and rose staggeringly to their feet on firm ground. "'What a beastly place,' said Lord Peter faintly. "'Apologize. Stupid of me to have forgotten 
What's your name? Well, that's Lukey, said one of the rescuers. We thought we heard someone shouting. There be few folks as cooms out of Peter's potch, dead or alive, I reckon. Well, it was nearly potted Peter that time, said his lordship, and fainted. To Lord Peter, the memory of his entry that night into the farmhouse at Grider's Hole always brought with it a sensation of nightmare. The coils of fog rolled in with them as the door opened, and through them the firelight leapt steamily. A hanging lamp made a blur. The Medusa head of Mrs. Grimethorpe, terribly white against her black hair, peered over him. A hairy paw caught her by the shoulder and wrenched her aside. Shameless, a mon, any mon, that's all the that thinks on. Bide till there's wanted. What's this? Voices, voices, ever so many fierce faces peering down all round. Peter's pot, and what were ye a wanting unto more this time of night? No good. Nobody but a fool or a thief had come up here in fog. One of the men, a farm labourer with wry shoulders and a thin, malicious face, suddenly burst into a tuneless song. I been a courtin Mary Jane, on il clamour batat. How tune, yelled Grimthorpe in a fury. Dost want us break every bone the body? He turned on Bunter. Tack this an off, I tell you. Darts here for no good. But William, began his wife. He snapped round at her like a dog, and she shrank back. Nay, now, nay, now, said a man whom Whimsy dimly recognized as the fellow who had befriended him on his previous visit. Thou mun take them in for to-night, reckon, or there'll be trouble with the folk down yonder at the lodge let alone what police it say. If to fellum coom to do harm, he's done it already to himself. Won't do no more to-night. Look at un. Bring him to the fire, mon, he added to Bunter, and then, turning to the farmer again, Tess thou'll be in Queer Street, if an he were to go and die on us, wi' pneumony or rheumatics. This reasoning seemed partly to convince Grimthorpe. He made way, grumbling, and the two chilled and exhausted men were brought near the fire. Somebody brought two large steaming tumblers of spirits. Whimsy's brain seemed to clear, then swim again drowsily, drunkenly. Presently he became aware that he was being carried upstairs and put to bed. A big, old-fashioned room with a fire on the hearth and a huge, grim four-poster. Bunter was helping him out of soaked clothes, rubbing him. Another man appeared from time to time to help him. From below came the bellowing sound of Grimethorpe's voice, blasphemously uplifted, then the harsh, brassy singing of the wry-shouldered man. Then worms will come and eat the oop on il clamour batat. Then dukes will come and eat up worms on il clamour. Lord Peter rolled into bed. Bunter, where? You all right? Never said thank you. Don't know what I'm doing. Anywhere to sleep, what? He drifted away into oblivion. The old song came up mockingly and wound its horrible fancies into his dreams. Then we shall come and aid up dukes on il clamour batat, and that is how, and that is how, is how. When Whimsy next opened his eyes, a pale November sun was struggling in at the window. It seemed that the fog had fulfilled its mission and departed. 
For some time he lay vaguely unaware of how he came to be where he was. Then the outlines of recollection straightened themselves. The drifting outposts of dreams were called back. The burden of his preoccupation settled down, as usual. He became aware of an extreme bodily lassitude, and of the dragging pain of wrenched shoulder muscles. Examining himself perfunctorily, he found a bruised and tender zone beneath the armpits and round his chest and back, where the rescuing rope had hauled him. It was painful to move, so he lay back and closed his eyes once more. Presently the door opened to admit Bunter, neatly clothed and bearing a tray from which rose a most excellent odor of ham and eggs. "'Hello, Bunter. "'Good morning, my lord. "'I trust your lordship has rested. "'Feel as fit as a fiddle, thanks. "'Come to think of it, why a fiddle? "'Except for a general feeling of having been violently massaged "'by some fellow with cast-iron fingers and knobbly joints. "'How about you? "'The arms are a trifle fatigued, thank you, my lord.' Otherwise, I am happy to say I feel no trace of the misadventure. Allow me, my lord. He set the tray tenderly upon Lord Peter's ready knees. They must be jolly well dragged out of their sockets, said his lordship, holding me up all that ghastly long time. I'm so beastly deep in debt to you already, Bunter. It's not a bit of use trying to repay it. You know I won't forget it, anyhow, don't you? All right, I won't be embarrassing or anything. Thanks awfully, anyhow. That's that. What? Did they give you anywhere decent to sleep? I didn't seem to be able to sit up and take notice last night. I slept excellently, I thank you, your lordship. Mr. Bunter indicated a kind of truckle bed in a corner of the room. They would have given me another room, my lord. "'But in the circumstances I preferred to remain with your lordship, "'trusting you would excuse the liberty. "'I told them that I feared the effects of prolonged immersion "'upon your lordship's health. "'I was uneasy, besides, about the intention of Grimethorpe. "'I feared he might not feel altogether hospitably disposed, "'and that he might be led into some hasty action if we were not together. "'I shouldn't wonder.' "'Most murderous-looking fellow I ever set eyes on. "'I'll have to talk to him this morning, or to Mrs. Grimethorpe. "'I'd take my oath she could tell us something, what? "'I should say there was very little doubt of it, my lord. "'Trouble is,' pursued Whimsy, with his mouth full of egg, "'I don't know how to get at her. "'That jolly husband of hers seems to cherish the most unpleasant suspicions "'of anything that comes this way in trousers. "'If he found out we'd been talking to her, what you might call privately, "'he might, as you say, be hurried by his feelings into doing something regrettable. "'Just so, my lord. "'Still, the fellow must go and look after his bally old farm sometime.' and then perhaps we'll be able to tackle her. Queer sort of woman. Damn fine one, what? Wonder what she made of Cathcart, he added musingly. Mr. Bunter volunteered no opinion on this delicate point. Well, Bunter, I think I'll get up. I don't suppose we are altogether welcome here. I didn't fancy the look in our host's eye last night. No, my lord. He made a deal of opposition about having your lordship conveyed to this room. Why, whose room is it? His own, and Mrs. Grimethorpe's, my lord. It appeared most suitable, there being a fireplace, and the bed already made up. Mrs. Grimethorpe showed great kindness, my lord, and the man Jake pointed out to Grimethorpe, that it would doubtless be to his pecuniary advantage to treat your lordship with consideration. Hmm. Nice grasping character, ain't he? Well, it's up and away for me. Oh, lord, I am stiff. 
I say, Bunter, have I any clothes to put on? I have dried and brushed your lordship's suit to the best of my ability, my lord. It is not as I should wish to see it, but I think your lordship will be able to wear it to Riddlesdale. Well, I don't suppose the streets will be precisely crowded, retorted his lordship. I do so want a hot bath. How about shaven water? I can't procure that from the kitchen, my lord. Bunter padded away, and Lord Peter, having pulled on a shirt and trousers with many grunts and groans, roamed over to the window. As usual with hardy country dwellers, it was tightly shut, and a thick wedge of paper had been rammed in to keep the sash from rattling. He removed this and flung up the sash. The wind rollicked in, laden with peaty moor scents. He drank it in gladly. It was good to see the jolly old sun after all. He would have hated to die a sticky death in Peter's pot. For a few minutes he stood there, returning thanks vaguely in his mind for the benefits of existence. Then he withdrew to finish dressing. The wad of paper was still in his hand, and he was about to fling it into the fire when a word caught his eye. He unrolled the paper. As he read it, his eyebrows went up and his mouth pursed itself into an indescribable expression of whimsical enlightenment. Bunter, returning with the hot water, found his master transfixed. The paper in one hand and his socks in the other, and whistling a complicated passage of Bach under his breath. Bunter, said his lordship, I am, without exception, the biggest ass in Christendom. When a thing is close under my nose, I can't see it. I get a telescope and look for the explanation at Stapley. I deserve to be crucified upside down as a cure for anemia of the brain. Jerry! Jerry! But naturally, of course, you rotten ass, isn't it obvious? Silly old blighter! Why couldn't he tell Murbles or me? Mr. Bunter advanced, the picture of respectful inquiry. "'Look at it! Look at it!' said Whimsy, with a hysterical squeak of laughter. "'Oh, Lord! Oh, Lord! Stuck into the window-frame for anybody to find! Just like Jerry! Signs his name to the business in letters a foot long, leaves it conspicuously about, and then goes away and is chivalrously silent!' Mr. Bunter put the jug down upon the washstand in case of accident, and took the paper. It was the missing letter from Tommy Freeborn. No doubt about it, there it was, the evidence which established the truth of Denver's evidence. More, which established his alibi for the night of the 13th. Not Cathcart. Denver. Denver, suggesting that the shooting party should return in October to Riddlesdale, where they had opened the grouse season in August. Denver, sneaking hurriedly out at 11.30 to walk two miles across the fields on a night when Farmer Grimethorpe had gone to buy machinery. Denver, carelessly plugging a rattling sash on a stormy night with an important letter bearing his title on it for all to see. Denver, padding back at three in the morning like a homing tomcat to fall over his guest's dead body by the conservatory. Denver, with his kind, stupid, English gentleman ideas about honor, going obstinately off to prison rather than tell his solicitor where he had been. Denver, misleading them all into the wildest and most ingenious solutions of a mystery which now stood out clear as seven sunbeams. 
Denver, whose voice the woman had thought she recognized, on the memorable day when she flung herself into the arms of his brother. Denver, calmly setting in motion the enormous, creaking machinery of a trial by his noble peers, in order to safeguard a woman's reputation. This very day, probably, a select committee of lords was sitting to inspect the journals of this house upon former trials of peers in criminal cases in order to bring the duke of denver to a speedy trial and to report to the house what they should think proper thereupon there they were moving that an address be presented to his majesty by the lords with white staves to acquaint his majesty of the date proposed for the trial arranging for fitting up the royal gallery at westminster humbly requesting the attendance of a sufficient police force to keep clear the approaches leading to the house petitioning his majesty graciously to appoint a lord high steward ordering in sheep-like accordance with precedent that all lords be summoned to attend in their robes, that every lord, in giving judgment, disclose his opinion upon his honour, laying his right hand upon his heart, that the sergeant-at-arms be within the house to make proclamations in the king's name for keeping silence, and so on and on unendingly. And there jammed in the window-sash was the dirty little bit of paper which discovered earlier would have made the whole monstrous ceremonial unnecessary whimsy's adventure in the bog had unsettled his nerves he sat down on the bed and laughed with the tears streaming down his face mr bunter was speechless speechlessly he produced a razor and to the end of his days whimsy never knew how or from whom he had so adequately procured it and began to strop it thoughtfully upon the palm of his hand presently whimsy pulled himself together and staggered to the window for a little cooling draught of more air as he did so a loud hullabaloo smote his ear and he perceived in the courtyard below farmer grimethorpe striding among his dogs when they howled he struck at them with a whip and they howled again suddenly he glanced up at the window with an expression of such livid hatred that whimsy stepped hurriedly back as though struck while bunter shaved him he was silent the interview before lord peter was a delicate one the situation, however one looked at it, unpleasant. He was under a considerable debt of gratitude to his hostess. On the other hand, Denver's position was such that minor considerations really had to go to the wall. His lordship had, nevertheless, never felt quite such a cad as he did while descending the staircase at Grider's Hole. In the big farm kitchen he found a stout countrywoman stirring a pot of stew. He asked for Mr. Grimethorpe, and was told that he had gone out. "'Can I speak to Mrs. Grimethorpe, please?' The woman looked doubtfully at him, wiped her hands on her apron, and, going into the scullery, shouted, "'Mrs. Grimethorpe!' a voice replied from somewhere outside. "'Gentleman wants to see the—' "'Where is Mrs. Grinthorpe? broke in Peter, hurriedly. "'Into Derry, I reckon. "'I'll go to her there,' said Whimsy, stepping briskly out. "'He passed through a stone-paved scullery and across a yard, "'in time to see Mrs. Grimethorpe emerging from a dark doorway opposite. Framed there, the cold sunlight just lighting upon her still, dead-white face and heavy dark hair, she was more wonderful than ever. There was no trace of Yorkshire descent in the long, dark eyes and curled mouth. The curve of nose and cheekbones vouched for an origin immensely remote, 
coming out of the darkness she might have just risen from her far tomb in the pyramids dropping the dry and perfumed grave bands from her fingers lord peter pulled himself together foreign he said to himself matter-of-factly touch of jew perhaps or spanish is it remarkable type don't blame jerry couldn't live with helen myself now for it he advanced quickly good morning she said are you better perfectly all right thank you thanks to your kindness which i do not know how to repay you will repay any kindness best by going at once she answered in her remote voice my husband does not care for strangers and twas unfortunate the way you met before i will go directly but i must first beg for the favour of a word with you he peered past her into the dimness of the dairy in here perhaps what do you want with me she stepped back however and allowed him to follow her in mrs grimethorpe i am placed in a most painful position you know that my brother the duke of denver is in prison awaiting his trial for a murder which took place on the night of october thirteenth her face did not change i have heard so he has in the most decided manner refused to state where he was between eleven and three on that night his refusal has brought him into great danger of his life she looked at him steadily he feels bound in honour not to disclose his whereabouts though i know that if he chose to speak he could bring a witness to clear him he seems to be a very honourable man the cold voice wavered a trifle yes undoubtedly you will understand however that as his brother i am naturally anxious to have the matter put in its proper light i don't understand why you are telling me all this i suppose if the thing is disgraceful he doesn't want it known obviously but to us to his wife and young son and to his sister and myself his life and safety are matters of the first importance of more importance than his honour the secret is a disgraceful one in a sense and will give pain to his family but it would be an infinitely greater disgrace that he should be executed for murder the stigma in that case would involve all those who bear his name the shame of the truth will i fear in this very unjust society of ours rest more upon the witness to his alibi than upon himself can you in that case expect the witness to come forward to prevent the condemnation of an innocent man yes i think i may venture to expect even that i repeat why are you telling me all this because mrs grimthorpe you know even better than i how innocent my brother is of this murder believe me i am deeply distressed at having to say these things to you i know nothing about your brother forgive me that is not true i know nothing and surely if the duke will not speak you should respect his reasons i am not bound in any way i am afraid i cannot help you you are wasting time if you cannot produce your missing witness why do you not set about finding the real murderer if you do so you surely need not trouble about this alibi your brother's movements are his own business i could wish said whimsy you had not taken up this attitude believe me i would have done all i could to spare you i have been working hard to find as you say the real murderer but with no success the trial will probably take place at the end of the month her lips twitched a little at that but she said nothing i had hoped that with your help we might agree on some explanation less than the truth perhaps but sufficient to clear my brother 
as it is i fear i shall have to produce the proof i hold and let matters take their course that at last struck under her guard a dull flush crept up her cheeks one hand tightened upon the handle of the churn where she had rested it what do you mean by proof i can prove that on the night of the thirteenth my brother slept in the room i occupied last night said whimsy with calculated brutality she winced it is a lie you cannot prove it he will deny it i shall deny it he was not there no then how did this come to be wedged in the sash of the bedroom window at sight of the letter she broke down crumpling up in a heap against the table the set lines of her face distorted themselves into a mere caricature of terror no 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 it is a lie god help me hush said whimsy peremptorily someone will hear you he dragged her to her feet tell the truth and we will see if we can find a way out it is true he was here that night you know it when did he come at quarter past twelve who let him in he had the keys when did he leave you a little after two yes that fits in all right three quarters of an hour to go and three quarters to come back he stuck this into the window i suppose to keep it from rattling there was a high wind i was nervous i thought every sound was my husband coming back where was your husband at stapley had he suspected this yes for some time since my brother was here in august yes but he could get no proof if he had had proof he would have killed me you have seen him he is a devil hmm whimsy was silent the woman glanced fearfully at his face and seemed to read there some hope for she clutched him by the arm if you call me to give evidence she said he will know he will kill me for god's sake have pity that letter is my death warrant oh for the mother that bore you have mercy upon me my life is a hell and when i die i shall go to hell for my sin find some other way you can you must whimsy gently released himself don't do that mrs grimethorpe we might be seen i am deeply sorry for you and if i can get my brother out of this without bringing you in i promise you i will but you see the difficulty why don't you leave this man he is openly brutal to you she laughed do you think he'd leave me alive while the law was slowly releasing me knowing him do you think so whimsy really did not think so i will promise you this mrs grimthorpe i will do all i can to avoid having to use your evidence but if there should be no other way i will see that you have police protection from the moment that the subpoena is served on you and for the rest of my life when you are once in london we will see about freeing you from this man no if you call upon me i am a lost woman but you will find another way i will try but i can promise nothing i will do everything that is possible to protect you if you care at all for my brother i don't know i am so horribly afraid he was kind and good to me he was so different but i am afraid i'm afraid whimsy turned her terrified eyes had seen the shadow cross the threshold grimthorpe was at the door glowering in upon them ah mr grimthorpe 
exclaimed Wimsey cheerfully. There you are. Awfully pleased to see you, and thank you, don't you know, for putting me up. I was just saying so to Mrs. Grimethorpe, and asking her to say good-bye to you for me. Must be off now, I'm afraid. Bunter and I are ever so grateful to the stout fellows who hauled us out of that pot of yours last night, if it is yours. Nasty damp thing to keep outside the front door, what? I'd like to thank em. Dumb good thing for unwelcome guests, said the man ferociously. And I'd better be off before I throws thee out. I'm just off, said Peter. Good-bye again, Mrs. Grimthorpe, and a thousand thanks. He collected Bunter, rewarded his rescuers suitably, took an affectionate farewell of the enraged farmer, and departed, sore in body and desperately confused in mind. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Manon That one word, my dear Watson, should have told me the whole story had I been the ideal reasoner which you are so fond of depicting. Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes "'Thank God,' said Parker. "'Well, that settles it.' "'It does, and yet again it doesn't,' retorted Lord Peter. He leaned back against the fat silk cushion in the sofa corner meditatively. "'Of course, it's disagreeable having to give this woman away,' said Parker, sensibly and pleasantly. "'But these things have to be done.' I know, it's all simply awfully nice and all that. And Jerry, who's got the poor woman into this mess, has to be considered first, I know. And if we don't restrain Grimethorpe quite successfully, and he cuts her throat for her, it'll be simply ripping for Jerry to think of all his life. Jerry, I say, you know... What frightful idiots we were not to see the truth right off. I mean, of course, my sister-in-law is an awfully good woman and all that, but Mrs. Grimethorpe, phew, I told you about the time she mistook me for Jerry. One crowded split second of glorious all overishness. I ought to have known then. Our voices are alike, of course, and she could see in that dark kitchen. I don't believe there's any ounce of feeling left in the woman, except sheer terror. But, ye gods, what eyes and skin! Well, never mind, some undeserving fellows have all the luck. Have you got any really good stories? No? Well, I'll tell you some. Enlarge your mind and all that. Do you know the rhyme about the young man at the war office? Mr. Parker endured five stories with commendable patience, and then suddenly broke down. "'Hooray!' said Whimsy. "'Splendid man! I love to see you melt into a refined snigger from time to time. I'll spare you the really outrageous one about the young housewife and the traveller in bicycle pumps. You know, Charles, I really should like to know who did Cathcart in.' Legally, it's enough to prove Jerry innocent, but Mrs. Grimethorpe, or no Mrs. Grimethorpe, it doesn't do us credit in a professional capacity. The father weakens, but the governor is fixed. That is, as a brother I'm satisfied, I may say light-hearted, but as a sleuth I am cast down, humiliated, thrown back upon myself. A lodge in a garden of cucumbers. Besides, of all defences, an alibi is the most awkward to establish, unless a number of independent and disinterested witnesses combine to make it thoroughly airtight. If Jerry sticks to his denial, the most they can be sure of is that 
either he or mrs grinthorpe is being chivalrous but you've got the letter yes but how are we going to prove that it came that evening the envelope is destroyed fleming remembers nothing about it jerry might have received it days earlier or it might be a complete fake who's to say that i didn't put it in the window myself and pretend to find it after all i'm hardly what you would call disinterested bunter saw you find it he didn't charles at that precise moment he was out of the room fetching the shaving water oh was he moreover only mrs grimthorpe can swear to what is really the important point the moment of jerry's arrival and departure unless he was at grider's hold before twelve thirty at least it's immaterial whether he was there or not well said parker can't we keep mrs grimthorpe up our sleeve so to speak sounds a bit abandoned said lord peter but we will keep her with pleasure if you like and meanwhile pursued mr parker unheeding do our best to find the actual criminal oh yes said lord peter that reminds me i made a discovery at the lodge at least i think so did you notice that somebody had been forcing one of the study windows no really yes i found distinct marks of course it was a long time after the murder but there were scratches on the catch all right the sort of thing a penknife would leave what fools we were not to make an examination at the time come to think of it why should you have anyhow i asked fleming about it and he said he did remember now he came to think of it that on the thursday morning he'd found the window open and couldn't account for it and here's another thing i've had a letter from my friend tim watchett here it is my lord about our conversation i have found a man who was with the party in question at the pig and whistle on the night of the thirteenth alt and he tells me that the party borrowed his bicycle and same was found afterwards in the ditch where party was picked up with the handlebars bent and wheels buckled trusting to the continuance of your esteemed favor timothy watchett what do you think of that good enough to go on said parker at least we are no longer hampered with horrible doubts no and though she's my sister i must say that of all the blithering she asses mary is the blitheringest taking up with that awful bounder to start with she was jolly fine about it said mr parker getting rather red in the face it's just because she's your sister that you can't appreciate what a fine thing she did how should a big chivalrous nature like hers see through a man like that she's so sincere and thorough herself she judges every one by the same standard she wouldn't believe anybody could be so thin and wobbly-minded as goyle's till it was proved to her and even then she couldn't bring herself to think ill of him till he'd given himself away out of his own mouth it was wonderful the way she fought for him think what it must have meant to such a splendid straightforward woman to all right all right cried peter who had been staring at his friend transfixed with astonishment don't get worked up i believe you spare me i'm only a brother all brothers are fools all lovers are lunatics shakespeare says so do you want mary old man you surprise me but i believe brothers always are surprised bless you dear children damn it all whimsy said parker very angry you've no right to talk like that i only said how greatly i admired your sister every one must admire such pluck and staunchness 
you needn't be insulting. I know she's Lady Mary Whimsy and damnably rich, and I'm only a common police official with nothing a year and a pension to look forward to, but there's no need to sneer about it. I'm not sneering, retorted Peter indignantly. I can't imagine why anybody should want to marry my sister, but you're a friend of mine and a damn good sort, and you've my good word for what it's worth. Besides, Vashtal man, to put it on the lowest grounds, do look what it might have been. A socialist conchy of neither bowels nor breeding, or a card-sharping dark horse with a mysterious past. Mother and Jerry must have got to the point where they'd welcome a decent, God-fearing plumber, let alone a policeman. Only thing I'm afraid of is that Mary, having such beastly bad taste in blokes, won't know how to appreciate a really decent fellow like you, old son. Mr. Parker begged his friend's pardon for his unworthy suspicions, and they sat a little time in silence. Parker sipped his port and saw unimaginable visions warmly glowing in its rosy depths. Whimsy pulled out his pocketbook and began idly turning over its contents, throwing old letters into the fire, unfolding and refolding memoranda, and reviewing a miscellaneous series of other people's visiting cards. He came at length to the slip of blotting paper from the study at Riddlesdale, to whose fragmentary markings he had since given scarcely a thought. Presently Mr. Parker, finishing his porch and recalling his mind with an effort, remembered that he had been meaning to tell Peter something before the name of Lady Mary had driven all other thoughts out of his head. He turned to his host, open-mouthed for speech, but his remark never got beyond the preliminary click, like that of a clock about to strike. For even as he turned, Lord Peter brought his fist down on the little table with a bang that made the decanters ring, and cried out in the loud voice of complete and sudden enlightenment, "'Man, no, let's go!' "'Eh?' said Mr. Parker. "'Boil my brains!' said Lord Peter. "'Boil em and mash em and serve em up with butter as a dish of turnips, for it's damn well all they're fit for. Look at me!' Mr. Parker scarcely needed this exhortation. Here we've been worrying over Jerry and worrying over Mary and hunting for Goyleses and Grimethorpes and God knows who, and all the time I got this little bit of paper tucked away in my pocket. The blot upon the paper's rim a blotted paper was to him, and it was nothing more. But Manon, Manon, Charles, if I'd had the grey matter of a woodlouse, that book ought to have told me the whole story. And think what we'd have been saved. I wish you wouldn't be so excited, said Parker. I'm sure it's perfectly splendid for you to see your way so clearly, but I never read Manon Liskell, and you haven't shown me the blotting paper, and I haven't the foggiest idea what you've discovered. Lord Peter passed the relic over without comment. "'I observe,' said Parker, "'that the paper is rather crumpled and dirty, "'and smells powerfully of tobacco and Russian leather, "'and deduce that you've been keeping it in your pocket-book.' "'No,' said Whimsy incredulously. "'And when you actually saw me take it out, "'Holmes, how do you do it?' At one corner, pursued Parker, I see two blots, one rather larger than the other. I think someone must have shaken a pen there. Is there anything sinister about the blot? I haven't noticed anything. Some way below the blots, the Duke has signed his name two or three times, or rather his title. The inference is that his letters were not too intimates. The inference is justifiable, I fancy. Colonel Marchbanks has a neat signature. He 
"'He can hardly mean mischief,' said Peter. "'He signs his name like an honest man. Proceed.' "'There's a sprawly message about five-something of fine-something. "'Do you see anything occult there?' The number five may have a cabalistic meaning, but I admit I don't know what it is. There are five senses, five fingers, five great Chinese precepts, five books of Moses, to say nothing of the mysterious entities hymned in the Dilly song, five are the flamboys under the pole. I must admit that I have always panted to know what the five flamboys were, but not knowing i get no help from it in this case well that's all except a fragment consisting of o e on one line and is f o u below it what do you make of that is found i suppose do you that seems the simplest interpretation or possibly his foul there seems to have been a sudden rush of ink to the pen just there. Do you think it is his foul? Was the Duke writing about Cathcart's foul play? Is that what you mean? No, I don't make that of it. Besides, I don't think it's Jerry's writing. Whose is it? I don't know, but I can guess. And it leads somewhere? It tells the whole story. Oh, cough it up, Whimsy. Even Dr. Watson would lose patience. Tut, tut. Try the line above. Well, there's only O-E. Yes, well? Well, I don't know. Poet, poem, maneuver, lobe edition, citroen. Might be anything. To know about that... There aren't lashings of English words with O-E in them, and it's written so close, it almost looks like a diphthong at that. Perhaps it isn't an English word. Exactly. Perhaps it isn't. Oh, oh, I see. French? Ah, you're getting warm. Sœur, œuvre, œuf, boeuf? No, no, you were nearer the first time. Sir, coeur? Coeur. Hold on a moment. Look at the scratch in front of that. Wait a bit. Um, e R C E R. How about percé? I believe you're right. Percé le coeur. Yes, or percera le coeur. That's better. It seems to need another letter or two. And now your is found line. Foo. Who? I didn't say who. I said foo. I know you did. I said who. Who? Who is foo? Oh, is. By Jove. Sui. Je suis foo. A la bonne heure, and I suggest that the next words are de douleur, or something like that. They might be. Cautious beast, I say they are. Well, and suppose they are. It tells us everything. Nothing. Everything, I say. Think. This was written on the day Cathcart died. Now who in the house would be likely to write these words? Père sera le cœur, je suis fou de douleur. Take everybody. I know it isn't Jerry's fist, and he wouldn't use those expressions. Colonel or Mrs. Marchbanks? Not Pygmalion likely. Freddy couldn't write a passionate letter in French to save his life. No, no, of course not. It would have to be either Cathcart or Lady Mary. Rot. It couldn't be Mary. Why not? Not unless she changed her sex, you know. Of course not. It would have to be Je suis folle. Then Cathcart. 
of course he lived in france all his life consider his bank book consider look whimsy we've been blind yes and listen i was going to tell you this the sûreté write me that they've traced one of cathcart's bank notes where to to a monsieur francois who owns a lot of house property near the Etoile, and lets it out in appartement no doubt when's the next train bunter my lord mr bunter hurried to the door at the call the next boat train for paris eight twenty my lord from waterloo we're going by it how long twenty minutes my lord pack my toothbrush and call a taxi certainly my lord but whimsy what light does it throw on cathcart's murder did this woman i've no time said whimsy hurriedly but i'll be back in a day or two meanwhile he hunted hastily in the bookshelf read this he flung the book at his friend and plunged into his bedroom at eleven o'clock as a gap of dirty water disfigured with oil and bits of paper widened between the normania and the quay while hardened passengers fortified their sea stomachs with cold ham and pickles and the more nervous studied the body jackets in their cabins while the harbour lights winked and swam right and left and lord peter scraped acquaintance with a second-rate cinema actor in the bar charles parker sat with a puzzled frown before the fire at one ten a piccadilly making his first acquaintance with the delicate masterpiece of the abbe prevost End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Edge of the Axe Towards Him. Scene 1 Westminster Hall. Enter as to the Parliament Bolingbroke, O'Merrill, Northumberland, Percy, Fitzwater, Surrey, the Bishop of Carlisle, the Abbot of Westminster and another lord herald officers and bagot bolingbroke call forth bagot now bagot freely speak thy mind what dost thou know of noble gloucester's death who wrought it with the king and who performed the bloody office of his timeless end bagot then set before my face the lord omero King Richard the Second. The historic trial of the Duke of Denver for murder opened as soon as Parliament reassembled after the Christmas vacation. The papers had leaderettes on trial by his peers, by a woman barrister, and the privilege of peers should it be abolished by a student of history. The evening banner got into trouble for contempt by publishing an article entitled The Silken Rope by an antiquarian, which was deemed to be prejudicial, and the Daily Trumpet, the labor organ, inquired sarcastically why, when a peer was tried, the fun of seeing the show should be reserved to the few influential persons who could wangle tickets for the Royal Gallery. Mr. Murbles and Detective Inspector Parker in close consultation, went about with preoccupied faces, while Sir Impey Biggs retired into a complete eclipse for three days, revolved about by Mr. Glibbery, K.C., Mr. Brownrigg Fortescue, K.C., and a number of lesser satellites. The schemes of the defense were kept dark indeed, the more so that they found themselves on the eve of the struggle deprived of their principal witness and wholly ignorant whether or not he would be forthcoming with his testimony 
Lord Peter had returned from Paris at the end of four days, and had burst in like a cyclone at Great Ormond Street. "'I've got it,' he said. "'But it's touch and go. Listen.' For an hour Parker had listened, feverishly taking notes. "'You can work on that,' said Whimsy. "'Tell Murbles I'm off.' His next appearance was at the American Embassy. The ambassador, however, was not there, having received a royal mandate to dine. Whimsy damned the dinner, abandoned the polite horn-rimmed secretaries, and leapt back into his taxi with a demand to be driven to Buckingham Palace. Here a great deal of insistence with scandalized officials produced first a higher official, then a very high official, and, finally, the American ambassador and a royal personage, while the meat was yet in their mouths. "'Oh, yes,' said the ambassador. "'Of course it can be done.' "'Surely, surely,' said the personage, genially. "'We mustn't have any delay. "'Might cause an international misunderstanding "'and a lot of paragraphs about Ellis Island. "'Terrible nuisance to have to adjourn the trial. "'Dreadful fuss, isn't it? "'Our secretaries are everlastingly bringing things along "'to our place to sign about extra policemen "'and seating accommodation. "'Good luck to you, Whimsy. "'Come and have something while they get your papers through. "'When does your boat go?' "'Tomorrow morning, sir. I'm catching the Liverpool train in an hour, if I can.' "'You surely will,' said the ambassador cordially, signing a note. "'And they say the English can't hustle.' So, with his papers all in order, his lordship set sail from Liverpool the next morning, leaving his legal representatives to draw up alternative schemes of defence. Then the peers, two by two, in their order, beginning with the youngest baron. Carter, king of arms, very hot and bothered, fussed unhappily around the three hundred or so British peers who were sheepishly struggling into their robes, while the heralds did their best to line up the assembly and keep them from wandering away when once arranged. Of all the farces, grumbled Lord Attenbury irritably. He was a very short, stout gentleman of a choleric countenance, and was annoyed to find himself next to the Earl of Strathgillan and Begg, an extremely tall, lean nobleman, with pronounced views on prohibition and the legitimation question. "'I say, Attenbury,' said a kindly brick-red peer, with five rows of ermine on his shoulder, is it true that Whimsy hasn't come back? My daughter tells me she heard he'd gone to collect evidence in the States. Why the States? Dunno, said Attenbury. But Whimsy's a dashed clever fellow. When he found those emeralds of mine, you know, I said, Your Grace, Your Grace, cried Rouge Dragon desperately, diving in. Your Grace is out of line again. A eh, what? said the brick-faced peer. Oh, dammy, must obey orders, I suppose, what? And was towed away from the mere earls, and pushed into position next to the Duke of Wiltshire, who was deaf, and a distant connection of Denver's on the distaff side. The royal gallery was packed. In the seats reserved below the bar for peeresses sat the Dowager Duchess of Denver, beautifully dressed and defiant. She suffered much from the adjacent presence of her daughter-in-law, whose misfortune it was to become disagreeable when she was unhappy, perhaps the heaviest curse that can be laid on man who is born to sorrow. Behind the imposing array of counsel, in full-bottomed wigs, in the body of the hall, were seats reserved for witnesses, and here Mr. Bunter was accommodated, to be called if the defence should find it necessary to establish the alibi, the majority of the witnesses being pent up in the king's robing-room, 
gnawing their fingers and glaring at one another. On either side, above the bar, were the benches for the peers, each in his own right a judge both of fact and law, while on the high dais the great chair of state stood ready for the Lord High Steward. The reporters at their little table were beginning to fidget and look at their watches. Muffled by the walls and the buzz of talk, Big Ben dropped eleven slow notes into the suspense. A door opened. The reporters started to their feet. Council rose. Everybody rose. The Dowager Duchess whispered irrepressibly to her neighbor that it reminded her of the voice that breathed o'er Eden, and the procession streamed slowly in, lit by a shaft of wintry sunshine from the tall windows. The proceedings were opened by a proclamation of silence from the sergeant-at-arms, after which the clerk of the crown in chancery, kneeling at the foot of the throne, presented the commission under the great seal to the Lord High Steward, who, finding no use for it, returned it with great solemnity to the clerk of the crown. The latter accordingly proceeded to read it at dismal and wearisome length, affording the assembly an opportunity of judging just how bad the acoustics of the chamber were. The sergeant-at-arms retorted with a great emphasis, God save the king! Whereupon, Garter, king of arms, and the gentleman usher of the black rod, kneeling again, handed the Lord High Steward his staff of office. So picturesque, isn't it? said the dowager. Quite high church, you know. The certio rari and return followed in a long, sonorous rigmarole, which, starting with George V by the grace of God, called upon all the justices and judges of the Old Bailey, enumerated the Lord Mayor of London, the Recorder, and a quantity of assorted aldermen and justices, skipped back to our Lord the King, roamed about the city of London, counties of London and Middlesex, Essex, Kent, and Surrey, mentioned our late Sovereign Lord King William the Fourth, branched off to the Local Government Act 1888, lost its way in a list of treasons, murders, felonies, and misdemeanors, by whomsoever and in what manner soever done, committed, or perpetrated, and by whom or to whom, when, how, and after what manner, and of all other articles and circumstances concerning the premises, and every one of them, and any of them, in any manner whatsoever. And, at last, triumphantly, after reciting the names of the whole grand jury, came to the presentation of the indictment with a sudden brutal brevity. The jurors for our lord the king upon their oaths present that the most noble and puissant prince Gerald Christian Whimsey, Viscount St. George, Duke of Denver, a peer of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, on the thirteenth day of October, in the year of our Lord, one thousand nine hundred and twenty-three, in the parish of Riddlesdale, in the county of Yorkshire, did kill and murder Dennis Cathcart. After which proclamation was made by the sergeant-at-arms for the gentleman usher of the black rod to call in Gerald Christian Whimsey, Viscount St. George, Duke of Denver, to appear at the bar to answer his indictment, who, being come to the bar, kneeled until the Lord High Steward acquainted him that he might rise. The Duke of Denver looked very small and pink and lonely in his blue serge suit, the only head uncovered among all his peers. But he was not without a certain dignity, as he was conducted to the stool placed within the bar, which is deemed appropriate to noble prisoners, and he listened to the Lord High Steward's rehearsal of the charge with a simple gravity which became him very well. 
then the said duke of denver was arraigned by the clerk of the parliaments in the usual manner and asked whether he was guilty or not guilty to which he pleaded not guilty whereupon sir wigmore rinching the attorney-general rose to open the case for the crown after the usual preliminaries to the effect that the case was a very painful one and the occasion a very solemn one sir wigmore proceeded to unfold the story from the beginning the quarrel the shot at three a m the pistol the finding of the body the disappearance of the letter and the rest of the familiar tale he hinted moreover that evidence would be called to show that the quarrel between denver and cathcart had motives other than those alleged by the prisoner and that the latter would turn out to have had good reason to fear exposure at cathcart's hands at which point the accused was observed to glance uneasily at his solicitor the exposition took only a short time and sir wigmore proceeded to call witnesses the prosecution being unable to call the duke of denver the first important witness was lady mary whimsey after telling about her relations with the murdered man and describing the quarrel at three o'clock she proceeded i got up and went downstairs in consequence of what did you do so inquired sir wigmore looking round the court with the air of a man about to produce his great effect in consequence of an appointment i had made to meet a friend all the reporters looked up suddenly like dogs expecting a piece of biscuit and sir wigmore started so violently that he knocked his brief over upon the head of the clerk to the house of lords sitting below him indeed now witness remember you are on your oath and be very careful what was it caused you to wake at three o'clock i was not asleep i was waiting for my appointment and while you were waiting did you hear anything nothing at all now lady mary i have here your deposition sworn before the coroner i will read it to you please listen very carefully you say at three o'clock i was wakened by a shot i thought it might be poachers it sounded very loud close to the house i went down to find out what it was do you remember making that statement yes but it was not true not true no in the face of that statement you still say that you heard nothing at three o'clock i heard nothing at all i went down because i had an appointment my lords said sir wigmore with a very red face i must ask leave to treat this witness as a hostile witness sir wigmore's fiercest onslaught however produced no effect except a reiteration of the statement that no shot had been heard at any time with regard to the finding of the body lady mary explained that when she said oh god gerald you've killed him she was under the impression that the body was that of the friend who had made the appointment here a fierce wrangle ensued as to whether the story of the appointment was relevant the lords decided that on the whole it was relevant and the entire goyle's story came out together with the information that mr goyle's was in court and could be produced eventually with a loud snort sir wigmore rinching gave up the witness to sir impey biggs who rising suavely and looking extremely handsome brought back the discussion to a point long previous forgive the nature of the question said sir impey bowing blandly but will you tell us whether in your opinion 
the late Captain Cathcart, was deeply in love with you? No, I am sure he was not. It was an arrangement for our mutual convenience. From your knowledge of his character, do you suppose he was capable of a very deep affection? I think he might have been for the right woman. I should say he had a very passionate nature. Thank you. You have told us that you met Captain Cathcart several times when you were staying in Paris last February. Do you remember going with him to a jeweler's, Monsieur Briquet's, in the Rue de la Paix? I may have done. I cannot exactly remember. The date to which I should like to draw your attention is the sixth. I could not say. Do you recognize this trinket? Here the green-eyed cat was handed to witness. No, I have never seen it before. Did Captain Cathcart ever give you one like it? Never. Did you ever possess such a jewel? I am quite positive I never did. My lords, I put in this diamond and platinum cat. Thank you, Lady Mary. James Fleming, being questioned closely as to the delivery of the post, continued to be vague and forgetful, leaving the court on the whole with the impression that no letter had ever been delivered to the Duke. Sir Wigmore, whose opening speech had contained sinister allusions to an attempt to blacken the character of the victim, smiled disagreeably and handed the witness over to Sir Imby. The latter contented himself with extracting an admission that witness could not swear positively one way or the other, and passed on immediately to another point. Do you recollect whether any letters came by the same post for any of the other members of the party? Yes, I took three or four into the billiard room. Can you say to whom they were addressed? There were several for Colonel Marchbanks, and one for Captain Cathcart. Did Captain Cathcart open his letter there and then? I couldn't say, sir. I left the room immediately to take his grace's letters to the study. Now, will you tell us how the letters are collected for the post in the morning at the lodge? They are put into the post bag, which is locked. His Grace keeps one key, and the post office has the other. The letters are put in through a slit in the top. On the morning after Captain Cathcart's death, were the letters taken to the post as usual? Yes, sir. By whom? I took the bag down myself, sir. Had you an opportunity of seeing what letters were in it? I saw there was two or three there when the postmistress took em out of the bag, but I couldn't say who they was addressed to or anything of that. Thank you. Sir Wigmore Rinching here bounced up like a very irritable jack-in-the-box. Is this the first time you have mentioned this letter which you say you delivered to Captain Cathcart on the night of his murder? My lords cried Sir Impey. I protest against this language. We have as yet had no proof that any murder was committed. This was the first indication of the line of defense which Sir Impey proposed to take, and caused a little rustle of excitement. My lords, went on counsel, replying to a question of the Lord High Steward, I submit that so far there has been no attempt to prove murder, and that, until the prosecution have established the murder, such a word cannot properly be put into the mouth of a witness. Perhaps, Sir Wigmore, it would be better to use some other word? It makes no difference to our case, my lord. I bow to your lordship's decision." Heaven knows that I would not seek, even by the lightest or most trivial word, to hamper the defence on so serious a charge. My lords, interjected Sir Impey, 
if the learned attorney-general considers the word murder to be a triviality it would be interesting to know to what words he does attach importance the learned attorney-general has agreed to substitute another word said the lord high steward soothingly and nodding to sir wigmore to proceed sir impey having achieved his purpose of robbing the attorney-general's onslaught on the witness of some of its original impetus sat down and sir wigmore repeated his question i mentioned it first to mr murbles about three weeks ago mr murbles is the solicitor for the accused i believe yes sir and how was it inquired sir wigmore ferociously settling his pince-nez on his rather prominent nose and glowering at the witness that you did not mention this letter at the inquest or at the earlier proceedings in the case i wasn't asked about it sir what made you suddenly decide to go and tell mr murbles about it he asked me sir oh he asked you and you conveniently remembered it when it was suggested to you no sir i remembered it all the time that is to say i hadn't given any special thought to it sir oh you remembered it at the time though you hadn't given any thought to it now i put it to you that you had not remembered about it at all till it was suggested to you by mr murbles mr murbles didn't suggest nothing sir he asked me whether any other letters came by that post and then i remembered it exactly when it was suggested to you you remembered it and not before no sir that is if i'd been asked before i should have remembered it and mentioned it but not being asked i didn't think it would be of any importance sir you didn't think it of any importance that this man received a letter a few hours before his decease no sir i reckoned if it had been of any importance the police would have asked about it sir now james fleming i put it to you again that it never occurred to you that captain cathcart might have received a letter the night he died till the idea was put into your head by the defence the witness baffled by this interrogative negative made a confused reply and sir wigmore glancing round the house as much as to say you see this shifty fellow proceeded i suppose it didn't occur to you either to mention to the police about the letters in the post-bag no sir why not i didn't think it was my place sir did you think about it at all no sir do you ever think no i mean yes sir then will you please think what you are saying now yes sir you say that you took all these important letters out of the house without authority and without acquainting the police i had my orders sir from whom they was his grace's orders sir ah his grace's orders when did you get that order it was part of my regular duty sir to take the bag to the post each morning and did it not occur to you that in a case like this the proper information of the police might be more important than your orders no sir sir wigmore sat down with a disgusted look and sir impey took the witness in hand again did the thought of this letter delivered to captain cathcart never pass through your mind between the day of the death and the day when mr murbles spoke to you about it well it did pass through my mind in a manner of speaking sir when was that before the grand jury sir and how was it you didn't speak about it then 
the gentleman said i was to confine myself to the questions and not say nothing on my own sir who was this very peremptory gentleman the lawyer that came down to ask questions for the crown sir thank you said sir impey smoothly sitting down and leaning over to say something apparently of an amusing nature to mr glibbery the question of the letter was further pursued in the examination of the honourable freddy sir wigmore rinching laid great stress upon this witness's assertion that deceased had been in excellent health and spirits when retiring to bed on the wednesday evening and had spoken of his approaching marriage he seemed particularly cheerio you know said the honourable freddy particularly what inquired the lord high steward cheerio my lord said sir wigmore with a deprecatory bow i do not know whether this is a dictionary word said his lordship entering it upon his notes with meticulous exactness but i take it to be synonymous with cheerful the honourable freddy appealed to said he thought he meant more than just cheerful more merry and bright you know may we take it that he was in exceptionally lively spirits suggested counsel take it in any spirit you like muttered the witness adding more happily take a peg of john begg the deceased was particularly lively and merry when he went to bed said sir wigmore frowning horribly and looking forward to his marriage in the near future would that be a fair statement of his condition the honourable freddy agreed to this sir impey did not cross-examine as to witnesses account of the quarrel but went straight to his point do you recollect anything about the letters that were brought in the night of the death yes i had one from my aunt the colonel had some i fancy and there was one for cathcart did captain cathcart read his letter there and then no i'm sure he didn't you see i opened mine and then i saw he was shoving his away in his pocket and i thought never mind what you thought said sir impey what did you do i said excuse me you don't mind do you and he said not at all but he didn't read his and i remember thinking we can't have that you know said the lord high steward but that's why i'm so sure he didn't open it said the honourable freddy hurt you see i said to myself at the time what a secretive fellow he was and that's how i know sir wigmore who had bounced up with his mouth open sat down again thank you mr arbuthnot said sir impey smiling colonel and mrs marchbanks testified to having heard movements in the duke's study at eleven thirty they had heard no shot or other noise there was no cross-examination mr pettigrew robinson gave a vivid account of the quarrel and asserted very positively that there could be no mistaking the sound of the duke's bedroom door we were then called up by mr arbuthnot at a little after three a m proceeded witness and went down to the conservatory where i saw the accused and mr arbuthnot washing the face of the deceased i had pointed out to them what an unwise thing it was to do this as they might be destroying valuable evidence for the police they paid no attention to me there were a number of footmarks round about the door which i wanted to examine because it was my theory that my lords cried sir impey we really cannot have this witness's theory certainly not said the lord high steward answer the questions please and don't add anything on your own account of course said mr pettigrew robinson i don't mean to imply that there was anything wrong about it but i considered 
never mind what you considered attend to me please when you first saw the body how was it lying on its back with denver and arbuthnot washing its face it had evidently been turned over because sir wigmore interposed the lord high steward you really must control your witness kindly confine yourself to the evidence said sir wigmore rather heated we do not want your deductions from it you say that when you saw the body it was lying on its back is that correct and denver and arbuthnot were washing it yes now i want to pass to another point do you remember an occasion when you lunched at the royal automobile club i do i lunched there one day in the middle of last august i think it was about the sixteenth or seventeenth will you tell us what happened on that occasion i had gone into the smoking-room after lunch and was reading in a high-backed armchair when i saw the prisoner at the bar come in with the late captain cathcart that is to say i saw them in the big mirror over the mantelpiece they did not notice there was any one there or they would have been a little more careful what they said i fancy they sat down near me and started talking and presently cathcart leaned over and said something in a low tone which i couldn't catch the prisoner leapt up with a horrified face exclaiming for god's sake don't give me away cathcart there'd be the devil to pay cathcart said something reassuring i didn't hear what he had a furtive sort of voice and the prisoner replied well don't that's all i couldn't afford to let anybody get hold of it the prisoner seemed greatly alarmed captain cathcart was laughing they dropped their voices again and that was all i heard thank you sir impey took over the witness with a belial like politeness you are gifted with very excellent powers of observation and deduction mr pettigrew robinson he began and no doubt you like to exercise your sympathetic imagination in a scrutiny of people's motives and characters i think i may call myself a student of human nature replied mr pettigrew robinson much mollified doubtless people are inclined to confide in you certainly i may say i am a great repository of human documents on the night of captain cathcart's death your wide knowledge of the world was doubtless of great comfort and assistance to the family they did not avail themselves of my experience sir said mr pettigrew robinson exploding suddenly i was ignored completely if only my advice had been taken at the time thank you thank you said sir impey cutting short an impatient exclamation from the attorney-general who thereupon rose and demanded if captain cathcart had had any secret or trouble of any kind in his life you would have expected him to tell you about it from any right-minded young man i might certainly have expected it said mr pettigrew robinson blusteringly but captain cathcart was disagreeably secretive on the only occasion when i showed a friendly interest in his affairs he was very rude indeed he called me that'll do interposed sir wigmore hastily the answer to the question not having turned out as he expected what the deceased called you is immaterial mr pettigrew robinson retired leaving behind him the impression of a man with a grudge an impression which seemed to please mr glibbery and mr brownrigg fortescue extremely for they chuckled continuously through the evidence of the next two witnesses mrs pettigrew robinson had little to add to her previous evidence at the inquest 
Miss Cathcart was asked by Sir Impey about Cathcart's parentage, and explained, with deep disapproval in her voice, that her brother, when an all-too-experienced and middle-aged man of the world, had nevertheless been entangled by an Italian singer of nineteen, who had contrived to make him marry her. Eighteen years later, both parents had died. "'No wonder,' said Miss Cathcart, "'with the rackety life they led, "'and the boy had been left to her care. "'She explained how Dennis had always chafed at her influence, "'gone about with men she disapproved of, "'and eventually gone to Paris "'to make a diplomatic career for himself, "'since which time she had hardly seen him.' An interesting point was raised in the cross-examination of Inspector Crakes. A penknife being shown him, he identified it as the one found on Cathcart's body. By Mr. Glibbery. Do you observe any marks on the blade? Yes, there is a slight notch near the handle. Might the mark have been caused by forcing back the catch of a window? Inspector Crakes agreed that it might, but doubted whether so small a knife would have been adequate for such a purpose. The revolver was produced, and the question of ownership raised. "'My lords,' put in Sir Impey, "'we do not dispute the Duke's ownership of the revolver.' The court looked surprised, and, after Hardraw the gamekeeper had given evidence of the shot, Heard at 11.50, the medical evidence was taken. Sir Impey Biggs. Could the wound have been self-inflicted? It could, certainly. Would it have been instantly fatal? No. From the amount of blood found upon the path, it was obviously not immediately fatal. Are the marks found, in your opinion, consistent with deceased having crawled towards the house? Yes, quite. He might have had sufficient strength to do so. Would such a wound cause fever? It is quite possible. He might have lost consciousness for some time, and contracted a chill and fever by lying in the wet. Are the appearances consistent with his having lived for some hours after being wounded? They strongly suggest it. Re-examining, Sir Wigmore Winching established that the wound and general appearance of the ground were equally consistent with the theory that deceased had been shot by another hand at very close quarters and dragged to the house before life was extinct. In your experience, is it more usual for a person committing suicide to shoot himself in the chest or in the head? In the head is perhaps more usual, so much as almost to create a presumption of murder when the wound is in the chest. I would not go so far as that. But, other things being equal, you would say that a wound in the head is more suggestive of suicide than a body wound? That is so. Sir Impey Biggs. But suicide by shooting in the heart is not by any means impossible. Oh, dear, no. There have been such cases. Oh, certainly many such there is nothing in the medical evidence before you to exclude the idea of suicide? Nothing whatever. This closed the case for the Crown. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bar Falling Copyright by Reuter Press Association Exchange Telegraph and Central News When Sir Impey Biggs rose to make his opening speech for the defense on the second day, it was observed that he looked somewhat worried. 
a thing very unusual in him. His remarks were very brief, yet in those few words he sent a thrill through the great assembly. My lords, in rising to open this defence, I find myself in a more than usually anxious position. Not that I have any doubt of your lordship's verdict. Never, perhaps, has it been possible so clearly to prove the innocence of any accused person as in the case of my noble client. But I will explain to your lordships at once that I may be obliged to ask for an adjournment, since we are at present without an important witness and a decisive piece of evidence. My lords, I hold here in my hand a cablegram from this witness. I will tell you his name. It is Lord Peter Wimsey, the brother of the accused. It was handed in yesterday at New York. I will read it to you. He says, Evidence secured, leaving to-night with Air Pilot Grant. Sworn copy and depositions follow by S.S. Lucarnia in case accident. Hope arrive Thursday. My lords, at this moment, this all-important witness is cleaving the air high above the wide Atlantic. In this wintry weather, he is braving a peril which would appall any heart but his own, and that of the world-famous aviator, whose help he has enlisted, so that no moment may be lost in freeing his noble brother from this terrible charge. My lords, the barometer is falling. An immense hush, like the stillness of a black frost, had fallen over the glittering benches. The lords, in their scarlet and ermine, the peeresses, in their rich furs, council, in their full-bottomed wigs and billowing gowns, the Lord High Steward, upon his high seat, the ushers and heralds and the gaudy kings of arms, rested rigid in their places. Only the prisoner looked across at his council, and back to the Lord High Steward in a kind of bewilderment, and the reporters scribbled wildly and desperately stop-press announcements, lurid headlines, picturesque epithets, and alarming weather predictions, to halt hurrying London on its way. Piers' son flies Atlantic, brother's devotion, Will Whimsy be in time? Riddlesdale murder charge. Amazing development. This was news. A million tape machines ticked it out in offices and clubs, where clerks and messenger boys gloated over it and laid wagers on the result. The thousands of monster printing presses sucked it in, boiled it into lead, champed it into slugs, engulfed it in their huge maws, digested it to paper, and flapped it forth again with clutching talons. And a blue-nosed, ragged veteran, who had once assisted to dig Major Whimsy out of a shell-hole near Caudry, muttered, "'God help him! He's a real decent little blighter!' as he tucked his newspapers into the iron grill of a tree in Kingsway, and displayed his placard to the best advantage. After a brief statement that he intended not merely to prove his noble client's innocence, but, as a work of supererogation, to make clear every detail of the tragedy, Sir Impey Biggs proceeded, without further delay, to call his witnesses. Among the first was Mr. Goyles, who testified that he had found Cathcart already dead at 3 a.m., with his head close to the water trough which stood near the well. 
Ellen, the maid-servant, next confirmed James Fleming's evidence with regard to the post-bag, and explained how she changed the blotting-paper in the study every day. The evidence of Detective Inspector Parker aroused more interest and some bewilderment. His description of the discovery of the green-eyed cat was eagerly listened to. He also gave a minute account of the footprints and marks of dragging, especially the imprint of a hand in the flower-bed. The piece of blotting-paper was then produced, and photographs of it circulated among the peers. A long discussion ensued on both these points, Sir Impey Biggs endeavouring to show that the imprint on the flower-bed was such as would have been caused by a man endeavouring to lift himself from a prone position, Sir Wigmore Rinching doing his best to force an admission that it might have been made by deceased in trying to prevent himself from being dragged along. The position of the fingers being towards the house appears, does it not, to negative the suggestion of dragging, suggested Sir Impey. Sir Wigmore, however, put it to the witness that the wounded man might have been dragged head foremost. If now, said Sir Wigmore, I were to drag you by the coat collar, my lords will grasp my contention. It appears, observed the Lord High Steward, to be a case for solvitur ambulando. Laughter. I suggest that when the house rises for lunch, some of us should make the experiment, choosing a member of similar height and weight to the deceased. All the noble lords looked round at one another to see which unfortunate might be chosen for the part. Inspector Parker then mentioned the marks of forcing on the study window. In your opinion, could the catch have been forced back by the knife found on the body of the deceased? I know it could, for I made the experiment myself with a knife of exactly similar pattern. After this, the message on the blotting paper was read backwards and forwards, and interpreted in every possible way, the defence insisting that the language was French, and the words, Je suis fou de douleur, the prosecution scouting the suggestion as far-fetched, and offering an English interpretation such as is found, or his foul. A handwriting expert was then called, who compared the handwriting with that of an authentic letter of Cathcart's, and was subsequently severely handled by the prosecution. These knotty points being left for the consideration of the noble lords, the defence then called a tedious series of witnesses. The manager of Cox's and Monsieur Tourgeot of the Crédit Lyonnais, who went with much detail into Cathcart's financial affairs, the concierge and Madame Leblanc from the Rue Saint-Honoré, and the noble lords began to yawn, with the exception of a few of the soap-and-pickle lords, who suddenly started to make computations in their notebooks, and exchanged looks of intelligence, as from one financier to another. Then came Monsieur Briquet, the jeweller from the Rue de la Paix, and the girl from his shop, who told the story of the tall, fair, foreign lady, and the purchase of the green-eyed cat, whereat everybody woke up. After reminding the assembly that this incident took place in February, when Cathcart's fiancée was in Paris, Sir Impey invited the jeweller's assistant to look round the house, and tell them if she saw the foreign lady. This proved a lengthy business, but the answer was finally in the negative. "'I do not want there to be any doubt about this,' said Sir Impey, 
and with the learned attorney-general's permission i am now going to confront this witness with lady mary whimsey lady mary was accordingly placed before the witness who replied immediately and positively no this is not the lady i have never seen this lady in my life there is the resemblance of height and colour and the hair bobbed but there is nothing else at all not the least in the world it is not the same type at all mademoiselle is a charming english lady and the man who marries her will be very happy but the other was belle à se suicider a woman to kill suicide oneself or send all to the devil for and believe me gentlemen with a wide smile to her distinguished audience we have the opportunity to see them in my business there was a profound sensation as this witness took her departure and sir impey scribbled a note and passed it down to Merville's. it contained one word magnificent mr Merville's scribbled back never said a word to her can you beat it and leaned back in his seat smirking like a very neat little grotesque from a gothic corbel the witness who followed was professor hebert a distinguished exponent of international law who described cathcart's promising career as a rising young diplomat in paris before the war he was followed by a number of officers who testified to the excellent war record of the deceased. Then came a witness who gave the aristocratic name of dubois Gobéoudin, who perfectly recollected a very uncomfortable dispute on a certain occasion when playing cards with le capitaine Cathcart, and having subsequently mentioned the matter to Monsieur Thomas Freeborn, the distinguished English engineer. It was Parker's diligence that had unearthed this witness, and he looked across with an undisguised grin at the discomfited Sir Wigmore Rinching. When Mr. Glibbery had dealt with all these, the afternoon was well advanced, and the Lord High Steward accordingly asked the Lords if it was their pleasure that the house be adjourned till the next day at ten-thirty of the clock in the forenoon and the lords replying ay in a most exemplary chorus the house was accordingly adjourned a scurry of swift black clouds with ragged edges was driving bleakly westward as they streamed out into parliament square and the seagulls screeched and wheeled inwards from the river Charles Parker wrapped his ancient Burberry closely about him as he scrambled on to a bus to get home to Great Ormond Street. It was only one more drop in his cup of discomfort that the conductor greeted him with, Outside only, and rang the bell before he could get off again. He climbed to the top and sat there holding his hat on. Mr. Bunter returned sadly to 110A Piccadilly, and wandered restlessly about the flat till seven o'clock, when he came into the sitting-room and switched on the loudspeaker. "'London calling,' said the unseen voice impartially. "'To L.O. calling. Here is the weather forecast. A deep depression is crossing the Atlantic and a secondary is stationary over the british isles storms with heavy rain and sleet will be prevalent rising to a gale in the south and southwest you never know said bunter i suppose i'd better light a fire in his bedroom further outlook similar End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. THE SECOND STRING Oh, when he came to broken briggs, he bent his bow and swam. And when he came to the green grass growin, he slacked his shoon and ran. Oh, when he came to Lord William's gates, he bade not to chap na caw, but set his bent bow till his breast, and lightly lap the wa. Ballad of Lady Maisry Lord Peter peered out through the cold scurry of cloud. The thin struts of steel, incredibly fragile, swung slowly across the gleam and glint far below, where the wide country dizzied out and spread like a revolving map. In front, the sleek leather back of his companion humped stubbornly, sheeted with rain. He hoped that Grant was feeling confident. The roar of the engine drowned the occasional shout he threw to his passenger as they lurched from gust to gust. He withdrew his mind from present discomforts and went over that last strange, hurried scene. Fragments of conversation spun through his head. Mamzelle, I have scoured two continents in search of you. Voyons, then it is urgent. But be quick, for the big bear may come in and be grumpy, and I do not like des histoires. There had been a lamp on a low table. He remembered the gleam through the haze of short gold hair. She was a tall girl, but slender, looking up at him from the huge black and gold cushions. Mamselle, it is incredible to me that you should ever dine or dance with a person called Van Humperdinck. Now what had possessed him to say that, when there was so little time, and Jerry's affairs were of such importance? Monsieur Van Humperdinck does not dance. Did you seek me through two continents to say that? No, I am serious. Eh bien, sit down. She had been quite frank about it. Yes, poor soul. But life was very expensive since the war. I refused several good things, but always des histoires. And so little money. You see, one must be sensible. There is one's old age. It is necessary to be provident, eh? Assuredly. She had a little accent, very familiar. At first he could not place it. Then it came to him, Vienna before the war, that capital of incredible follies. Yes, yes, I wrote. I was very kind, very sensible. I said, je ne suis pas femme à supporter de gros ennuis. Cela se comprend, n'est-ce pas? That was readily understood. The plane dived sickly into a sudden pocket, the propeller whirring helplessly in the void, then steadied and began to nose up the opposite spiral. I saw it in the papers, yes. Poor boy. Why should anybody have shot him? Mademoiselle, it is for that I have come to you. My brother, whom I dearly love, is accused of murder. He may be hanged. Brrr! For a murder he did not commit. Mon pauvre enfant! Mademoiselle, I implore you to be serious. My brother is accused and will be standing his trial. Once her attention had been caught, she had been all sympathy. Her blue eyes had a curious and attractive trick, a full lower lid that shut them into glimmering slits. Mademoiselle, I implore you, try to remember what was in his letter. But, mon pauvre ami, how can I? I did not read it. It was very long, very tedious, full of histoire. The thing was finished. 
I never bother about what cannot be helped, do you? But his real agony at this failure had touched her. Listen, then. All is perhaps not lost. It is possible the letter is still somewhere about. Or we will ask Adèle. She is my maid. She collects letters to blackmail people. Oh, yes, I know. But she is habile comme tout pour la toilette. Wait, we will look first. Tossing out letters, trinkets, endless perfumed rubbish from the little gimcrack secrétaire, from drawers full of lingerie. I am so untidy. I am Adèle's despair. From bags, hundreds of bags. And at last, Adèle, thin-lipped and wary-eyed, denying everything till her mistress suddenly slapped her face in a fury and called her ugly little names in French and German. "'It is useless, then,' said Lord Peter. "'What a pity that Mademoiselle Adèle cannot find a thing so valuable to me.' The word valuable suggested an idea to Adèle. There was Mademoiselle's jewel case, which had not been searched. She would fetch it. "'C'est cela que cherche monsieur?' After that, the sudden arrival of Mr. Cornelius Van Humperdinck, very rich and stout and suspicious, and the rewarding of Adèle in a tactful, unobtrusive fashion by the elevator shaft. Grant shouted, but the words flipped feebly away into the blackness and were lost. What? bawled whimsy in his ear he shouted again and this time the word juice shot into sound and fluttered away but whether the news was good or bad lord peter could not tell mr Murbles was aroused a little after midnight by a thunderous knocking upon his door thrusting his head out of the window in some alarm he saw the porter, with his lantern, steaming through the rain, and behind him a shapeless figure, which for the moment Mr. Murbles could not make out. "'What's the matter?' said the solicitor. "'Young lady, askin' urgently for you, sir.' The shapeless figure looked up, and he caught the spangle of gold hair in the lantern light under the little tight hat. "'Mr. Murbles, please come. Bunter rang me up. There's a woman come to give evidence. Bunter doesn't like to leave her. She's frightened. But he says it's frightfully important, and Bunter's always right, you know. Did he mention the name?' "'A uh, Mrs. Grimethorpe. God bless me. Just a moment, my dear young lady, and I will let you in.' and, indeed, more quickly than might have been expected, Mr. Murbles made his appearance in a Jaeger dressing-gown at the front door. "'Come in, my dear. I will get dressed in a very few minutes. It was quite right of you to come to me. I am very, very glad you did. What a terrible night! Perkins, would you kindly wake up Mr. Murphy and ask him to oblige me with the use of his telephone?' Mr. Murphy, a noisy Irish barrister with a hearty manner, needed no waking. He was entertaining a party of friends, and was delighted to be of service. "'Is that you, Biggs? Murbles, speaking. That alibi?' "'Yes.' "'Has come along of its own accord.' "'My God, you don't say so.' "'Can you come round to 110A Piccadilly? Straight away.' It was a strange little party gathered round Lord Peter's fire. The white-faced woman, who started at every sound, the men of law with their keen, disciplined faces, Lady Mary, Bunter the efficient. Mrs. Grimthorpe's story was simple enough. 
She had suffered the torments of knowledge ever since Lord Peter had spoken to her. She had seized an hour when her husband was drunk in the Lord in glory, and had harnessed the horse and driven into Stapley. I couldn't keep silence. It's better my man should kill me, for I'm unhappy enough, and maybe I couldn't be any worse off in the Lord's hand, rather than they should hang him for a thing he never done. He was kind, and I was desperate, miserable, that's the truth, and I'm hoping his lady won't be hard on him when she knows it all. "'No, no,' said Mr. Murbles, clearing his throat. "'Excuse me a moment, madam. Sir Impey?' The lawyers whispered together in the window-seat. "'You see,' said Sir Impey, "'she has burnt her boats pretty well now by coming at all. "'The great question for us is, is it worth the risk?' After all, we don't know what Whimsy's evidence amounts to. No, that is why I feel inclined, in spite of the risk, to put this evidence in, said Mr. Murbles. I am ready to take the risk, interposed Mrs. Grimethorpe starkly. We quite appreciate that, replied Sir Impey. It is the risk to our client we have to consider first of all. Risk? cried Mary. But surely this clears him. Will you swear absolutely to the time when His Grace of Denver arrived at Grider's Hole, Mrs. Grimethorpe? went on the lawyer, as though he had not heard her. It was a quarter past twelve by the kitchen clock. "'Tis a very good clock. "'And he left you at about five minutes past two. "'And how long would it take a man walking quickly "'to get back to Riddlesdale Lodge? "'Oh, well, nigh an hour. "'It's rough walking, and a steep bank up and down to the beck. You mustn't let the other counsel upset you on those points, Mrs. Grimethorpe, because they will try to prove that he had time to kill Cathcart, either before he started or after he returned, and by admitting that the Duke had something in his life that he wanted to keep secret, we shall be supplying the very thing the prosecution lack, a motive for murdering anyone who might have found him out. There was a stricken silence. "'If I may ask, madam,' said Sir Impey, "'has any person any suspicion?' "'My husband guessed,' she answered hoarsely. "'I am sure of it. He has always known, but he couldn't prove it. "'That very night—what night? "'The night of the murder. He laid a trap for me. He came back from Stapley in the night, hoping to catch us and do murder. But he drank too much before he started, and spent the night in the ditch. Or it might be Gerald's death you'd be inquiring into, and mine, as well as the other. It gave Mary an odd shock to hear her brother's name spoken like that, by that speaker, and in that company. She asked suddenly, apropos of nothing, "'Isn't Mr. Parker here?' "'No, my dear,' said Mr. Murbles, reprovingly. "'This is not a police matter.' "'The best thing we can do, I think,' said Sir Impey, "'is to put in the evidence, and, if necessary, "'arrange for some kind of protection for this lady. "'In the meantime,' "'She is coming round with me to mother,' said Lady Mary, determinedly. "'My dear lady,' expostulated Mr. Murbles, "'that would be very unsuitable in the circumstances. "'I think you hardly grasp. "'Mother said so,' retorted her ladyship. "'Bunter, call a taxi.' "'Mr. Murbles waved his hands helplessly, "'but Sir Impey was rather amused.' "'It's no good, Murbles,' he said. 
time and trouble will tame an advanced young woman but an advanced old woman is uncontrollable by any earthly force so it was from the dowager's town-house that lady mary rang up mr charles parker to tell him the news End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eloquent Dead Je connaissais Manon. Pourquoi m'affliger tant d'un malheur que j'avais dû prévoir? Manon Lescaut the gale had blown itself out into a wonderful fresh day, with clear spaces of sky and a high wind rolling boulders of cumulus down the blue slopes of air. The prisoner had been wrangling for an hour with his advisers when finally they came into court, and even Sir Impey's classical face showed flushed between the wings of his wig. "'I'm not going to say anything,' said the Duke, obstinately. "'Rotten thing to do. "'I suppose I can't prevent you calling her if she insists on coming. "'Damn good of her. "'Makes me feel no end of a beast.' "'Better leave it at that,' said Mr. Murbles. "'Makes a good impression, you know. "'Let him go into the box and behave like a perfect gentleman. "'They'll like it.' Sir Impey, who had sat through the small hours altering his speech, nodded. The first witness that day came as something of a surprise. She gave her name and address as Eliza Briggs, known as Madame Brigitte of New Bond Street, and her occupation as beauty specialist and perfumer. She had a large and aristocratic clientele of both sexes, and a branch in Paris. Deceased had been a client of hers in both cities for several years. He had massage and manicure. After the war, he had come to her about some slight scars caused by grazing with shrapnel. He was extremely particular about his personal appearance, and if you called that vanity in a man, you might certainly say he was vain. Thank you. Sir Wigmore Rinching made no attempt to cross-examine the witness, and the noble lords wondered to one another what it was all about. At this point, Sir Impey Biggs leaned forward, and, tapping his brief impressively with his forefinger, began. My lords, so strong is our case that we had not thought it necessary to present an alibi, when an officer of the court rushed up from a little whirlpool of commotion by the door, and excitedly thrust a note into his hand. Sir Impey read, colored, glanced down the hall, put down his brief, folded his hands over it, and said, in a sudden loud voice, which penetrated even to the deaf ear of the Duke of Wiltshire. My lords, I am happy to say that our missing witness is here. I call Lord Peter Whimsey. Every neck was at once craned, and every eye focused on the very grubby and oily figure that came amiably trotting up the long room. Sir Impey Biggs passed the note down to Murbles, and, turning to the witness, who was yawning frightfully in the intervals of grinning at all his acquaintances, demanded that he should be sworn. The witness's story was as follows. I am Peter Deeth Redden Whimsey, brother of the accused. I live at 110A Piccadilly. In consequence of what I read on that bit of blotting paper, which I now identify, I went to Paris to look for a certain lady. 
the name of the lady is mademoiselle simone von der i found she had left paris in company with a man named van humperdinck i followed her and at length came up with her in new york i asked her to give me the letter cathcart wrote on the night of his death sensation i produce that letter with mademoiselle von der Rat's signature on the corner so that it can be identified if wiggy there tries to put it over you joyous sensation in which the indignant protests of prosecuting counsel were drowned and i'm sorry i've given you such short notice of this old man but i only got it the day before yesterday we came as quick as we could but we had to come down near whitehaven with engine trouble and if we had come down half a mile sooner i shouldn't be here now applause hurriedly checked by the lord high steward my lords said sir impey your lordships are witnesses that i have never seen this letter in my life i have no idea of its contents yet so positive am i that it cannot but assist my noble client's case that i am willing nay eager to put in this document immediately as it stands without perusal to stand or fall by the contents the handwriting must be identified as that of the deceased interposed the lord high steward the ravening pencils of the reporters tore along the paper the lean young man who worked for the daily trumpet scented a scandal in high life and licked his lips never knowing what a much bigger one had escaped him by a bare minute or so miss lydia cathcart was recalled to identify the handwriting and the letter was handed to the lord high steward who announced the letter is in french we shall have to swear an interpreter you will find said the witness suddenly that those bits of words on the blotting paper come out of that letter you'll excuse my mentioning it is this person put forward as an expert witness inquired sir wigmore witheringly right ho said lord peter only you see it has been rather sprung on biggy as you might say biggy and wiggy were two pretty men they went into court when the clock sir impey i must really ask you to keep your witness in order lord peter grinned and a pause ensued while an interpreter was fetched and sworn then at last the letter was read amid a breathless silence simon je viens de recevoir ta lettre que dire inutile les prières ou les reproches tu ne comprendras tu ne liras même pas n'ai-je pas toujours su d'ailleurs que tu devais infailliblement me trahir depuis dix ans déjà je souffre tous les tourments que puisse infliger la jalousie je comprends bien que tu n'as jamais voulu me faire de la peine c'est tout justement cette insouciance cette légèreté cette façon séduisante d'être malhonnête que j'adorais en toi j'ai tout su et je t'ai aimé ma foi non ma chère jamais je n'ai eu la moindre illusion te rappelles-tu cette première rencontre un soir au casino tu avais dix-sept ans et tu étais jolie à ravir le lendemain tu fus à moi tu m'as dit si gentiment que tu m'aimais bien et que j'étais moi le premier ma pauvre enfant tu en as menti tu riais toute seule de ma naïveté il y avait bien de quoi rire dès notre premier baiser j'ai prévu ce moment mais écoute simone j'ai la faiblesse de vouloir te montrer exactement ce que tu as fait de moi tu regretteras peut-être un peu mais non 
Si tu pouvais regretter quoi que ce fût, tu ne serais plus Simone. Il y a dix ans, la vieille de la guerre, j'étais riche. Moins riche que ton Américain, mais assez riche pour te donner l'établissement qu'il te fallait. Tu étais moins exigeante avant la guerre, Simone. Qui est-ce qui, pendant mon absence, t'a enseigné le goût du luxe Charmante discrétion de ma part de ne jamais te le demander. Eh bien, une grande partie de ma fortune se trouvant placée en Russie et en Allemagne. J'en ai perdu plus des trois quarts. Ce que m'en restait en France a beaucoup diminué en valeur. Il est vrai, j'avais mon traitement de capitaine dans l'armée britannique, mais c'est peu de choses, tu sais. Avant même la fin de la guerre, tu m'avais mangé toutes mes économies. C'était d'idiot, quoi. Un jeune homme qui a perdu les trois quarts de ses rentes ne se permet plus une maîtresse et un appartement avenue Kléber. Où il conchédit madame ou bien il lui demande quelques sacrifices. Je n'ai rien osé demander. Si j'étais venu un jour te dire, « Simone, je suis pauvre, que m'aurais-tu répondu »« Sais-tu ce que j'ai fait ?»« Non, tu n'as jamais pensé à demander d'où venait cet argent. »« Qu'est-ce que cela pouvait te faire que j'ai tout jeté ?»« Fortune, honneur, bonheur pour te posséder. » J'ai joué désespérément, éperdument. J'ai fait pis, j'ai triché au jeu. Je te vois oser les épaules, tu ris, tu dis, tiens, c'est malin, ça. Oui, mais cela ne se fait pas. On m'aurait chassé du régiment. Je devenais le dernier des hommes. D'ailleurs, cela ne pouvait durer. Déjà, un soir à Paris, on m'a fait une scène désagréable, bien qu'on n'ait rien pu prouver. C'est alors que je me suis fiancée avec cette demoiselle dont j'ai te parlé, la fille du duc anglais. Le beau projet, quoi, entretenir ma maîtresse avec l'argent de ma femme. Et je l'aurais fait, et je le ferai encore demain si c'était pour te reposséder. Mais tu me quittes. Cet Américain est riche, archi riche. Depuis longtemps, tu me répètes que ton appartement est trop petit et que tu t'ennuies à mourir. Cet ami bienveillant t'offre les autos, les diamants, les mille et une nuits, la lune. Auprès de ces merveilles, évidemment, que valent l'amour et l'honneur. Enfin, le bon duc est d'une stupidité très commode. Il laisse traîner son revolver dans le tiroir de son bureau. D'ailleurs, il vient de me demander une explication à propos de cette histoire des cartes. Tu vois qu'en tout cas, la partie était finie. Pourquoi t'en vouloir On mettra sans doute mon suicide au compte de cet exposé. Tant mieux, je ne veux pas qu'on affiche mon histoire amoureuse dans les journaux. Adieu, ma bien-aimée, mon adorée, mon adorée, ma Simone. Sois heureuse avec ton nouvel amant. Pense plus à moi. Qu'est-ce que tout cela peut bien te faire Mon Dieu, comme je t'ai aimé, comme je t'aime toujours malgré moi. Mais c'est fini. Jamais plus tu ne me perceras la cœur. Oh, j'enrage. Je suis fou de douleur. Adieu. Translation Simon, I have just got your letter. What am I to say? It is useless to entreat or reproach you. You would not understand or even read the letter. Besides, I always knew you must betray me some day. I have suffered a hell of jealousy for the last ten years. I know perfectly well you never meant to hurt me. It was just your utter lightness and carelessness and your attractive way of being dishonest, which was so adorable. I knew everything and loved you all the same. Oh, no, my dear, I never had any illusions. 
You remember our first meeting that night at the casino? You were seventeen and heartbreakingly lovely. You came to me the very next day. You told me very prettily that you loved me and that I was the first. My poor little girl, that wasn't true. I expect when you were alone you laughed to think I was so easily taken in. But there was nothing to laugh at. From our very first kiss I foresaw this moment. I'm afraid I'm weak enough, though, to want to tell you just what you have done for me. You may be sorry, but no, if you could regret anything, you wouldn't be Simon any longer. Ten years ago, before the war, I was rich. Not so rich as your new American, but rich enough to give you what you wanted. You didn't want quite so much before the war, Simon. Who taught you to be so extravagant while I was away? I think it was very nice of me never to ask you. Well, most of my money was in Russian and German securities, and more than three-quarters of it went west. The remainder in France went down considerably in value. I had my captain's pay, of course, but that didn't amount to much. Even before the end of the war, you had managed to get through all my savings. Of course, I was a fool. A young man whose income has been reduced by three quarters can't afford an expensive mistress and a flat in the Avenue Clébert. He ought either to dismiss the lady or to demand a little self-sacrifice, but I didn't dare demand anything. Suppose I had come to you one day and said, Simone, I've lost my money. What would you have said to me? What do you think I did? I don't suppose you ever thought about it at all. You didn't care if I was chucking away my money and my honor and my happiness to keep you. I gambled desperately. I did worse. I cheated at cards. I can see you shrug your shoulders and say, good for you, but it's a rotten thing to do, a rotter's game. If anybody had found out, they'd have cashiered me. Besides, it couldn't go on forever. There was one row in Paris, though they couldn't prove anything. So then I got engaged to the English girl I told you about, the Duke's daughter. Pretty, wasn't it? I actually brought myself to consider keeping my mistress on my wife's money. But I'd have done it, and I'd do it again to get you back. And now you've chucked me. This American is colossally rich. For a long time you've been dinning into my ears that the flat is too small, and that you're bored to death. Your good friend can offer you cars, diamonds, Aladdin's palace, the moon, I admit that love and honor look pretty small by comparison. Ah, well, the Duke is most obligingly stupid. He leaves his revolver about in his desk drawer. Besides, he's just been in to ask what about this card-sharping story. So, you see, the game's up anyhow. I don't blame you. I suppose they'll put my suicide down to fear of exposure. All the better. I don't want my love affairs in the Sunday press. Goodbye, my dear. Oh, Simon, my darling, my darling, goodbye. Be happy with your new lover. Never mind me. What does it all matter? My God, how I loved you. 
and how I still love you in spite of myself. It's all done with. You'll never break my heart again. I'm mad, mad with misery. Goodbye. End of chapter 17「Eighteen of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Speech for the Defense Nobody, I myself, farewell. Othello After the reading of Cathcart's letter, even the appearance of the prisoner in the witness box came as an anticlimax. In the face of the Attorney General's cross-examination, he maintained stoutly that he had wandered on the moor for several hours without meeting anybody, though he was forced to admit that he had gone downstairs at 11.30 and not at 2.30, as he had stated at the inquest. Sir Wigmore Rinching made a great point of this, and in a spirited endeavour to suggest that Cathcart was blackmailing Denver, pressed his questions so hard that Sir Impey Biggs, Mr. Murbles, Lady Mary, and Bunter had a nervous feeling that learned counsel's eyes were boring through the walls to the side room, where, apart from the other witnesses, Mrs. Grimethorpe sat waiting. After lunch, Sir Impey Biggs rose to make his plea for the defense. My lords, your lordships have now heard, and I, who have watched and pleaded here for these three anxious days, know with what eager interest and with what ready sympathy you have heard the evidence brought by my noble client to defend him against this dreadful charge of murder. You have listened while, as it were, from his narrow grave, the dead man has lifted his voice to tell you the story of that fatal night of the 13th of October. And I feel sure you can have no doubt in your hearts that that story is the true one. As your lordships know, I was myself totally ignorant of the contents of that letter until I heard it read in court just now, and by the profound impression it made upon my own mind, I can judge how tremendously and how painfully it must have affected your lordships. In my long experience at the criminal bar, I think I have never met with a history more melancholy than that of the unhappy young man whom a fatal passion, for here indeed we may use that well-worn expression in all the fullness of its significance, whom a truly fatal passion thus urged into deep after deep of degradation, and, finally, to a violent death by his own hand. The noble peer at the bar has been indicted before your lordships of the murder of this young man. That he is wholly innocent of the charge must, in the light of what we have heard, be so plain to your lordships, that any words from me might seem altogether superfluous. In the majority of cases of this kind, the evidence is confused, contradictory. Here, however, the course of events is so clear, so coherent, that had we ourselves been present to see the drama unrolled before us, as before the all-seeing eye of God, we could hardly have a more vivid or a more accurate vision of that night's adventures. Indeed, had the death of Dennis Cathcart been the sole event of the night, I will venture to say that the truth could never have been one single moment in doubt. Since, however, by a series of unheard-of coincidences, the threads of Dennis Cathcart's story become entangled with so many others, I will venture to tell it once again from the beginning, lest in the confusion of so great a cloud of witnesses, any point should still remain obscure. Let me then go back to the beginning. 
You have heard how Dennis Cathcart was born of mixed parentage, from the union of a young and lovely southern girl with an Englishman twenty years older than herself, imperious, passionate, and cynical. Till the age of eighteen, he lives on the continent with his parents, travelling from place to place, seeing more of the world even than the average young Frenchman of his age, learning the code of love in a country where the crime passionnel is understood and forgiven, as it never can be over here. At the age of eighteen, a terrible loss befalls him. In a very short space of time, he loses both his parents, his beautiful and adored mother, and his father, who might, had he lived, have understood how to guide the impetuous nature which he had brought into the world. But the father dies, expressing two last wishes, both of which, natural as they were, turned out in the circumstances to be disastrously ill-advised. He left his son to the care of his sister, whom he had not seen for many years, with the direction that the boy should be sent to his own old university. My lords, you have seen Miss Lydia Cathcart, and heard her evidence. You will have realized how uprightly, how conscientiously, with what Christian disregard of self, she performed the duty entrusted to her, and yet how inevitably she failed to establish any real sympathy between herself and her young ward. He, poor lad, missing his parents at every turn, was plunged at Cambridge into the society of young men of totally different upbringing from himself. To a young man of his cosmopolitan experience, the youth of Cambridge, with its sports and rags and naive excursions into philosophy o' nights, must have seemed unbelievably childish. You all, from your own recollections of your alma mater, can reconstruct Dennis Cathcart's life at Cambridge, its outward gaiety, its inner emptiness. Ambitious of embracing a diplomatic career, Cathcart made extensive acquaintances among the sons of rich and influential men. From a worldly point of view, he was doing very well, and his inheritance of a handsome fortune at the age of twenty-one seemed to open up the path to very great success. Shaking the academic dust of Cambridge from his feet as soon as his tripos were passed, he went over to France, established himself in Paris, and began, in a quiet, determined kind of way, to carve out a little niche for himself in the world of international politics. But now comes into his life that terrible influence which was to rob him of fortune, honour, and life itself. He falls in love with a young woman of that exquisite, irresistible charm and beauty for which the Austrian capital is world-famous. He is enthralled, body and soul, as utterly as any Chevalier de Grieux, by Simone Vondera. Mark that in this matter he follows the strict continental code, complete devotion, complete discretion. You have heard how quietly he lived, how rangé he appeared to be. We have had in evidence his discreet banking account, with its generous checks drawn to self, and cashed in notes of moderate denominations, and with its regular accumulation of sufficient economies quarter by quarter. Life has expanded for Dennis Cathcart. Rich, ambitious, possessed of a beautiful and complaisant mistress, the world is open before him. Then, my lords, across this promising career, there falls the thunderbolt of the great war, ruthlessly smashing through his safeguards, overthrowing the edifice of his ambition, destroying and devastating, here as everywhere, all that made life beautiful and desirable. You have heard the story of Dennis Cathcart's distinguished army career. On that I need not dwell. 
like thousands of other young men he went gallantly through those five years of strain and disillusionment to find himself left in the end with his life and health indeed and so far happy beyond many of his comrades but with his life in ruins about him of his great fortune all of which had been invested in russian and german securities literally nothing is left to him what you say did that matter to a young man so well equipped with such excellent connections with so many favourable openings ready to his hand he needed only to wait quietly for a few years to reconstruct much of what he had lost alas my lords he could not afford to wait he stood in peril of losing something dearer to him than fortune or ambition he needed money in quantity and at once my lords in that pathetic letter which we have heard read nothing is more touching and terrible than that confession i knew you could not but be unfaithful to me all through that time of seeming happiness he knew none better that his house was built on sand i was never deceived by you he says from their earliest acquaintance she had lied to him and he knew it and that knowledge was yet powerless to loosen the bands of his fatal fascination if any of you my lords have known the power of love exercised in this irresistible i may say this predestined manner let your experience interpret the situation to you better than any poor words of mine can do one great french poet and one great english poet have summed the matter up in a few words racine says of such a fascination c'est venus tout entière à sa proie attachée and shakespeare has put the lover's despairing obstinacy into two piteous lines if my love swears that she is made of truth i will believe her though i know she lies my lords dennis cathcart is dead it is not our place to condemn him but only to understand and pity him my lords i need not put before you in detail the shocking shifts to which this soldier and gentleman unhappily condescended you have heard the story in all its cold ugly details upon the lips of m dubois gobiudin and accompanied by unavailing expressions of shame and remorse in the last words of the deceased you know how he gambled at first honestly then dishonestly you know from whence he derived those large sums of money which came at irregular intervals mysteriously and in cash to bolster up a bank account always perilously on the verge of depletion we need not my lords judge too harshly of the woman according to her own lights she did not treat him unfairly she had her interests to consider while he could pay for her she could give him beauty and passion and good humour and a moderate faithfulness when he could pay no longer she would find it only reasonable to take another position this cathcart understood money he must have by hook or by crook and so by an inevitable descent he found himself reduced to the final deep of dishonour it is at this point my lords that dennis cathcart and his miserable fortunes come into the life of my noble client and of his sister from this point begin all those complications which led to the tragedy of october fourteenth and which we are met in this solemn and historic assembly to unravel about eighteen months ago cathcart desperately searching for a secure source of income met the duke of denver whose father had been a friend of cathcart's father many years before the acquaintance prospered and cathcart was introduced to lady mary at that time as she has very frankly told us at a loose end fed up and distressed by the dismissal of her fiance mr goyles 
Lady Mary felt the need of an establishment of her own, and accepted Dennis Cathcart with the proviso that she should be considered a free agent, living her own life in her own way, with the minimum of interference. As to Cathcart's object in all this, we have his own bitter comment, on which no words of mine could improve. I actually brought myself to consider keeping my mistress on my wife's money. So matters go on until October of this year. Cathcart is now obliged to pass a good deal of his time in England with his fiancée, leaving Simon Vondera unguarded in the Avenue Clébert. He seems to have felt fairly secure so far. The only drawback was that Lady Mary, with a natural reluctance to commit herself to the hands of a man she could not really love, had so far avoided fixing a definitive date for the wedding. Money is shorter than it used to be in the Avenue Clébert, and the cost of robes and millinery, amusements, and so forth, have not diminished. And meanwhile, Mr. Cornelius Van Humperdinck, the American millionaire, has seen Simon in the Bois, at the races, at the opera, in Dennis Cathcart's flat. But Lady Mary is becoming more and more uneasy about her engagement, and at this critical moment Mr. Goyles suddenly sees the prospect of a position, modest but assured, which will enable him to maintain a wife. Lady Mary makes her choice. She consents to elope with Mr. Goyles, and by an extraordinary fatality, the day and hour selected are 3 a.m. on the morning of October 14th. At about 9.30 on the night of Wednesday, October 13th, the party at Riddlesdale Lodge are just separating to go to bed. The Duke of Denver was in the gun-room, the other men were in the billiard-room, the ladies had already retired, when the manservant, Fleming, came up from the village with the evening post. To the Duke of Denver he brought a letter with news of a startling and very unpleasant kind. To Dennis Cathcart he brought another letter, one which we shall never see, but whose contents it is easy enough to guess. You have heard the evidence of Mr. Arbuthnot that, before reading this letter, Cathcart had gone upstairs gay and hopeful, mentioning that he hoped soon to get a date fixed for the marriage. At a little after ten, when the Duke of Denver went up to see him, there was a great change. Before his grace could broach the matter in hand, Cathcart spoke rudely and harshly, appearing to be all on edge, and entreating to be left alone. "'Is it very difficult, my lords, in the face of what we have heard to-day, in the face of our knowledge that Mademoiselle Vondera crossed to New York on the Berengaria on October 15th, to guess what news had reached Dennis Cathcart in that interval to change his whole outlook upon life. At this unhappy moment, when Cathcart is brought face to face with the stupefying knowledge that his mistress has left him, comes the Duke of Denver with a frightful accusation. He taxes Cathcart with the vile truth, that this man, who has eaten his bread and sheltered under his roof, and who is about to marry his sister, is nothing more nor less than a card sharper. And when Cathcart refuses to deny the charge, when he most insolently, as it seems, declares that he is no longer willing to wed the noble lady to whom he is affianced, is it surprising that the Duke should turn upon the impostor and forbid him ever to touch or speak to Lady Mary Whimsey again? I say, my lords, that no man with a spark of honourable feeling would have done otherwise. My client contents himself with directing Cathcart to leave the house next day, and when Cathcart rushes madly out into the storm, he calls after him to return, and even takes the trouble to direct the footman to leave open the conservatory door for Cathcart's convenience. It is true that he called Cathcart a dirty scoundrel, and told him he should have been kicked out of his regiment, but he was justified while the words he shouted from the window, "'Come back, you fool!' or even, according to one witness, "'You 
B. Fool, have almost an affectionate ring in them. Laughter. And now I will direct your lordship's attention to the extreme weakness of the case against my noble client from the point of view of motive. It has been suggested that the cause of the quarrel between them was not that mentioned by the Duke of Denver in his evidence, but something even more closely personal to themselves. Of this contention, not a jot or tittle, not the slightest shadow of evidence has been put forward, except, indeed, that of the extraordinary witness Robinson, who appears to bear a grudge against his whole acquaintance, and to have magnified some trifling allusion into a matter of vast importance. Your lordships have seen this person's demeanour in the box, and will judge for yourselves how much weight is to be attached to his observations. While we on our side have been able to show that the alleged cause of complaint was perfectly well founded, in fact. So Cathcart rushes out into the garden. In the pelting rain he paces heedlessly about, envisaging a future stricken at once suddenly barren of love, wealth, and honor. And meanwhile a passage door opens, and a stealthy foot creeps down the stair. We know now whose it is. Mrs. Pettigrew Robinson has not mistaken the creak of the door. It is the Duke of Denver. That is admitted. But from this point we join issue with my learned friend for the prosecution. It is suggested that the Duke, on thinking matters over, determines that Cathcart is a danger to society and better dead or that his insult to the Denver family can only be washed out in blood. And we are invited to believe that the Duke creeps downstairs, fetches his revolver from the study table, and prowls out into the night to find Cathcart and make away with him in cold blood. My lords, is it necessary for me to point out the inherent absurdity of this suggestion? What conceivable reason could the Duke of Denver have for killing, in this cold-blooded manner, a man of whom a single word has rid him already and forever? It has been suggested to you that the injury had grown greater in the Duke's mind by brooding, had assumed gigantic proportions. Of that suggestion, my lords, I can only say that a more flimsy pretext for fixing an impulse to murder upon the shoulders of an innocent man was never devised, even by the ingenuity of an advocate. I will not waste my time or insult you by arguing about it. Again, it has been suggested that the cause of quarrel was not what it appeared, and that the Duke had reason to fear some disastrous action on Cathcart's part. Of this contention, I think we have already disposed. It is an assumption constructed in vacuo to meet a set of circumstances which my learned friend is at a loss to explain in conformity with the known facts. The very number and variety of motives suggested by the prosecution is proof that they are aware of the weakness of their own case. Frantically, they cast about for any sort of explanation to give color to this unreasonable indictment. And here I will direct your lordship's attention to the very important evidence of Inspector Parker in the matter of the study window. He has told you that it was forced from outside by the latch being slipped back with a knife. If it was the Duke of Denver who was in the study at 11.30, what need had he to force the window? He was already inside the house. When, in addition, we find that Cathcart had in his pocket a knife, and that there are scratches upon the blade, such as might come from forcing back a metal catch, it surely becomes evident that not the Duke, but Cathcart himself, forced the window and crept in for the pistol, not knowing that the conservatory door had been left open for him. But there is no need to labor this point. We know that Captain Cathcart was in the study at that time, for we have seen in evidence the sheet of blotting paper on which 
he blotted his letter to Simon Bondera, and Lord Peter Wimsey has told us how he himself removed that sheet from the study blotting-pad a few days after Cathcart's death. And let me here draw your attention to the significance of one point in the evidence. The Duke of Denver has told us that he saw the revolver in his drawer a short time before the fatal 13th, when he and Cathcart were together. The Lord High Steward. One moment, Sir Impey. That is not quite as I have it in my notes. Counsel. I beg your lordship's pardon if I am wrong. Lord High Steward. I will read what I have. I was hunting for an old photograph of Mary to give Cathcart, and that was how I came across it. There is nothing about Cathcart being there. Counsel. If your lordship will read the next sentence. Lord High Steward. Certainly. The next sentence is, I remember saying at the time how rusty it was getting. Counsel. And the next? Lord High Steward. To whom did you make that observation? Answer. I really don't know, but I distinctly remember saying it. Counsel. I am much obliged to your lordship. When the noble peer made that remark, he was looking out some photographs to give to Captain Cathcart. I think we may reasonably infer that the remark was made to the deceased. Lord High Steward, to the house. My lords, your lordships will, of course, use your own judgment as to the value of this suggestion. If your lordships can accept that Dennis Cathcart may have known of the existence of the revolver, it is immaterial at what exact moment he saw it. As you have heard, the table drawer was always left with the key in it. He might have seen it himself at any time, when searching for an envelope or sealing wax or what not. In any case, I contend that the movements heard by Colonel and Mrs. Marchbanks on Wednesday night were those of Dennis Cathcart. While he was writing his farewell letter, perhaps with the pistol before him on the table, yes, at that very moment, the Duke of Denver slipped down the stairs and out through the conservatory door. Here is the incredible part of this affair, that again and again we find two series of events wholly unconnected between themselves converging upon the same point of time and causing endless confusion. I have used the word incredible, not because any coincidence is incredible, for we see more remarkable examples every day of our lives than any writer of fiction would dare to invent, but merely to take it out of the mouth of the learned attorney-general, who is preparing to make it return boomerang fashion against me. Laughter. My lords, this is the first of these incredible, I am not afraid of the word, coincidences. At 11.30, the Duke goes downstairs and Cathcart enters the study. The learned Attorney General, in his cross-examination of my noble client, very justifiably made what capital he could out of the discrepancy between the witness's statement at the inquest, which was that he did not leave the house till 2.30, and his present statement that he left it at half-past eleven. My lords, whatever interpretation you like to place upon the motives of the noble duke in so doing, I must remind you once more that, at the time when that first statement was made, everybody supposed that the shot had been fired at three o'clock, and that the misstatement was then useless for the purpose of establishing an alibi. Great stress, too has been laid on the noble duke's inability to establish this alibi for the hours from 11.30 to 3 a.m. But, my lords, if he is telling the truth in saying that he walked all that time upon the moors without meeting anyone, what alibi could he establish? He is not bound to supply a motive for all his minor actions during the twenty-four hours. No rebutting evidence has been brought to discredit his story, and it is perfectly reasonable that, unable to sleep after the scene with Cathcart, 
he should go for a walk to calm himself down. Meanwhile, Cathcart has finished his letter and tossed it into the post-bag. There is nothing more ironical in the whole of this case than that letter. While the body of a murdered man lay stark upon the threshold, and detectives and doctors searched everywhere for clues, the normal routine of an ordinary English household went unquestioned on. That letter, which contained the whole story, lay undisturbed in the post-bag till it was taken away and put in the post, as a matter of course, to be fetched back again, at enormous cost, delay, and risk of life, two months later, in vindication of the great English motto, business as usual. Upstairs, Lady Mary Whimsey was packing her suitcase and writing a farewell letter to her people. At length, Cathcart signs his name. He takes up the revolver and hurries out into the shrubbery. Still he paces up and down, with what thoughts God alone knows, reviewing the past, no doubt, racked with vain remorse, most of all bitter against the woman who has ruined him. He bethinks him of the little love token, the platinum and diamond cat, which his mistress gave him for good luck. At any rate, he will not die with that pressing upon his heart. With a furious gesture, he hurls it far from him. He puts the pistol to his head. But something arrests him. Not that, not that. He sees, in fancy, his own hideously disfigured corpse, the shattered jaw, the burst eyeball, blood and brains horribly splashed about. No. Let the bullet go cleanly to the heart. Not even in death can he bear the thought of looking so. He places the revolver against his breast and draws the trigger. With a little moan, he drops to the sodden ground. The weapon falls from his hand. His fingers scrabble a little at his breast. The gamekeeper, who heard the shot, is puzzled that poachers should come so close. Why are they not on the moors? He thinks of the hares in the plantation. He takes his lantern and searches in the thick drizzle. Nothing. Only soggy grass and dripping trees. He is human. He concludes his ears deceived him, and he returns to his warm bed. Midnight passes. One o'clock passes. The rain is less heavy now. Look in the shrubbery. What was that? A movement. The shot man is moving, groaning a little, crawling to his feet. Chilled to the bone, weak from loss of blood, shaking with the fever of his wound, he but dimly remembers his purpose. His groping hands go to the wound in his breast. He pulls out a handkerchief and presses it upon the place. He drags himself up, slipping and stumbling. The handkerchief slides to the ground and lies there, beside the revolver among the fallen leaves. Something in his aching brain tells him to crawl back to the house. He is sick, in pain, hot and cold by turns, and horribly thirsty. There someone will take him in and be kind to him, give him things to drink. Swaying and starting, now falling on hands and knees, now reeling to and fro, he makes that terrible nightmare journey to the house. Now he walks, now he crawls, dragging his heavy limbs after him. At last, the conservatory door. Here there will be help and water for his fever in the trough by the well. He crawls up to it on hands and knees and strains to lift himself. It is growing very difficult to breathe. A heavy weight seems to be bursting his chest. He lifts himself. A frightful hiccuping cough catches him. The blood rushes from his mouth. He drops down. It is indeed all over. Once more the hours pass. Three o'clock, the hour of rendezvous draws on. Eagerly the young lover leaps the wall and comes hurrying through the shrubbery to greet his bride-to-be. 
It is cold and wet, but his happiness gives him no time to think of his surroundings. He passes through the shrubbery without a thought. He reaches the conservatory door, through which, in a few moments, love and happiness will come to him. And in that moment he stumbles across the dead body of a man. Fear possesses him. He hears a distant footstep. With but one idea, escape from this horror of horrors, he dashes into the shrubbery, just as, fatigued perhaps a little, but with a mind soothed by his little expedition, the Duke of Denver comes briskly up the path to meet the eager bride over the body of her betrothed. My lords, the rest is clear. Lady Mary Wimsey, forced by a horrible appearance of things into suspecting her lover of murder, undertook, with what courage every man amongst you will realize, to conceal that George Goyles ever was upon the scene. Of this ill-considered action of hers came much mystery and perplexity. Yet, my lords, while chivalry holds its own, not one amongst us will breathe one word of blame against that gallant lady. As the old song says, God send each man at his end, such hawks, such hounds, and such a friend. I think, my lords, that there is nothing more for me to say. To you I leave the solemn and joyful task of freeing the noble peer, your companion, from this unjust charge. You are but human, my lords, and some among you will have grumbled, some will have mocked, on assuming these medieval splendors of scarlet and ermine, so foreign to the taste and habit of a utilitarian age. You know well enough that tis not the balm, the sceptre, and the ball, the sword, the mace, the crown imperial, the intertissued robe of gold and pearl, the farcid title, nor the tide of pomp, that beats upon the high shores of the world, that can add any dignity to noble blood. And yet, to have beheld, day after day, the head of one of our oldest and noblest houses in England, standing here, cut off from your friendship, stripped of his historic honors, robed only in the justice of his cause, this cannot have failed to move your pity and indignation. My lords, it is your happy privilege to restore to his grace the Duke of Denver these traditional symbols of his exalted rank. When the clerk of this house shall address to you severally the solemn question, Do you find Gerald, Duke of Denver, Viscount St. George, guilty or not guilty of the dreadful crime of murder, every one of you may, with a confidence unmarred by any shadow of doubt, lay his hand upon his heart, and say, Not guilty upon my honor. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Clouds of Witness by Dorothy Sayers Who Goes Home? Drunk as a lord, as a class, they are really very sober. Judge Clure, in court. While the Attorney General was engaged in the ungrateful task of trying to obscure what was not only plain but agreeable to everybody's feelings, Lord Peter hauled Parker off to a lion's over the way and listened, over an enormous dish of eggs and bacon, to a brief account of Mrs. Grimethorpe's dash to town and a long one of Lady Mary's cross-examination. "'What are you grinning about?' snapped the narrator. "'Just natural imbecility,' said Lord Peter. "'I say, poor old Cathcart. She was a girl. For the matter of that, I suppose she still is. I don't know why I should talk as if she'd died the moment I took my eyes off her. Horribly self-centred you are,' grumbled Mr. Parker. "'I know. I always was, from a child.' "'But what worries me is that I seem to be getting so susceptible. "'When Barbara turned me down—' "'You're cured,' 
said his friend brutally. "'As a matter of fact, I've noticed it for some time.' Lord Peter sighed deeply. "'I value your candour, Charles,' he said. "'But I wish you hadn't such an unkind way of putting things. "'Besides, I say, are they coming out?' The crowd in Parliament Square was beginning to stir and spread. Sparse streams of people began to drift across the street. A splash of scarlet appeared against the grey stone of St. Stephen's. Mr. Murble's clerk dashed in suddenly at the door. "'All right, my lord. Acquitted unanimously. And will you please come across, my lord?' They ran out. At sight of Lord Peter, some excited bystanders raised a cheer. The great wind tore suddenly through the square, bellying out the scarlet robes of the emerging peers. Lord Peter was bandied from one to the other till he reached the centre of the group. "'Excuse me, Your Grace.' It was Bunter. Bunter, miraculously, with his arms full of scarlet and ermine, enveloping the shameful blue serge suit which had been a badge of disgrace allow me to offer my respectful congratulations your grace bunter cried lord peter great god the man's gone mad damn you man take that thing away he added plunging at a tall photographer in a made-up tie too late my lord said the offender jubilantly pushing in the slide peter said the duke er uh, thanks old man all right said his lordship very jolly trip and all that you're looking very fit oh don't shake hands there i knew it i heard that man's confounded shutter go they pushed their way through the surging mob to the cars the two duchesses got in, and the duke was following, when a bullet crashed through the glass of the window, missing Denver's head by an inch, and ricocheting from the windscreen among the crowd. A rush and a yell. A big, bearded man struggled for a moment with three constables, then came a succession of wild shots and a fierce rush, the crowd parting and closing in, like hounds on the fox, streaming past the Houses of Parliament, heading for Westminster Bridge. "'He's shot a woman. He's under that bus. No, he isn't. Hi! Murder! Stop him!' Shrill screams and yells, police whistles blowing, constables darting from every corner, swooping down in taxis, running. The driver of a taxi, spinning across the bridge, saw the fierce face just ahead of his bonnet, and jammed on the brakes as the madman's fingers closed for the last time on the trigger. Shot and tire exploded almost simultaneously. The taxi slewed gittily over to the right, scooping the fugitive with it, and crashed horribly into a tram standing vacant on the embankment dead end i couldn't help it yelled the taxi man he fired at me oh god i couldn't help it lord peter and parker arrived together panting here constable gasped his lordship i know this man he has an unfortunate grudge against my brother in connection with a poaching matter up in yorkshire Tell the coroner to come to me for information. Very good, my lord. Don't photograph that, said Lord Peter to the man with the reflex, whom he suddenly found at his elbow. The photographer shook his head. They wouldn't like to see that, my lord. Only the scenes of the crash and the ambulance men. Bright, newsy pictures, you know. Nothing gruesome with an explanatory jerk of the head at the great dark splotches in the roadway. It doesn't pay. A red-haired reporter appeared from nowhere with a notebook. Here, said his lordship, do you want the story? I'll give it to you now. There was not, after all, the slightest trouble in the matter of Mrs. Grimethorpe. 
seldom perhaps has a ducal escapade resolved itself with so little embarrassment his grace indeed who was nothing if not a gentleman braced himself gallantly for a regretful and sentimental interview in all his rather stupid affairs he had never run away from a scene or countered a storm of sobs with that maddening well i'd better be going now which has led to so many despairs and occasionally to cold shot but on this occasion the whole business fell flat the lady was not interested i am free now she said i am going back to my own people in cornwall i do not want anything now that he is dead the duke's dutiful caress was a most uninteresting failure Lord Peter saw her home to a respectable little hotel in Bloomsbury. She liked the taxi and the large glittering shops and the sky signs. They stopped at Piccadilly Circus to see the Bonzo dog smoke his gasper and the Nestle's baby consume his bottle of milk. She was amazed to find that the prices of the things in Swan and Edgar's window were, if anything, more reasonable than those current in Stapley. "'I should like one of those blue scarves,' she said. "'But I'm thinking twould not be fitting and me a widow.' "'You could buy it now and wear it later on,' suggested his lordship. "'In Cornwall, you know?' "'Yes.' She glanced at her brown stuff gown. Could I buy my blacks here? I shall have to get some for the funeral. Just a dress and a hat, and a coat, maybe. I should think it would be a very good idea. Now, why not? I have money, she said. I took it from his desk. It's mine now, I suppose. Not that I'd wish to be beholden to him but I don't look at it that way. I shouldn't think twice about it if I were you, said Lord Peter. She walked before him into the shop, her own woman at last. In the early hours of the morning, Inspector Sugg, who happened to be passing Parliament Square, came upon a taxi-man apparently addressing a heated expostulation to the statue of lord palmerston indignant at this senseless proceeding mr sugg advanced and then observed that the statesman was sharing his pedestal with a gentleman in evening dress who clung precariously with one hand while with the other he held an empty champagne bottle to his eye and surveyed the surrounding streets. "'Hi,' said the policeman. "'What are you doing there? Come off of it.' hallo said the gentleman, losing his balance quite suddenly, and coming down in a jumbled manner. "'Have you seen my friend? Very odd thing. Damned odd. Speck you know where find him. What? When in doubt? tasker policeman what friend of mine very dignified sort of man not perhaps freddy good old freddy always answers to name just like jolly old bloodhound he got to his feet and stood beaming on the officer why if it ain't his lordship said inspector sugg who had met lord peter in other circumstances "'Better be getting home, my lord. "'Night air's chilly-like, ain't it? "'You'll catch a cold or summer to that. "'Here's your taxi. "'Just you jump in now.' "'No,' said Lord Peter. "'Nope. "'Couldn't do that. "'Not without friend. "'Good old Freddy. "'Never desert friend. "'Dear old Sug. "'Wouldn't desert Freddy.' He attempted an attitude, with one foot poised on the step of the taxi, but, miscalculating his distance, stepped heavily into the gutter, thus entering the vehicle unexpectedly head first. Mr. Sugg tried to tuck his legs in and shut him up, 
but his lordship thwarted this movement with unlooked-for agility and sat firmly on the step not my taxi he explained solemnly freddy's taxi not right run away with friends taxi very odd just went round corner to fetch freddy's taxi freddy just went round corner to fetch my taxi fetch friends taxi friendship such a beautiful thing don't you think so shug can't leave friend besides this dear old parker mr parker said the inspector apprehensively where hush said his lordship don't wake baby there's good soul nestle's baby just she nestle don't he nestle nicely following his lordship's gaze the horrified sug observed his official superior cosily tucked up on the far side of palmerston and smiling a happy smile in his sleep with an exclamation of alarm he bent over and shook the sleeper unkind cried lord peter in a deep reproachful tone disturb poor fellow poor hard organ pleasion never guess up to alarm goes extraordinary thing he added as though struck by a new idea why hasn't alarm gone off shug he pointed a wavering finger at big ben they for forgotten winded up disgraceful i'll write to times about it mr sugg wasted no words but picked up the slumbering parker and hoisted him into the taxi never never desert began lord peter resisting all efforts to dislodge him from the step when a second taxi advancing from whitehall drew up with the honourable freddy arbuthnot cheering loudly at the window look who's here cried the honourable freddy jolly jolly old sug let's all go home together that's my taxi interposed his lordship with dignity staggering across to it the two whirled together for a moment then the honourable freddy was flung into sugg's arms while his lordship with a satisfied air cried home to the new taxi-man and instantly fell asleep in a corner of the vehicle mr sugg scratched his head gave lord peter's address and watched the cab drive off then supporting the honourable freddy on his ample bosom he directed the other man to convey mr parker to twelve a great ormond street take me home cried the honourable freddy bursting into tears you've all gone and left me you leave it to me sir said the inspector he glanced over his shoulder at st stephen's whence a group of commons were just issuing from an all-night sitting mr parker and all said inspector sugg adding devoutly thank god there weren't no witnesses end of chapter nineteen end of clouds of witness by dorothy sayers recording by kirsten weber